Section 1 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 1, Part 1. The Thwackings. It was ordained that Shibli Bagarag, nephew to the renowned Baba Mustafa, chief barber to the court of Persia, should shave Shagpat, the son of Shimpur, the son of Shulpi, the son of Shalom. And they had been clothiers for generations, even to the time of Shagpat, the illustrious. Now the story of Shibli Bagarag, and of the ball he followed, and of the subterranean kingdom he came to, and of the enchanted palace he entered, and of the sleeping king he shaved, and of the two princesses he released, and of the afrit held in subjection by the arts of one and bottled by her, is it not known that were written on the fingernails of men, and traced in their corner robes? As the poet says, ripe with oft telling and old is the tale, but tis of the sort that can never grow stale. Now, things were in that condition with Shibli Bagarag, that on a certain day he was hungry and abject, and the city of Shagpat the clothier was before him. So he made toward it, deliberating as to how he should procure a meal, for he had not a dirham in his girdle, and the remembrance of great dishes and savoury ingredients were to him as the illusions of rivers sheening on the sands to travellers gasping with thirst. And he considered his case, crying, Surely this comes of wandering, and tis the curse of the inquiring spirit, for in Shiraz, where my craft is in favour, I should be sitting now with my uncle, Baba Mustafa, the loquacious one, cross-legged, partaking of seasoned sweet dishes, dipping my fingers in them, rejoicing my soul with scandal of the court. Now he came to a knoll of sand under a palm, from which the yellow domes and mosques of the city of Shagpat, and its black cypresses, and marble palace fronts, and shining pillars, and lofty carven arches that spanned half-circles of the hot grey sky, were plainly visible. Then he gazed a while despondingly on the city of Shagpat, and groaned in contemplation of his evil plight, as is said by the poet. The curse of sorrow is comparison. As the sun casteth shade, night showeth star. We, measuring what we were by what we are, behold the depth to which we are undone. Wherefore he counselleth, Look neither too much up nor down at all, but forward stepping, strive no more to fall. And the advice is excellent, but... As is again said, The preacher preacheth, and the hearer heareth, But comfort first each function requireth. And wisdom to a hungry stomach is thin pottage, Saith the shrewd reader of men. Little comfort was there with Shibli Bagarag As he looked on the city of Shagpat the clothier. He cried aloud that his evil chance had got the better of him, And rolled his body in the sand, beating his breast, and conjuring up images of the profusion of dainties and the abundance of provision in Shiraz, exclaiming, Well away, and woe's me! This it is to be selected for the diversion of him that plotteth against man. Truly it is written, On different heads misfortunes come. One bears them firm, another faints, while this one hangs them like a drum, whereon to batter loud complaints. And of the three kinds, they who bang the drum outnumber the silent ones, as do the billows of the sea, the ships that swim, or the grains of sand, the trees that grow, a noisy multitude. Now he was in the pits of despondency, even as one that yieldeth without further struggle to the waves of tempest at midnight, when he was ware of one standing over him, a woman, old, wrinkled, a very crone, with but room for the drawing of a thread between her nose and her chin. She was, as is cited of them who betray the doings of time, wrinkled at the rind, and overripe at the core. And every part of her nodded and shook like a tree sapped by the waters, and her joints were sharp as the hind legs of a grasshopper. She was indeed one close wrecked upon the rocks of time. Now, when the old woman had scanned Shibli Bagarag, she called to him, O thou, what is it with thee that thou rollest as one reft of his wits? He answered her, I bewail my condition, which is beggary, and the lack of that which filleth with pleasantness. So the old woman said, Tell me thy case. He answered her, 
O oh, old woman, surely it is written at my birth that I should take ruin from the readers of planets. Now they proclaim that I was one day destined for great things if I stood by my tackle, I, a barber. Know then that I have had many offers and bribes, seductive ones from the rich and the exalted in rank, and I heeded them not, mindful of what was foretold of me. I stood by my tackle as a warrior standeth by his arms, flourishing them. Now, when I found great things came not to me, and twas the continuance of sameness and satiety with Baba Mustafa, my uncle, in Shiraz, the tongue-wagger, the endless tattler. Surely I was advised by the words of the poet to go forth in search of what was wanting. And he says, Thou that dreamest an event, while circumstance is but a waste of sand, arise, take up thy fortunes in thy hand, and daily forward pitch thy tent. Now I passed from city to city, proclaiming my science, holding aloft my tackle. Wallahi! Many adventures were mine, and if there's some day propitiousness in fortune, O oh old woman, I'll tell thee of what befell me in the kingdom of Shah Shamshireen. Tis wondrous, a matter to draw down the lower jaw with amazement. Now so it was that in the eyes of one city I was honoured and in request, by reason of my calling, and I fared sumptuously, even as a great officer of state surrounded by slaves, lounging upon clouds of silk-stuffs, circled by attentive ears. In another city there was no beast so base as I. Wah! I was one hunted of men, and an abomination. No housing for me not to operate upon. I was the lean dog that lieth in wait for offal. It seemed certain, O oh, old woman, that a curse hath fallen on Barbercraft in these days, because of the identical, whose might I know not. Everywhere it is growing in disrepute. Tis languishing. Nevertheless, till now I have preserved my tackle, and I would descend on yonder city to exercise it, even for a livelihood, forgetting a while great things, but that I dread men may have changed there also. And there's no stability in them. I call Allah, whose name be praised, to witness. So should I be a thing unsightly, subject to hateful castigation. Wherefore is it that I am in the state described by the poet when, dreading retreat, dreading advance to make, round we revolve, like to the wounded snake. Is not my case now a piteous one, one that toucheth the tender corner in man and woman? When she that listened had heard him to an end, she shook her garments, crying, O youth, son of my uncle, be comforted, for if it is as I think, the readers of planets were right, and thou art thus early within reach of great things, nigh grasping them. Then she fell to mumbling and reciting jigs of verse, quaint measures, and she poured along the sand to where a line had been drawn, and saw that the footprints of the youth were traced along it. Lo, at that sight she clapped her hands joyfully, and ran up to the youth, and peered in his face, exclaiming, Great things indeed! And praise thou the readers of planets, O nephew of the barber, they that sent thee searching the event thou art to master. Wallahi! Have I not half a mind to call thee already master of the event? Then she abated somewhat in her liveliness, and said to him, Know that the city thou seest is the city of Shagpat, the clothier, and there's no one living on the face of the earth, nor a soul that requireth thy craft more than he. Go therefore thou, bold of heart, brisk, full of the sprightliness of the barber, and enter to him. Lo, thou'lt see him lolling in his shop-front, to be admired of this people. Marvelled at. Oh, no mistaking of Shagpat, and the mole might discern Shagpat among myriads of our kind. And enter thou to him gaily, as to perform a friendly office, one meriting thanks and gratulations, saying, I will preserve thee the identical. Now he'll at first feign not to understand thee, dense of wit that he is. But mince not matters with him, perform well thy operation, and thou wilt come to great things. What say I? Tis certain that when thou hast shaved Shagpat, thou wilt have achieved the greatest of things, and be most noteworthy of thy race, thou, Shibli Bagarag, even thou, and thou wilt be master of the event, so named in anecdotes and histories and records to all succeeding generations. At her words the breast of Shibli Bagarag took in a great wind, and he hung his head a moment to ponder them, and he thought, 
there's provokingness in the speech of this old woman, and she's one that instigateth keenly. She called me by my name. Heard I that? Tis a mystery. And he thought, Peradventure she is a genie, one of an ill tribe, and she's luring me to my perdition in this city. How if that be so? And again he thought, it cannot be. She's probably the genie that presided over my birth, and promised me dower of great things through the mouths of the readers of planets. Now, when Shibli Bagarag had so deliberated, he lifted his sight, and lo, the old woman was no longer before him. He stared, and rubbed his eyes, but she was clean gone. Then ran he to the knolls and eminences that were scattered about, to command a view, but she was nowhere visible. So he thought, "'Twas a dream, and he was composing himself to despair upon the scant herbage of one of those knolls, when he chanced to gaze down the city below. He saw there a commotion and a crowd of people flocking one way. He thought, "'Twas surely no dream. Come not, genii, and go they not in the fashion of that old woman? I'll even descend on yonder city, and try my tackle on Shagpat, inquiring for him, and if he is there, I shall know I have had to do with a potent spirit. Allah protect me!' So, having shut together the clasps of resolve, he arose and made for the gates of the city, and entered it by the principal entrance. It was a fair city, the fairest and chief of that country, prosperous, powerful, a mart for numerous commodities, handicrafts, wares. Round it a wild country and a waste of sand, ruled by the lion in his wrath, and in it the tiger, the camelopard, the antelope, and other animals. Hither, in caravans, came the people of Ulb, and the people of Damascus, and the people of Vats, and they of Baghdad, and the Ringhees, great traders, and others trading. And there was constant flow of intercourse between them and the city of Shagpat. Now, as Shibli Bagarag paced up one of the streets of the city, he beheld a multitude in procession, following one that was crowned after the manner of kings, with a glittering crown, clad in the yellow girdled robes, and he sporting a fine profusion of hair, unequalled by all around him, save by one that was a little behind, shadowed by his presence. So Shibli Bagarag thought, Is one of this twain Shagpat? For never till now have I seen such rare growths, and twere indeed a bliss to slip the blade between them and those masses of darkness that hang from them. Then he stepped before the king, and made himself prominent in his path, humbling himself, and it was as he anticipated, the king prevented his removal by the slaves that would have dragged him away, and desired a hearing as to his business, and what brought him to the city a stranger. Thereupon Shibli Bagarag prostrated himself, and cried, O great king, sovereign of the time, surely I am one to be looked on with the eye of grace, and I am nephew to Baba Mustafa, renowned in Shiraz, a barber. I, a barber, and it is my prayer, O king of the age, that thou take me under thy protection, and the shield of thy fair will, while I perform good work in this city, by operating on the unshorn. When he had spoken, the king made a point of his eyebrows, and exclaimed, Shiraz! So they hold out against Shagpat yet, aha? Uh -huh. Shiraz, that nest of them, that reptile's nest! Then he turned to his vizier beside him, and said, What shall be done with this fellow? So the vizier replied, "'Twere well, O king, he be summoned to a sense of the loathsomeness of his craft by the agency of fifty stripes.' The king said, "'Tis commanded.' Then he passed forward in his majesty, and Shibli Bagarag was aware of the power of five slaves upon him, and he was hurried at a quick pace through the streets and before the eyes of the people, even to the common receptacle of felons, and there received from each slave severally ten thwacks with a thong, "'Tis certain that at every thwack the thong took an airing before it descended upon him. "'Then loosed they him, to wander whither he listed, "'and disgust was strong in him, "'by the reason of the disgrace and the severity of the administration of the blows. "'He strayed along the streets in wretchedness, and hunger increased on him, "'assailing him first as a wolf in his vitals, "'then as it had been a chasm yawning betwixt his trunk and his lower members.' And he thought, I have been long in chase of great things, and the hope of attaining them is great. Yet, wallahi, would I barter all for one refreshing meal, and the sense of fullness. Tis so, and sad is it. 
and he was mindful of the poet's words. Who seeks the shadow to the substance sinneth, and daily craving what is not, he thinneth. His lean ambition how shall he attain? For with this constant foolishness he doeth, he waxing liker to what he pursueth, himself becometh what he chased in vain. And again, Of honour half my fellows boast, a thing that scorns and kills us, methinks that honours us the most, which nourishes and fills us. So he thought he would of a surety fling far away his tackle, discard barbercraft, and be as other men, a mortal, forgotten with his generation. And he cried aloud, O thou old woman, thou deceiver, what hast thou obtained for me by thy deceits? And why put I faith in thee to the purchase of a thwacking? Woe's me! I would thou hadst been but a dream, thou crone, thou guileful parcel of belaboring bones. Now, while he lounged and strolled, and was abusing the old woman, he looked before him, and lo, one lolling in his shop-front, and people standing outside the shop, marking him with admiration and reverence, and pointing him out to each other with approving gestures. He who lolled there was indeed a miracle of hairiness, black with hair as he had been muzzled with it, and his head as it were a berry in a bush by reason of it. Then thought Shibli Bagarag, tis Shagpat. If the mole could swear to him, surely can I. So he regarded the clothier, and there was not seen on earth like the gravity of Shagpat as he lolled before the people, that failed not to assemble in groups and gaze at him. He was as a sleepy lion cased in his mane, as an owl drowsy in the daylight. Now would he close an eye, or move two fingers, but of other motion made he none, yet the people gazed at him with eagerness. Shibli Bagarag was astonished at them, thinking, Hair! Hair! There is might in hair, but there is greater might in the barber. Nevertheless, here the barber is scorned, the grower of crops held in amazing reverence. Tis truly wondrous the crop he groweth, not even King Shamshireen, after a thousand years, sported such mighty profusion. Him I sheared, it was a high task. Why not this shagpat? Now, long gazing on Shagpat, awoke in Shibli Bagarag fierce desire to shear him, and it was scarce in his power to restrain himself from flying at the clothier, he saying, What obstacle now? What protecteth him? Nay, why not trust to the old woman? Said she not I should first say on Shagpat? And twas my folly in appealing to the king that brought on me that thwacking. Tis well, I'll trust to her words. Wallahi, will it not lead me to great things? So it was, that as he thought this, he continued to keep eye on Shagpat, and the hunger that was in him passed, and became a ravenous vulture that flew from him, and singled forth Shagpat as prey, and there was no help for it, but in he must go and state his case to Shagpat, and essay shearing him. Now when he was in the presence, he exclaimed, Peace, O vendor of apparel, unto thee and unto thine. Shagpat answered, That with thee. Said Shibli Bagarag, I have heard of thee, O thou wonder. Wallahi, I am here to render homage to that I behold. Shagpat answered, Tis well. Then said Shibli Bagarag, Praise my discretion. I have even this day entered the city, and it is to thee I offer the first shave, O tangle of glory. At these words Shagpat darkened, saying gruffly, Thy jest is offensive, and it is unreasonable for staleness and lack of holiness. But Shibli Bagarag cried, No jest, O purveyor, to the outward of us, but a very excellent earnest. Thereat the face of Shagpat was as an exceeding red berry in a bush, and he said angrily, Have done, no more of it, or haply my spleen will be awakened, and that of them who see with more eyes than two. Nevertheless Shibli Bagarag urged him, and he winked, and gesticulated, and pointed to his head, crying, Fall not, O man of the nicety of measure, into the trap of error. For tis that I am a barber, and a rarity in this city, even Shibli Bagarag of Shiraz. Know me, nephew of the renowned Baba Mustafa, chief barber to the court of Persia. Languishest thou not for my art? Lo, with three sweeps I'll give thee a clean pall, all save the identical, and I can discern and save it. Fear me not, nor distrust my skill and the cunning that is mine. 
when he had heard Shibli Bagarag to a close, the countenance of Shagpat waxed fiery, as it had been flame kindled by travellers at night in a thorny bramble bush, and he ruffled and heaved, and was as when dense jungle growths are stirred violently by the near approach of a wild animal in his fury, shouting in short breaths, A barber! A, a barber! Is it so? Can it be? To me! A barber! O oh, thou, thou reptile! Filthy thing! A barber! O oh, dog! A barber! What? When I bid fair for the highest honours known? O oh, sacrilegious wretch! Monster! How? Are the Afrites jealous that they send thee to jibe me? Thereupon he set up a cry for his wife, and that woman rushed to him from an inner room, and fell upon Shibli Bagarag, belabouring him. So, when she was weary of this, she said, O light of my eyes, O golden crop and adorable man, what hath he done to thee? Shagpat answered, Tis a barber, and he hath sworn to shave me, and leave me not, save shorn. End of part one of chapter one. Section 2 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 1, Part 2. Hardly had Shagpat spoken this when she became limp with the hearing of it. Then Shibli Bagarag slunk from the shop. But without, the crowd had increased, seeing an altercation, and as he took to his heels they followed him, and there was an uproar in the streets of the city and in the air above them, as of raging genii, he like a started quarry doubling this way and that, and at the corners of the streets and open places, speeding on till there was no breath in his body, the cry still after him that he had bearded Shagpat. At last they came up with him, and belabored him each and all, it was a storm of thwacks that fell on the back of Shibli Bagarag. When they had wearied themselves in this fashion, they took him as he had been a stray bundle or a damaged bale, and hurled him from the gates of the city into the wilderness once more. Now when he was alone, he staggered a while, and then flung himself to the earth, looking neither to the right, nor to the left, nor above. All he could think was, Oh, accursed old woman! And this he kept repeating to himself for solace. As the poet says, "'Tis sure the special privilege of hate "'to curse the authors of our evil state.'" As he was thus complaining, behold the very old woman before him. And she wheezed, and croaked, and coughed, and shook herself, and screwed her face into a pleasing pucker, and assumed womanish airs, and swayed herself, like as do the full moons of the harem, when the eye of the master is upon them. Having made an end of these prettinesses, she said in a tone of soft insinuation, O youth, nephew of the barber, look upon me. Shibli Bagarag knew her voice, and he would not look, thinking, O oh, what a dreadful old woman is this! Just calling on her name in detestation maketh her present to us. So the old woman, seeing him resolute to shun her, leaned to him, and put one hand to her dress, and squatted beside him, and said, O oh youth, thou hast been thwacked. He groaned, lifting not his face, nor saying aught. Then said she, Art thou truly in search of great things, O youth? Still he groaned, answering no syllable. And she continued, Tis surely in sweet friendliness I ask, Art thou not a fair youth, one to entice a damsel to perfect friendliness? Louder yet did he groan at her words, thinking, A damsel verily. So the old woman said, I wot thou art angry with me. But now look up, O nephew of the barber. No time for vexation. What says the poet? Cares the warrior for his wounds, when the steed in battle bounds? Moreover, let him who grasps the crown strip not for shame, lest he expose what gained it blow and maim. So be it with thee and thy thwacking, O foolish youth. Hide it from thyself, thou silly one. What? Thou hast been thwacked, and refusest the fruit of it, which is resoluteness, strength of mind, sternness, in pursuit of the object. Then she softened her tone to persuasiveness, saying, 
"'Twas written, I should be the head of thy fortune, O Shibli Bagarag, and thou'lt be enviable among men by my aid. So look upon me, and, for I know thee famished, thou shalt presently be supplied with viands and bright wines and sweetmeats, delicacies to cheer thee. Now the promise of food and provision was powerful with Shibli Bagarag, and he looked up gloomily. And the old woman smiled archly at him, and wriggled in her seat like a dusty worm, and said, Dost thou find me charming, thou fair youth? He was nigh laughing in her face, but restrained himself to reply, Thou art that thou art. Said she, Not so, but that I shall be. Then she said, O youth, pay me now a compliment. Shibli Bagarag was at a loss what further to say to the old woman, for his heart cursed her for her persecutions, and ridiculed her for her vanities. At last he bethought himself of the saying of the poet, truly the offspring of fine wit, where he says, Expect no flatteries from me, while I am empty of good things. I'll call thee fair, and I'll agree thou boldest love in silken strings, when thou hast primed me from thy plenteous store. But, oh, till then a clod am I, no seed within to throw up flowers. All's drouthy to the fountain dry, to empty stomachs nature lowers. The lake was full where heaven looked fair of yore. So when he had spoken that, the old woman laughed and exclaimed, Thou art apt, it is well said. Surely I excuse thee till that time. Now listen, tis written we work together, and I know it by divination. Have I not known thee wandering, and on thy way to this city of Shagpat, where thou'lt some day sit throned? Now I propose to thee this, and tis an excellent proposal, that I lead thee to great things, and make thee glorious, a sitter in high seats, master of an event. Cried he, A proposal honourable to thee, and pleasant in the ear. She added, Provided thou marry me in sweet marriage. Thereat he stared on vacantly with a serious eye, and he could scarce credit her earnestness, but she repeated the same. So presently he thought, this old hag appeareth deep in the fountain of events, and she will be a right arm to me in the mastering of one, a torch in darkness, seeing there is wisdom in her as well as wickedness. The thwackings, sad was their taste, but they're in the road leading to greatness, and I cannot say she put me out of that road by putting me where they were. Her age, shall I complain of that when it is a sign she goeth shortly altogether? As he was thus debating, he regarded the old woman stealthily, and she was in agitation, so that her joints creaked like forest branches in a wind, and the puckers of her visage moved as do billows of the sea to and fro, and the anticipations of a fair young bride are not more eager than what was visible in the old woman. Wheedlingly she looked at him, and shaped her mouth like a bird's bill to soften it, and she drew together her dress to give herself the look of slimness, using all fascinations. He thought, "'Tis a wondrous old woman!' Marriage would seem a thing of moment to her, yet is the prophet with me, and I'll agree to it. So he said, "'Tis a pact between us, O old woman. Now the eyes of the old woman brightened when she heard him, and were as the eyes of a falcon that eyeth game, hungry with red fire, and she looked brisk with impatience, laughing a low laugh, and saying, O youth, I must claim of thee, as is usual in such cases, the kiss of contract. So Shibli Bagarag was mindful of what is written. If thou wouldst take the great leap, be ready for the little jump. And he stretched out his mouth to the forehead of the old woman. When he had done so, it was as though she had been illuminated, as when light is put in the hollow of a pumpkin. Then said she, This is well, this is a fair beginning. Now look, for thy fortune will of a surety follow. Call me now sweet bride, and knock her at the threshold of hearts. So Shibli Bagarag sighed, and called her this, and he said, Forget not my condition, O old woman, and that I am nigh famished. Upon that she nodded gravely, and arose and shook her garments together, and beckoned for Shibli Bagarag to follow her, and the two passed through the gates of the city, and held on together through diverse streets and thoroughfares, till they came before the doors of a palace with a pillared entrance, and the old woman passed through the doors of the palace as one familiar to them and lo, they were in a lofty court, built all of marble, and in the middle of it a fountain playing, splashing silvery, 
Shibli Bagarag would have halted here to breathe the cool refreshingness of the air, but the old woman would not, and she hurried on even to the opening of a spacious hall, and in it slaves in circle round a raised seat, where sat one that was their lord, and it was the chief vizier of the king. Then the old woman turned round sharply to Shibli Bagarag and said, How of thy tackle, O my betrothed? He answered, The edge is keen, the hand ready. Then said she, "'Tis well. So the old woman put her two hands on the shoulders of Shibli Bagarag, saying, Make thy reverence to him on the raised seat. Have faith in thy tackle, and in me. Renounce not either, whatsoever ensueth. Be not abashed, O my bridegroom, to be. Thereupon she thrust him in, and Shibli Bagarag was abashed, and played foolishly with his fingers, knowing not what to do. So when the chief vizier saw him, he cried out, Who art thou? And what wantest thou? Now the back of Shibli Bagarag tingled when he heard the vizier's voice, and he said, I am, O man of exalted condition, he whom men know as Shibli Bagarag, nephew to Baba Mustafa, the renowned of Shiraz, myself barber likewise, proud of my art, prepared to exercise it. Then said the chief vizier, This even to our faces, wonderful is the audacity of impudence. No, O nephew of the barber, thou art among them that honour not thy art. Is it not written, For one thing thou shalt be crowned here, for that thing be thwacked there? So also it is written, The tongue of the insolent one is a lash and a perpetual castigation to him. And it is written, O Shibli Bagarag, that I reap honour from thee, and there is no help but that thou be made an example of. So the chief vizier uttered command, and Shibli Bagarag was ware of the power of five slaves upon him, and they seized him familiarly, and placed him in position, and made ready his clothing for the reception of fifty other thwacks with a thong, each several thwack coming down on him with a hiss, as it were a serpent, and with a smack, as it were the mouth of satisfaction. And the people assembled, extolled the chief vizier, saying, Well and valiantly done, O stay of the state, and such like to the accursed race of barbers. Now when they had passed before the chief vizier and departed, lo, he fell to laughing violently, so that his hair was agitated, and was as a sand-cloud over him, and his countenance behind it was as the sun of the desert, reflected ripplingly on the waters of a bubbling spring, for it had the aspect of merriness. And the chief vizier exclaimed, O Shibli Bagarag, have I not made a fair show? And Shibli Bagarag said, Excellent fair show, O mighty one! Yet knew he not in what? but he was abject by reason of the thwacks. So the vizier said, Thou lookest lean, even as one to whom fortune oweth a long debt. Tell me now of thy barbercraft, perchance thy gain will be great thereby. And Shibli Bagarag answered, My gain has been great, O eminent in rank, but of evil quality, and I am content not to increase it. And he broke forth into lamentations, crying in excellent verse, Why am I thus the sport of all? A thing fate knocketh like a ball From point to point of evil chance, Even as the sneer of circumstance. While thirsting for the highest fame I hunger like the lowest beast, To be the first of men I aim And find myself the least. Now the vizier delayed not when he heard this To have a fair supply set before Shibli Bagarag, And meats dressed in diverse fashions, Spiced and coloured, and with herbs And wines and golden goblets, And slaves in attendance. So Shibli Bagarag ate and drank, and presently his soul arose from its prostration, and he cried, Wallahi, the head cook of King Shamshireen could have worked no better as regards the restorative process. Then said the chief vizier, O Shibli Bagarag, where now is thy tackle? And Shibli Bagarag winked, and nodded, and turned his head in the manner of the knowing ones, and he recited the verse, Tis well that we are sometimes circumspect, and hold ourselves in witless ways deterred. One thwacking made me seriously reflect, a second turned the cream of love to curd. Most surely that profession I reject, before the fear of a prospective third. So the vizier said, "'Tis well, thou turnest verse neatly." And he exclaimed extemporaneously, "'If thou wouldst have thy achievement as high as the wings of ambition can fly, if thou the clear summit of hope wouldst attain, and not have thy labour in vain, be steadfast in that which impelled, for the peace of earth he who leaves must have trust. 
He is safe while he soars, but when faith shall cease, desponding he drops to the dust. Then said he, Fear no further thwacking, but honor and prosperity in the place of it. What says the poet? We faint when for the fire there needs one spark, we droop when our desire is near its mark. How near to it art thou, O Shibli Bagarag? Know then that among this people there is great reverence for the growing of hair, and he that is hairiest is honored most. Wherefore are barbers creatures of a special abhorrence, and of a surety flourish not. And so it is that I owe my station to the esteem I profess for the cultivation of hair, and to my persecution of the clippers of it. And in this kingdom is no one that beareth such a crop as I, saving one, a clothier, an accursed one. And may a blight fall upon him for his vanity, and his affectation of solemn priestliness, and his lolling in his shop-front to be admired and marveled at by the people. So this fellow I would disgrace, and bring to scorn, this shagpat, for he is mine enemy, and the eye of the king my master is on him. Now I conceive thy assistance in this matter, Shibli Bagarag, thou a barber. When Shibli Bagarag heard mention of Shagpat, and the desire for vengeance in the vizier, he was as a new man, and he smelt the sweetness of his own revenge as a vulture smelleth the carrion from afar. And he said, I am thy servant, thy slave, O vizier. Then he smiled as to his own soul, and he exclaimed, On my head be it. And it was to him as when sudden gusts of perfume from garden roses of the valley meet the traveller's nostril on the hill that overlooketh the valley, filling him with ecstasy and newness of life, delicate visions. And he cried, Wolalhi, this is fair, this is well. I am he that was appointed to do thy work, O man in office. What says the poet? The destined hand doth strike the fated blow. Surely the arrow is fitted to the bow. And, he says, the feathered seed for the wind delayeth, the wind above the garden swayeth, the garden of its burden knoweth, the burden falleth, sinketh, soweth. So the vizier chuckled and nodded, saying, Right, right, aptly spoken, O youth of favor, tis even so, and there is wisdom in what is written. Chance is a poor knave, its own sad slave. To meet that word to meet, life's no cheat. Upon that he cried, First let us have with us the eclipser of reason, and take counsel with her as is my custom. Now the vizier made signal to a slave in attendance, and the slave departed from the hall, and the vizier led Shibli Bagarag into a closer chamber, which had a smooth floor of inlaid silver and silken hangings, the windows looking forth on the gardens of the palace, and its fountains and cool recesses of shade and temperate sweetness. While they sat there conversing in this meter and that, measuring quotations, lo, the old woman, the affianced of Shibli Bagarag, and she sumptuously arrayed, in perfect queenliness, her head bound in a circlet of gems and gold, her figure lustrous with a full robe of flowing crimson silk, and she wore slippers embroidered with golden traceries, and round her waist a girdle flashing with jewels, so that, to look on, she was as a long falling water in the last bright slant of the sun. Her hair hung disarranged, and spread in a scattered fashion off her shoulders, and she was younger by many moons, her brow smooth where Shibli Bagarag had given the kiss of contract, her hand soft, and white where he had taken it. Shibli Bagarag was smitten with astonishment at sight of her, and he thought, Surely the aspect of this old woman would realize the story of Banavar the Beautiful, and it is a story marvellous to think of. Yet how great is the likeness between Banavar and this old woman that groweth younger! And he thought again, What if the story of Banavar be a true one? This old woman such as she, no other! So while he considered her, the vizier exclaimed, Is she not fair, my daughter? And the youth answered, She is, O vizier, that she is. But the vizier cried, Nay, by Allah, she is that she will be. And the vizier said, Tis she that is my daughter, tell me thy thought of her, as thou thinkest it. And Shibli Bagarag replied, O vizier, my thought of her is, she seemeth indeed as Banavar the beautiful, no other. Then the vizier and the eclipser of reason exclaimed together, How of Banavar and her story, O youth, we listen. So Shibli Bagarag leaned slightly on a cushion of a couch, and narrated as followeth. End of chapter 1
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 2, Part 1. And this is the story of Banavar the Beautiful. Know that at the foot of a lofty mountain of the Caucasus there lieth a deep blue lake. Near to this lake a nest of serpents, wise and ancient. Now it was the habit of a damsel to pass by the lake early at morn, on her way from the tents of her tribe to the pastures of the flocks. As she pressed the white arch of her feet on the soft green-mossed grasses by the shore of the lake, she would let loose her hair, looking over into the water, and bind the braid again round her temples and behind her ears, as it had been in a lucent mirror. So doing she would laugh. Her laughter was like the falls of water at moonrise, her loveliness like the very moonrise, and she was stately as a palm-tree standing before the moon. This was Bonivar the Beautiful. Now the damsel was betrothed to the son of a neighboring emir, a youth comely, well-fashioned, skilled with the bow, apt in all exercises, one that sat his mare firm as the trained falcon that fixeth on the plunging bull of the plains, fair and terrible in combat as the lightning that strideth the rolling storm, and it is sung by the poet. When on his desert mare I see, my prince of men, I think of then, as high above humanity, as he shines radiant over me. Lo, like a torrent he doth bound, breasting the shock, from rock to rock, a pillar of storm he shakes the ground, his turban on his temples wound. Match for me worth to be adored, a youth like him in heart and limb, swift as his anger is his sword, softer than woman his true word. Now the love of this youth for the damsel Banavar was a consuming passion, and the father of the damsel and the father of the youth looked fairly on the prospect of their union, which was near, and was plighted as the union of the two tribes. So they met, and there was no voice against their meeting, and all the love that was in them they were free to pour forth far from the hearing of men, even where they would. Before the rising of the sun, and ere his setting, the youth rode swiftly from the green tents of the emir, his father, to waylay her by the waters of the lake, and Bonivar was there, bending over the lake, her image in the lake glowing like the fair fullness of the moon, and the youth leaned to her from his steed, and sang to her verses of her great loveliness, ere she was wistful of him. Then she turned to him, and laughed lightly, a welcome of sweetness, and shook the falls of her hair across the blushes of her face and her bosom, and he folded her to him, and those two would fondle together in the fashion of the betrothed ones, the blessing of Allah be on them all, gazing on each other till their eyes swam with tears, and they were nigh swooning with the fullness of their bliss. Surely t'was an innocent and tender dalliance, and their prattle was that of lovers till the time of parting. He showed her how she looked best, she him, and they were forgetful of all else that is, in their sweet interchange of flatteries, and the world was a wilderness to them both, when the youth parted with Bonivar by the brook which bounded the tents of her tribe. It was on a night when they were so together, the damsel leaning on his arm, her eyes toward the lake, and lo, what seemed the reflection of a large star in the water, and there was darkness in the sky above it, thick clouds in no sight of the heavens. So she held her face to him sideways, and said, What meaneth this, O my betrothed? For there is reflected in yonder lake a light as of a star, and there is no star visible this night. The youth trembled as one in trouble of spirit, and exclaimed, Look not on it, O my soul, it is of evil omen. But Bonivar kept her gaze constantly on the light, and the light increased in luster, and the light became, from a pale, sad splendor, dazzling in its brilliancy. Listening, they heard presently a gurgling noise as of one deeply drinking. Then the youth sighed a heavy sigh, and said, This is the serpent of the lake drinking of its waters, as is her wont once every moon, and whoso heareth her drink by the sheening of that light is under a destiny dark and imminent. So know I my days are numbered, and it was foretold of me this. Now the youth sought to dissuade Bonivar from gazing on the light, and he flung his whole body before her eyes, and clasped her head upon his breast, and clung about her, caressing her, yet she slipped from him, and she cried, Tell me of this serpent and of the light. So he said, Seek not to hear of it, O my betrothed. Then she gazed at the light a moment more intently, and turned her fair shape toward him, and put up her long white fingers to his chin, and smoothed him with their softness, whispering, Tell me of it, my life. 
and so it was that her winningness melted him, and he said, Bonivar, the serpent is the serpent of the lake, old, wise, powerful, of the brood of the sacred mountain that lifteth by day a peak of gold, and by night a point of solitary silver. In her head, upon her forehead, between her eyes, there is a jewel, and it is the light. Then she said, How came the jewel there in such a place? He answered, "'Tis the growth of one thousand years in the head of the serpent. She cried, "'Surely precious.' He answered, "'Beyond price.' As he spake, the tears streamed from him, and he was shaken with grief. But she noted not of this, and watched the wonder of the light, and its increasing and quivering and lengthening, and the light was as an arrow of beams, and as a globe of radiance. Desire for the jewel waxed in her, and she had no sight but for it alone, crying, "'Tis a jewel exceeding in preciousness all jewels that are, and for the possessing it would I forfeit all that is. So he said sorrowfully, "'Our love, O Bonivar, and our hopes of espousal?' But she cried, "'No question of that. Prove now thy passion for me, O warrior, and win for me that jewel.' Then he pleaded with her and exclaimed, "'Urge not this. The winning of the jewel is worth my life, and my life, O Bonivar. Surely its breath is but the love of thee.' So she said, Thou fearest a risk? And he replied, Little fear I, my life is thine to cast away. This jewel it is evil to have, and evil followeth the soul that hath it. Upon that she cried, A trick to cheat me of the jewel, thy love is wanting at the proof. And she taunted the youth her betrothed, and turned from him, and hardened at his tenderness, and made her sweet shape as a thorn to his caressing, and his heart was charged with anguish for her. So at the last, when he had wept a space in silence, he cried, Thou hast willed it, the jewel shall be thine, O my soul. Then said he, Thou hast willed it, O Bonivar, and my life is as a grain of sand weighed against thy wishes. Allah is my witness. Meet me therefore here, O my beloved, at the end of one quarter moon, even beneath the shadow of this palm tree, by the lake, and at this hour, and I will deliver into thy hands the jewel. So farewell. Wind me once about thine arms, that I may take comfort from thee. When their kiss was over, the youth led her silently to the brook of their parting, the clear, cold, bubbling brook, and passed from her sight. And the damsel was exulting, and leapt, and made circles in her glee, and she danced, and rioted, and sang, and clapped her hands, crying, If I am now, Bonavar the Beautiful, how shall I be when the jewel is upon me, the bright light which beameth in the darkness, and needeth to light it no other light? Surely there will be envy among the maidens and the widows, and my name and the odor of my beauty will travel to the courts of far kings. So was she jubilant, and her sisters that met her marveled at her, and the deep glow that was upon her, even as the glow of the great desert when the sun has fallen. And they said among themselves, She is covered all over with the blush of one that is a bride, and the bridegroom's kiss yet burneth upon Bonivar. So they undressed her, and she lay among them, and was all night, even as a bursting rose in a vase filled with drooping lilies. And one of the maidens that put her hand on the left breast of Bonivar felt it full, and the heart beneath it panting and beating, swifter than the ground is struck by hoves of the chosen steed, sent by the chieftain to the city of his people, with news of victory, and the summons for rejoicing. Now the nights and the days of Bonivar were even as this night, and she was as an unquiet soul till the appointed time for the meeting with her lover had come. Then, when the sun was lighting with slant beam the green grass slope by the blue brook before her, Bonivar arrayed herself and went forth gaily, as a martial queen to a certain conquest, and of all the flowers that nodded to the setting, yea, the crimson, purple, pure white, streaked yellow, azure, and saffron, there was no flower fairer in its hues than Bonivar nor bird of the heavens freer in its glittering plumage, nor shape of loveliness such as hers. Truly, when she had taken her place under the palm by the waters of the lake, that was no exaggeration of the poet, where he says, Snows of the mountain peaks were mirrored there, beneath her feet, not whiter than they were, not rosier in the white, that falling flush, brought on the wave, than in her cheek the blush. And again, she draws the heavens down to her, so rare she is, so fair she is. They flutter with a crown to her, and lighten only where she is. And he exclaims in verse that applieth to her, Exquisite slenderness, sleek little antelope, Serpent of sweetness, eagle that soaringly wins me adoringly, Teach me thy fleetness, vision of loveliness, turn to my tenderness. Now when the sun was lost to earth, and all was darkness, 
Bonnevar fixed her eyes upon an opening arch of foliage in the glade, through which the youth her lover should come to her, and clasped both hands across her bosom. So shaken was she with eager longing and expectation. In her hunger for his approach, she would at whiles pluck up the herbage about her by the roots, and toss handfuls this way and that, chiding the peaceful song of the night-bird in the leaves above her head. And she was sinking with fretfulness when, lo, from the opening arch of the glade a sudden light, and Bonnevar knew it for the jewel, in the fingers of her betrothed, by the strength of its effulgence. Then she called to him joyfully a cry of welcome, and quickened his coming with her calls, and the youth alighted from his mare, and left it to pasture, and advanced to her, holding aloft the jewel. And the jewel was of a great size and purity, round and all luminous, throwing rays and beams everywhere about it, a miracle to behold. The light in it shining, and as the very life of blood, a sweet crimson, a ruby, a softer rose, an amethyst of tender hues, it was a full globe of splendors, showing like a very kingdom of the blessed, and blessed was the eye beholding it. So when he was within reach of her arm, the damsel sprang to him, and caught from his hand the jewel, and held it before her eyes, and danced with it, and pressed it on her bosom, and was as a creature giddy with great joy in possessing it. And she put the jewel in her bosom, and looked on the youth to thank him for the jewel with all her beauty, for the passion of a mighty pride in him, who had won for her the jewel exalted Bhanavar. And she said sweetly, Now hast thou proved to me thy love of me, and I am thine, O my betrothed, wholly thine. Kiss me, then, and cease not kissing me, for bliss is in me. But the youth eyed her sorrowfully, even as one that hath great yearning and no power to move or speak. So she said again, in the low melody of her deep love-tones, Kiss me, O my lover, for I desire thy kiss. Still he spake not, and was as a pillar of stone. And she started and cried, Thou art whole, without a hurt. Then sought she to coax him to her, with all the softness of her half-closed eyes and budded lips, saying, "'Twas an idle fear, and I have thee, and thou art mine, and I am thine. So speak to me, my lover, for there is no music like the music of thy voice, and the absence of it, the absence of all sweetness, and there is no pleasure in life without it. So the tenderness of her fondling melted the silence in him, and presently his tongue was loosed, and he breathed in pain of spirit, and his words were the words of the proverb, He that fighteth with poison is no match for the prick of a thorn. And he said, Surely, O Bonnevar, my love for thee surpasseth what is told of others that have longed before us, and I count no loss, a loss that is for thy sake. And he sighed, and saying, Sadder than is the moon's lost light, lost ere the kindling of dawn, to travellers journeying on, the shutting of thy fair face from my sight. Might I look on thee in death, with bliss I would yield my breath. O oh, what warrior dies with heaven in his eyes! O Bonnevar, too rich a prize, the life of my nostrils art thou, the balm dew on my brow. Thou art the perfume I meet as I speed o'er the plains, the strength of my arms, the blood of my veins. Then said he, I make nothing matter of complaint, Allah witnesseth, not even the long parting from her I love. What will be will be, so was it written. Tis but a scratch, O my soul, yet am I of the dead, and them that are passed away. Tis hard, but I smile in the face of bitterness." Now at his words the damsel clutched him with both her hands, and the blood went from her, and she was as a block of white marble, even as one of those we meet in the desert, leaning together, marking the wrath of the all-powerful on forgotten cities. And the tongue of the damsel was dry, and she was without speech, gazing at him with wide-open eyes like one in a trance. Then she started, as a dreamer wakeneth, and flung herself quickly on the breast of the youth, and put up the sleeve from his arm, and beheld by the beams of the quarter crescent that had risen through the leaves a small bite on the arm of the youth her betrothed spotted with seven spots of blood in a crescent so she knew that the poison of the serpent had entered by that bite and she loosened herself to the violence of her anguish shrieking the shrieks of despair so that the voice of her lamentation was multiplied about and made many voices in the night her spirit returned not to her till the crescent of the moon was yellow to its fall and lo, the youth was sighing heavy sighs, and leaning to the ground on one elbow, and she flung herself by him on the ground, seeking for herbs that were antidotes to the poison of the serpent, groveling among the grasses and strewn leaves of the wood, peering at them tearfully by the pale beams, and startling the insects as she moved. When she had gathered some, she pressed them and bruised them, and laid them among his lips, that were white as the ball of an eye. 
and she made him drink drops of the juices of the herbs, wailing and swaying her body across him, as one that seeketh vainly to give brightness again to the flames of a dying fire. But now his time was drawing nigh, and he was weak, and took her hand in his, and gazed on her face, sighing, and said, there is nothing shall keep me by thee now, O my betrothed, my beautiful. Weep not, for it is the doing of fate, and not thy doing. So ere I go, and the grave cloth separates thy heart from my heart, listen to me. Lo that jewel, it is the giver of years and of powers, and of loveliness beyond mortal. Yet the wearing of it availeth not in the pursuit of happiness. Now art thou queen over the serpents of this lake. It was the queen serpent I slew, and her vengeance is on me here. Now art thou mighty, O Bonivar, and look to do well by thy tribe, and that from which I sprang, recompensing my father for his loss, pouring ointment on his affliction, for great is the grief of the old man, and he loveth me, and is childless. Then the youth fell back and was still, and Bonivar put her ear to his mouth and heard what seemed an inner voice murmuring in him, and it was of his infancy and his boyhood, and of his father the emir's first gift to him, his horse Zura, in old times. Presently the youth revived somewhat and looked upon her, but his sight was glazed with a film. And she sang her name to him ere he knew her, and the sad sweetness of her name filled his soul, and he replied to her with it weakly, like a far echo that groweth fainter, Bonivar, Bonivar, Bonivar. Then a change came over him, and the pain of the poison and the passion of the death throw, and he was wistful of her no more. But she lay by him, embracing him, and in the last violence of his anguish he hugged her to his breast. Then it was over, and he sank. And the twain were as a great wave heaving upon the shore. Lo, part is wasted where it falleth, part draweth back into the waters. So it was. Now the chill of dawn breathed blue on the lake, and was astir among the dewy leaves of the wood, when Bonivar arose from the body of the youth, and as she rose she saw that his mare Zora, his father's first gift, was snuffing at the ear of her dead master, and pawing at him. At this sight the tears poured from her eyelids, and she sobbed out to the mare, O oh, Zura, never mare bore nobler burden on his back than thou and servant my betrothed. Zora, thou weepest, for death is first known to thee, in the dearest thing that was thine, as to me, in the dearest that was mine. And O oh, Zora, steed of servant my betrothed, there's no loveliness for us in life, for the loveliest is gone. And let us die, Zura, mare of Zervan, my betrothed, for what is dying to us? O Zura, who cherish beyond all that which death has taken? So spake she to Zura the mare, kissing her and running her fingers through the long white mane of the mare. Then she stooped to the body of her betrothed and toiled with it to lift it across the crimson saddle-cloth that was on the back of Zura. And the mare knelt to her that she might lay on her back the body of Zervan. When that was done, Bonivar paced beside Zura the mare, weeping and caressing her, reminding her of the deeds of Zervan, and the battles she had borne him to, and his greatness and his gentleness. And the mare went without leading. It was broad light when they had passed the glade in the covert of the wood. Before them, between great mountains, glimmered a space of rolling grass fed to deep greenness by many brooks. The shadow of a mountain was over it, and one slant of the rising sun, down a glade of the mountain, touched the green tent of the emir where it stood a little apart from the others of his tribe. Goats and asses of the tribe were pasturing in the quiet, but save them nothing moved among the tents, and it was deep peacefulness. Bonivar led Zora slowly before the tent of the emir, and disburdened Zora of the helpless weight, and spread the long, fair limbs of the youth lengthwise across the threshold of the emir's tent, sitting away from it with clasped hands, regarding it. Ere long the emir came forth, and his foot was on the body of his son, and he knew the death on the chin and the eyes of Zervan, his sole son. Now the emir was old, and with the shock of that sight the world darkened before him, and he gave forth a groan and stumbled over the sunken breast of Zervan, and stretched over him as one without life. When Bonivar saw that old man stretched over the body of his son, she sickened, and her ear was filled with the wailings of grief that would arise, and she stood up and stole away from the habitations of the tribe, stricken with her guilt, and wandered beyond the mountains, knowing not whither she went, looking on no living thing, for the sight of a thing that moved was hateful to her, and all sounds were sounds of lamentation for a great loss. Now she had wandered on alone two days and two nights, and nigh morn she was seized with a swoon of weariness, and fell forward with her face to the earth, and lay there prostrate, 
even as one that is adoring the shrine, and it was on the sands of the desert she was lying. It chanced that the chieftain of a desert tribe passed at midday by the spot, and seeing the figure of a damsel unshaded by any shade of tree or herb or tent covering, and prostrate on the sands, he reined his steed and leaned forward to her and called to her. Then, as she answered nothing, he dismounted, and thrust his arm softly beneath her, and lifted her gently. And her swoon had the whiteness of death, so that he thought her dead verily, and the marvel of her great loveliness in death smote the heart on his ribs as with a blow, and the powers of life went from him a moment as he looked on her face in the long dark wet lashes that clung to her colourless face, as at night in groves where the betrothed ones wander the slender leaves of the acacia spread darkly over the full moon. And he cried, "'Tis a loveliness that maketh the soul yearn to the cold bosom of death. So lovely, exceeding all that liveth is she. After he had contemplated her a long while, he snatched his sight from her, and swung her swiftly on the back of his mare, and leaned her on one arm, and sped westward over the sands of the desert, halting not till he was in the hum of many tents, and the sun of that day hung a red half-circle across the sand. He alighted before the tent of his mother, and sent women in to her. When his mother came forth to the greetings of her son, he said no word, but pointed to the damsel, where he had leaned her at the threshold of her tent. His mother kissed him on the forehead, and turned her shoulder to peer upon the damsel. But when she had close view of Bonivar, she spat, and scattered her hair, and stamped, and cried aloud, Away with her, this slut of darkness! There's poison on her very skirts, and evil in the look of her. Then said he, O oh, Ruckruth, my mother, art thou lost to charity and the use of kindliness and the laws of hospitality, that thou talkest this of the damsel, a stranger? Take her now in, and if she be past help, as I fear, be it thy care to give her decent burial, and if she live, O oh, my mother, tend her for the love of thy son, and for the love of him be gentle with her. While he spake, Ruckruth, his mother, knelt over the damsel, as a cat that sniffeth the suspected dish and she flashed her eyes back on him, exclaiming scornfully, "'So art thou befooled, and the poison is already in thee. But I will not have her, O my son, and thou, Ruark, my son, neither shalt thou have her. What, will I not die to save thee from a harm? Surely thy frown is little to me, my son, if I save thee from a harm, and the damsel here is. I shudder to think what. But never lay shadow across my threshold dark as this.' Now Ruark gazed upon his mother, and upon Bonivar, and the face of Bonivar was as a babe in sleep, and his soul melted to the parted sweetness of her soft little curved red lips, and her closed eyelids, and her innocent open hands, where she lay at the threshold of the tent, unconscious of hardness, and the sayings of the unjust. So he cried fiercely, No paltering, O Ruckruth, my mother, and if not to thy tent, then to mine. When she heard him say that in the voice of his anger, Ruckruth fixed her eyes on him sorrowfully, and sighed, and went up to him, and drew his head once against her heart, and retreated into the tent, bidding the women that were there bring in the body of the damsel. It was the morning of another day when Bonivar awoke, and she awoke in a dream of Zura, the mare of Zervan, her betrothed, that was dead, and the name of Zura was on her tongue as she started up. She was on a couch of silk and leopard skins, at her feet a fair young girl with a fan of pheasant feathers. She stared at the hangings of the tent, which were richer than those of her own tribe. The cloths, the cushions, and the embroideries, and the strangeness of all was pain to her. She knew not why. Then wept she bitterly, and with her tears the memory of what had been came back to her, and she opened her arms to take into them the little girl that fanned her, that she might love something and be beloved a while, and the child sobbed with her. After a time Bonivar said, "'Where am I, and amongst whom, my child, my sister?' And the child answered her, Surely in the tent of the mother of Ruach the chief, even chief of the Bena Aser, and he found thee in the desert night dead. Tis so, and this morning will Ruach be gone to meet the challenge of Eben Asrak, and they will fight at the foot of the snow mountains, and the shadow of yonder date palm will be over our tent here at the hour they fight, and I shall sing for Ruach, and kneel here in the darkness of the shadow. While the child was speaking, there entered to them a tall, aged woman, with one swath of a turban across her long level brows, and she had hard black eyes and close lips and a square chin, and it was the mother of Ruark. She strode forward toward Bonivar to greet her, and folded her legs before the damsel. Presently she said, Tell me thy story and of thy coming into the hands of Ruark, my son. Bonivar shuddered. 
so Ruckruth dismissed the little maiden from the chamber of the tent, and laid her left hand on one arm of Bonivar, and said, I would know whence comest thou, that we may deal by thee, and thy people that have lost thee. The touch of a hand was as the touch of a corpse to Bonivar, and the damsel was constrained to speak by a power she knew not of, and she told all to Ruckruth of what had been the great misery and the wickedness that was hers. Then Ruark's mother took hold of Bonivar's strong grasp, and eyed her long, piteously and with reproach, and rocked forward and back, and kept rocking to and fro, crying at intervals, O oh, Ruark, my son, my son, this feared I, and thou art not the first, and I saw it, I saw it, well away, why came she in thy way, why, Ruark, my son, my fire eye, canst thou be saved by me, faded that thou art, thou fair face, or wilt thou be saved by me, my son, ere thy story be told in tears as this one, that is as thine to me, and thou wilt seize a jewel, Ruark, O thou soul of wrath, my son, my dazzling chief, and seize it to wear it, and think it bliss, this lovely jewel, but tis an anguish, endless and for ever, my son, woe's me, and anguish is she without end. Ruckruth continued moaning, and the thought that was in the mother of Ruark struck Bonivar like a light in the land of despair that darkly illumineth the dreaded gulfs and abysses of the land, and she knew herself black and evil, and the scourge of her guilt was upon her, and she cursed herself before Ruckruth, and fawned before her, abasing her body. So Ruckruth was drawn to the damsel by the violence of her self-accusing in her abandonment to grief, and lifted her and comforted her, and after a while they had gentle speech together, and the two women opened their hearts and wept. Then it was agreed between them that Bonivar should depart from the encampment of the tribe before the return of Ruark, and seek shelter among her own people again, and aid them and the tribe of Zervan, her betrothed, by the might of the jewel which was hers, fulfilling the desire of Zervan. The mind of the damsel was lowly, and her soul yearned for the blessing of Ruckruth. Darkness hung over the tent from the shadow of the date-palm when Bonivar departed, and the blessing of Ruckruth was on her head. She went forth fairly mounted on a fresh steed, beside her two warriors of them that were left to guard the encampment of the tribe of Ruark in his absence, and Ruckruth watched at the threshold of her tent for the coming of Ruark. When it was middle night, and the splendor of the moon was beaming on the edge of the desert, Bonivar lighted to rest by the twigs of a tamarisk that stood singly on the sands. The two warriors tied the fetlocks of their steeds and spread shawls for her, and watched over her while she slept. And the damsel dreamed, and the roaring of the lion was hoarse in her dream, and it was to her as were she the red whirlwind of the desert before whom all bowed in terror, the Arab, the wild horseman, and the caravans of pilgrimage. And none could stay her, Neither could she stay herself, for the curse of Allah was on men by reason of her guilt, and she went swinging great folds of darkness across kingdoms and empires of earth, where joy was and peace of spirit, and in her track amazement and calamity, and the whitened bones of noble youths, valorous chieftains. In that horror of a dream she stood up suddenly, and thrust forth her hands as to avert any evil, and advanced a step, and with the act her dream was cloven, and she awoke, and lo! It was sunrise, and where had been two warriors of the Beni Asser were now five, and beside her own steed five others, one the steed of Ruark, and Ruark with them that watched over her. Pale was the visage of the chief. Ruark eyed Bonivar and signaled to his followers, and they, when they had lifted the damsel to her steed and placed her in their front, mounted likewise, and flourished their lances with cries, and jerked their heels to the flanks of their steeds, and stretched forward till their beards were mixed with the tossing manes, and the dust arose after them crimson in the sun. So they coursed away, speeding behind their chief and Bonivar. Sweet were the desert herbs under their crushing hooves. Ere the shadow of the acacia measured less than its height, they came upon a spring of silver water, and Ruark leaped from his steed, and Bonivar from hers, and they performed their ablutions by that spring, and ate and drank and watered their steeds. While they were there, Bonivar lifted her eyes to Ruark, and said, Whither takest thou me, O my chief? His brow was stern, and he answered, Surely to the dwelling of thy tribe. Then she wept, and pulled her veil close, murmuring, Tis well. They spake no further, and pursued their journey toward the mountains, and across the desert, that was as a sea asleep in the blazing heat. And the sun, till his setting, threw no shade upon the sands, bigger than what was broad above them. By the beams of the growing moon they entered the first gorge of the mountains. Here they relaxed the swiftness of their pace, picking their way over broken rocks and stunted shrubs, 
and the mesh of spotted creeping plants. All around them in shadow a freshness of noisy rivulets and cool scents of flowers, asphodel and rose blooming in plots from the crevices of the crags. These, as the troop advanced, wound and widened, gradually receding, and their summits, which were silver in the moonlight, took in the distance a robe of purple, and the sides of the mountains were rounded away in purple beyond a space of emerald pasture. Now Ruark beheld the heaviness of Bonivar, and that she drooped in her seat, and he halted her by a cave at the foot of the mountains, browed with white broom. Before it, over grass and cresses, ran a rill, a branch from others, larger ones, that went hurrying from the heights to feed the meadows below, and Bonivar dipped her hand in the rill and thought, I am no more as thou, rill of the mountain, but a desert thing. Thy way is forward, thy end before thee, but I go this way and that, my end is dark to me, not a life is mine that will have its close kissing the cold cheeks of the saffron crocus. Cold art thou, and I, flames. They that lean to thee are refreshened, they that touch me perish. Then she looked forth on the stars that were above the purple heights, and the blushes of inner heaven that streamed up the sky, and a fear of meeting the eyes of her kindred possessed her, and she cried out to Ruark, O chief of the Beni Asser, must this be, and is there no help for it, but that I return among them that look on me basely? End of part one of chapter two. Section four of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter Two, and this is the story of Bonavar the Beautiful, Part Two. Ruark stooped to her and said, "Tell me thy name." She answered, "Bonavar is my name with that people." And he whispered, "Surely when they speak of thee, they say not Bonavar solely, but Bonavar the Beautiful." She started and sought the eye of the chief, and it was fixed on her face in a softened light, as if his soul had said that thing. Then she sighed and exclaimed. Unhappy other beautiful, born to misery, I'll address them in his grace and favor, for their certain wretchedness. Lo, their countenances are as the sun, their existence as the desert, barren are they in fruits and waters, a snare to themselves and to others. Now the chief leaned to her yet nearer, saying, Show me the jewel. Bonivar caught up her hands and clenched them, and she cried bitterly, Tis known to thee, she told thee, and there be none that know it not. Arising, she thrust her hand into her bosom, and held forth the jewel in the palm of her white hand. When Ruark beheld the marvel of the jewel, and the redness moving in it, as of a panting heart, and the flashing eye of fire that it was, and all its glory, he cried, It was indeed a jewel for queens to covet from the serpent, and a prize the noblest might risk all to win as a gift for thee. Then she said, Thy voice is friendly with me, O Ruark, and thou scornest not the creature that I am. Counsel me as to my dealing with the jewel. Surely the eyes of the chief met the eyes of Bonifar, as when the brightest stars of midnight are doubled in a clear dark lake, and he sang in measured music. Shall I counsel the moon in her ascending? Stay under that tall palm tree through the night? Rest on the mountain slope by the couching antelope? O thou enthroned supremacy of light! And forever the luster thou art lending. Lean on the fair long brook that leaps and leaps, silvery leaps and falls, Hang by the mountain walls, moon, and rise no more to crown the steeps, for a danger and dollar is thy wending. And, O Bonivar, Bonivar the beautiful, shall I counsel thee, moon of loveliness, bright, full, perfect moon, counsel thee not to ascend and be seen and worshipped of men, sitting above them in majesty, thou that art thyself the jewel beyond price. Wah! What if thou cast it from thee? Thy beauty remaineth. And Bonivar smote her palms in the moonlight, and exclaimed, How then shall I escape this in me, which is a curse to them that approach me? And he replied, Long we the less for the pearl of the sea, because in its depths there's the death we flee. Long we the less, the less, woes me, because thou art deathly, the less for thee. She sang aloud among the rocks and the caves and the illumined waters, Destiny, destiny, why am I so dark? I that have beauty and love to be fair, destiny, destiny, Am I but a spark, tracked under heaven in flames and despair? Destiny, destiny, why am I desired, 
thus like a poisonous fruit deadly sweet destiny destiny lo my soul is tired make me thy plaything no more i entreat ruach laughed low and said what is this dread of ruckruth my mother which weigheth on thee but silliness for she saw thee willing to do well by her and thou with thy jewel o bonivar do thou but well by thyself and there will be no woman such as thou in power and excellence of endowments as there is nowhere one such as thou in beauty then he sighed to her dare i look up to thee o my queen of serpents and he breathed as one that is losing breath and the words came from him my soul is thine when she heard him say this great trouble was on the damsel for his voice was not the voice of zervan her betrothed and she remembered the sorrow of ruckruth she would have fled from him but a dread of the displeasure of the chief restrained her knowing ruark a soul of wrath her eyelids dropped and the chief gazed on her eagerly and sang in a passion of praises of her the fires of his love had a tongue his speech was a torrent of flame at the feet of the damsel and bonivar exclaimed oh what am i what am i who have slain my love my lover that one should love me and call on me for love my life is a long weeping for him death is my wooer ruark still pleaded with her and she said in fair gentleness speak not of it now in the freshness of my grief other times and seasons are there my soul is but newly widowed fierce was the eye of the chief and he sprang up crying by the life of my head i know thy wiles and the reading of these delays but i'll never leave thee nor lose sight of thee bonivar and think not to fly from me thou subtle brilliant serpent for thy track is my track and thy condition my condition and thy fate my fate by allah this is so then he strode from her swiftly and called to his arabs they had kindled a fire to roast the flesh of a buffalo slaughtered by them from among a herd and were laughing and singing beside the flames of the fire so by the direction of the chief the arabs brought slices of sweet buffalo flesh to bonivar with cakes of grain and bonivar ate alone and drank from the waters before her then they laid for her a couch within the cave and the aching of her spirit was lulled and she slept there a dreamless sleep till morning by the morning light bonivar looked abroad for the chief and he was nowhere by a pang of violent hope struck through her and she pressed her bosom praying he might have left her and climbed the clefts and ledges of the mountain to search over the fair expanse of pasture beyond for a trace of him departing the sun was on the heads of the heavy flowers and a flood of gold down the gorges and a delicate rose hue on the distant peaks and upper dells of snow which were as a crown to the scene she surveyed but no sight of ruark had she and now she was beginning to rejoice but on a sudden her eye caught far to east a glimpse of something in motion across an even slope of the lower hills leaning to the valley and it was a herd that rushed forward like a black torrent of the mountains flinging foam this way and that and after the herd and at the sides of the herd she distinguished the white cloaks and scarfs and glittering steel of the arabs of ruark presently she saw a horseman break from the rest and race in a line toward her she knew this one for ruark and sighed and descended slowly to meet him the greetings of the chief were sharp his manner wild and he said little ere he said i will see thee under the light of the jewel so tie it in a band and set it on thy brow bonivar her mouth was open to intercede with his desire but his forehead became black as night and he shouted in the thunder of his lion voice do this she took the jewel from its warm bed in her bosom and held it and got together a band of green weeds and set it in the middle of the band and tied the band on her brow and lifted her countenance to the chief ruark stood back from her and gazed on her and he would have veiled his sight from her but his hand fell then the might of her loveliness seized bonivar likewise and the full orbs of her eyes glowed on the chief as on a mirror and she moved her serpent figure scornfully and smiled saying is it well and he when he could speak replied tis well i have seen thee for now can i die this day if it be that i am to die and well it is for now know i there is truly no place but the tomb can hold me from thee bonivar put the jewel from her brow into her bosom and questioned him why is thy dread this day o my chief he answered her gravely i have seen ruckruth my mother while i slept and she was weeping weeping by a stream yea a stream of blood and it was a stream that flowed in a hundred gushes from her own veins the sun of this dawn now seest thou not tis over crimson the vulture hangeth low down yonder valley and he cried to her haste mount with me for i have told ruckruth a thing and i know that woman crafty in the thwarting of schemes 
such a fox as she where aught accordeth not with her forecastings and the judgment of her love for me by allah twere well we clash not for that i will do i do and that she will do doth she so the twain mounted their steeds and ruach gathered his arabs and placed them some in advance some on either side of bonivar and they rode forward to the head of the valley and across the meadows through the blushing crowds of flowers baths of freshest scents cool breezes that awoke in the nostrils of the mares neighing of delight and these pranced and curvetted and swung their tails and gave expression to their joy in many graceful fashions but a gloom was on ruark and a quick fire in his falcon eye and he rode with heels alert on the flanks of his mare dashing onward to right and left as do they that beat the jungle for the crouching tiger once when he was well nigh half a league in front he wheeled his mare and raced back full on bonivar grasping her bridle and hissing between his teeth not a soul shall have thee save i by the tomb of my fathers never while life is with us and he taunted her with bitter names and was as one in the madness of intoxication drunken with the aspect of her matchless beauty and with exceeding love for her and bonivar knew that the dread of a mishap was on the mind of the chief now the space of pasture was behind them a broad lake of gold and jasper and they entered region of hills heights and fastnesses robed in forests that rose in rounded swells of leafage each over each above all points of snow that were as flickering silver flames in the farthest blue this was the country of bonivar and she gazed mournfully on the glades of golden green and the glens of iron blackness and the wild flowers wild blossoms and weeds well known to her that would not let her memory rest and were wistful of what had been and she thought my sisters tend the flocks my mother spinneth with the maidens of the tribe my father hunteth how shall i come among them but strange coldly will they regard me i shall feel them shudder when they take me to their bosoms she looked on ruark to speak with him but the mouth of the chief was set in white and even while she looked cries of treason and battle arose from the arabs that were ahead hidden by a branching wind of the way round a mountain slant then the eyes of the chief reddened his nostrils grew wide and the darkness of his face was as flame mixed with smoke and he seized bonivar and hastened onward and lo yonder were his men overmatched and the warriors of the mountains bursting on them from an ambush on all sides ruark leapt in his seat and the light of combat was on him and he dug his knees into his mare and shouted the war-cry of his tribe lifting his hands as it were to draw down wrath from the very heavens and rush to the encounter says the poet hast thou seen the wild herd by the jungle galloping close with a thunder of hoofs they trample what heads may oppose terribly crushing tempest like onward they sweep but a spring from the reeds and the panther is sprawling in air and with muzzle to dust and black beards foam lashed here and there scattered they fly crimson eyed tracked with blood to the deep such was the onset of ruark his stroke the stroke of death and ere the echoes had ceased rolling from that cry of his the mountain warriors were scattered before him on the narrow way hurled down the scrub of the mountain even as dead leaves and loosened stones so like an arm of lightning was the chief now ruark pursued them and was lost to bonivar round a slope of the mountain she quickened her pace to mark him in the glory of battle and behold a sudden darkness enveloped her and she felt herself in the swath of tightened folds clasped in an arm and borne rapidly she knew not whither for she could hear and see nothing it was to her as were she speeding constantly downward in darkness to the lower realms of the genii of the caucasus and every sense and even that of fear was stunned in her how long an interval had elapsed she knew not when the folds were unwound but it was light of day in the faces of men and they were warriors that were about her warriors of the mountain but of ruark and his arabs no voice so she said to them what do ye with me and one among them that was a youth of dignity and grace and a countenance like morning on the mountains answered the will of ruckruth o lady and it is the plight of him we bow to with ruckruth mother of the desert chief she cried is he here the prince that i may speak with him the same young warrior made answer not so forewarned was he and well for him bonivar drew her robe about her and was mute ere the setting of the moon they journeyed on with her and continued so three days and nights through the defiles and ravines and matted growths of the mountain on the fourth dawn they were on the summit of a lofty mountain rise below them the sun shooting a current of gold across the leagues of sea then he that had spoken with bonivar said a sail shall come and a sail came from under the sun scarce had the ship grated shore 
when the warriors lifted Bonivar, and waded through the water with her, and placed her unwedded in the ship, and one, the fair youth among the warriors, sprang on board with her, remaining by her. So the captain pushed off, and the wind filled the sails, and Bonivar was borne over the luster of the sea, that was as a changing opal in its luster, even as a melted jewel flowing from the fingers of the Maker, the Almighty One. The ship ceased not sailing till they came to a narrow strait, where the sea was but a river between fair sloping hills, alight with towers and palaces, opening a way to a great city, that was in its radiance over the waters of the sea, as the aspect of myriad sheeny white doves breasting the wave. Hitherto the young warrior had held aloof in coldness of courtesy from Bonivar, but now he sat by her, and said, The bond between my prince and Ruckruth is accomplished, and it was to snatch thee from the chief of the Beni Asser, and bring thee even to this city." Bonivar exclaimed, "'Allah be praised in all things, and his will be done.' The youth continued, "'Thou art alone here, old lady, exposed to the perils of loneliness. Surely it were well if I linger with thee a while, and see to thy welfare in this city, even as a brother with a sister, and I will deal honourably by thee.' Bonivar looked on the young warrior, and blushed at his exceeding sweetness with her. The soft freshness of his voice was to her as the blossom-laden breeze in the valleys of the mountains, and she breathed low the words of her gratitude, saying, If I am not a burden, let this be so. Then said he, Know me by my name, which is Almeril, and that we seem indeed of one kin, make known unto me thine. She replied, Ill-omened is it, this name of Bonivar. The youth among the warriors gazed on her a moment with the fluttering eye of bashfulness, and said, can they that have marked thee call thee other than Bonivar the Beautiful? She remembered that Ruark had spoken in like manner, and the curse of her beauty smote her, and she thought, This fair youth, he hath not a mother to watch over him, and ward off souls of evil. I dread there will come a mishap to him through me. Allah shield him from it. And she sought to dissuade him from resting by her, but he cried, Tis but a choice to dwell with thee, or with the dogs in the street outside thy door. O oh, Bonivar! Now the ship sailed close up to the quay, and cast anchor there in the midst of other ships of merchandise. Almeril then threw a robe over his mountain dress, and spoke with the captain apart, and he and Bonivar took leave of the captain, and landed on the quay among the porters, and of these one stepped forward to them and shouted, cheerily, Where be the burdens and the bales, O ye fair couple fashioned in the eye of elegant proportions? Ye twin palm trees, male and female, wallahi, broad is the back of your servant. Almeril beckoned him that he should follow them, and he followed them, blessing the wind that had brought them to the city and the day. So they passed through the streets and lanes of the city, and the porter pointed out this house and that house, wanting an occupant, and Almeril fixed on one in an open thoroughfare that had before it a grass plot, and behind a garden with fountains and flowers, and grass knolls shaded by trees, and he paid down the half of its price, and had it furnished before nightfall, sumptuously, and women in it to wait on Bonivar, and stuffs and goods, and scents for the bath, all luxuries whatsoever that tradesmen and merchants there could give in exchange for gold. Then Almeril dismissed the porter in Allah's name, and gladdened his spirit with a gift over the dew of his hire that exalted him in the eyes of the porter, and the porter went from him, exclaiming, In extremity, Ukleek is thy slave. And he sang, Shouldst thou see a slim youth with a damsel arriving? Be sure tis the hour when thy fortune is thriving. A generous fee makes the members so supple, that over the world they could carry this couple. Now so it was that the youth Almeril and the damsel Bonivar abode in the city they had come to weeks and months, and life to either of them, as the flowing of a gentle stream, even as brother and sister lived they, chastely, and with temperate feasting. Surely the youth loved her with a great love, and the heart of Bonivar turned not from him, and was won utterly by his gentleness and nobleness and devotion, and they relied on each other's presence for any joy, and were desolate in absence, as the poet says, When we must part, love, such is my smart love, sweetness is savourless, fairness is favourless, but when in sight, love, we two unite, love, earth has no sour to me, life is a flower to me. And with the increase of every day their passion increased, and the revealing light in their eyes brightened, and was humid, as is sung by him that looted to the rage of hearts. Even star yonder, come like a crown on us, larger and fonder, grows its orb down on us, so love my love for thee, blossoms increasingly, so sinks it in the sea, waxing unceasingly. 
On a night when the singing girls had left them, the youth could contain himself no more, and caught the two hands of Bonivar in his, saying, This that is in my soul for thee thou knowest, O Bonivar, and tis spoken when I move and when I breathe, O my loved one. Tell me then the cause of thy shunning me whenever I would speak of it, and be plain with thee. For a moment Bonivar sought to release herself from his hold, but the love in his eyes entangled her soul as in a net, and she sank forward to him and sighed under his chin. "'Twas indeed my very love of thee that made me." The twain embraced and kissed a long kiss, and leaned sideways together, and Bonivar said, "'Hear me what I am.' Then she related the story of the serpent and the jewel, and of the death of her betrothed. When it was ended, Almeril cried, "'And was this all, this that severed us?' And he said, "'Hear what I am.' So he told Bonivar how Rukruth, the mother of Ruark, had sent messengers to the prince his father, warning him of the passage of Ruark through the mountains, with one, a queen of serpents, a sorceress, that had bewitched him and enthralled him in a mighty love for her, to the ruin of Ruark, and how the chief was on his way with her to demand her in marriage at the hands of her parents, and the words of Rukruth were, By the service that was between thee and my husband, and by the death he died, O prince, rescue the chief my son from this damsel, and entrap her from him, and have her sent even to the city of the inland sea, for no less a distance than that keepeth Ruark from her. And Almeril continued, I questioned the messengers myself, and they told me the marvel of thy loveliness, and the peril to him that looked on it. So I swore there was no power should keep me from a sight of thee, O oh, my loved one, my prize, my life, my sleek antelope of the hills. Surely when my father appointed the warriors to lie in wait for thy coming, I slipped among them, so that they thought it ordered by him I should head them. The rest is known to thee, O oh, my fountain of blissfulness." But the treachery to Ruark was the treachery of Eben Azrak, not of such warriors as we. And I would have fallen on Eben Azrak had not Ruark so rooted that man without faith. Twas all as I have said. Blessed be Allah and his decrees. Bonivar gazed on her beloved, and the bridal dew overflowed her underlids, and she loosed her hair to let it flow, part over her shoulders, part over his, and in sighs that were the measure of music she sang, I thought not to love again. But now I love as I loved not before. I love not, I adore. O oh, my beloved, kiss, kiss me. Waste thy kisses like a rain. Are not thy red lips fain? Oh, and so softly they greet. Am I not sweet? Sweet must I be for thee, or sweet in vain. Sweet to thee only, my dear love. The lamps and censers sink, but cannot cheat. These eyes of thine that shoot above, trembling lustres of the dove. A darkness drowns all lustres. Still I see thee, my love, thee. Thee, my glory of gold, from head to feet, Oh, how the lids of the world close, Quite when our lips meet. Almeril strained her to him and responded, My life was midnight on the mountain side, Cold stars were on the heights there, In my darkness I had lived and died, Content with nameless lights, Sudden I saw the heavens flush with a beam, And I ascended soon, and evermore, Over mankind supreme, stood silver in the moon. And he fell playfully into a new meter, singing, who will I paint, my beloved, in musical word or color? Earth with an envy is moved. Seashells and roses she brings. Gems from the green ocean springs. Fruits with the fairy bloom dews. Feathers of paradise hues. Waters with jewel-bright falls. Or from the genii halls. All in their splendor approved. All but matched with my beloved. Darker and denser and duller. Then she kissed him for that song and sang, once to be beautiful was my pride, and I blushed in love with my own bright brow. Once when a wooer was by my side, I worshipped the object that had his vow. Different, different, different now. Different now is my beauty to me. Different, different, different now. For I prize it alone, because prized by thee. Almeril stretched his arm to the lattice and drew it open. Letting in the soft night wind, and the sound of the fountain, and the bulbul, and the beam of the stars, and verse to her and the languor of deep love. Whether we die or we live, matters it now no more. Life has not further to give. Love is its crown and its core. Come to us either we're rife, death or life. Death can take not away. Darkness and light are the same. We are beyond the pale ray, wrapped in a rosier flame. Welcome which will to our breath, life or death. So did these two lovers lute and sing in the stillness of the night, pouring into each other's ears melodies from the new sea of fancy, and feeling that flowed through them. Ere they ceased their sweet interchange of tenderness, which was but one speech from one soul, a glow of light ran up to the sky, 
and the edge of a cloud was fired, and in the blooming of dawn Almeril hung over Bonivar, and his heart ached to see the freshness of her wondrous loveliness, and he sang, looking on her, The rose is living in her cheeks, the lily in her rounded chin. She speaks but when her whole soul speaks, and then the two flow out and in, and mix their red and white to make the hue for which I'd paradise forsake. Her brow from her black falling hair ascends like morn, her nose is clear, as morning hills and finely fair, with pearly nostrils curving near, the red bow of her upper lip. Her bosom's the white wave beneath the ship, the fearful earth, the enraptured skies. She images in constant play. Night and the stars are in her eyes, but her sweet face is beaming day, a bounteous interblush of flowers, a dewy brilliance in a dale of bowers. Then he said, and this morning shall our contract of marriage be written, and witnessed. She answered, As my lord willeth, I am his. Said he, And it is thy desire? She nestled to him, and dinted his bare arm with the pearls of her mouth, for a reply. So that morning their contract of marriage was written, and witnessed by the legal number of witnesses in the presence of the cat eye, with his license on it endorsed, and Bonavar was the bride of Almeril, he her husband, Never was youth blessed in a bride like that youth. Now the twain lived together the circle of a full year of delightful marriage, and love lessened not in them, but was as the love of their first day. Little cared they having each other for the loneliness of their dwelling in that city, where they knew none save the porter Aklit, who went about their commissions. Sometimes to amuse themselves with his drolleries, they sent for him, and were bountiful with him, and made him drink with them on the lawn of their garden, leaning to an inlet of the sea and then he would entertain them with all the scandal and gossip of the city, and its little folk, and great. When he was outrageously extravagant in these stories of his, Bonivar exclaimed, Are such things now? Can it be true? And he nodded in his conceit, and replied loftily, Tis certain, O my prince and princess, ye be from the mountains, unused to the follies and dissipations of men, where they heard, and ye know them not, men. The lamps being lit in the garden to the edges of the water, where they lay one evening, Akalit, who had been in his briskest mood, became grave, and put his forefinger to the side of his nose, and began, Hear ye aught of the great tidings? Wullahi, no other than the departure of the wife of Bulp, the broker, into darkness. Tis of Bulp ye hire this house, and had ye a hundred houses in this city, ye might have had them from Bulp the broker, he's that rich. And glory to them whom Allah prospereth, say I. And I mention this matter, for tis certain now, Bulp will take another wife to him, to comfort him. For there be two things beloved of Bulp, and therein manifesteth he taste with the discernment of excellence, and what is approved. And of these two things let the love of his hordes of the yellow-skinned treasure go first, and after that attachment to the silver-skinned of creation, the fair, the rapturous, even to them. So by this see ye not Bulp will yearn in his soul for another spouse? Now, O oh, ye well-matched pair, what a chance were this! Knew ye but a damsel of the mountains, exquisite in symmetry, a moon to enrapture the imagination of Bulp, and in the nature of things herit his possessions, for Bulp is an old man, even very old. They laughed and cried, We know not of such a damsel, and the broker must go unmarried for us. When next Akalit sat before them, Almoral took occasion to speak of Bulp again, and said, This broker, O oh, Akalit, is he also a lender of money? Aklit replied, O oh, my prince, he is or he is not, tis of the maybes. I wot, truly Bulp is one that baiteth the hook of an emergency. The brows of the prince were downcast, and he said no more. But on the following morning he left Bonavar early under a pretext, and sallied forth from the house of their abode alone. Since their union in that city they had not been once apart, and Bonavar grieved and thought, Waneth his love for me? and she called her women to her, and dressed in this dress and that dress, and was satisfied with none. The dews of the bath stood cold upon her, and she trembled, and fled from mirror to mirror, and in each she was the same surpassing vision of loveliness. Then her women held a glass to her, and she examined herself closely, if there might be a fleck upon her anywhere, and all was as snow of the mountains on her round limbs, sloping in the curves of harmony, and the faint rose of the dawn on slants of snow was their hue. Twining her fingers and sighing, she thought, It is not that. He cannot but think me beautiful. She smiled a melancholy smile at her image in the glass, exclaiming, What availeth it, thy beauty? For he is away, and looketh not on thee, thou vain thing. 
and what of thy loveliness if the light illumine it not for he is the light to thee and it is darkness when he's away suddenly she thought what's that which needeth to light it no other light i had well nigh forgotten it in my bliss the jewel then she went to a case of ebony wood where she kept the jewel and drew it forth and shone in the beam of a pleasant imagination thinking twill surprise him and she robed herself in a robe of saffron and set lesser gems of the diamond and the emerald in the braid of her hair and knotted the serpent jewel firmly in a band of gold thread tissue and had it woven in her hair among the braids in this array she awaited his coming and pleased her mind with picturing his astonishment and the joy that would be his mute were the women who waited on her for in their lives they had seen no such sight as bonivar beneath the beams of the jewel and the whole chamber was aglow with her now in her anxiety she sent them one and one repeatedly to look forth at the window for the coming of the prince so when he came not she went herself to look forth and stretched her white neck beyond the casement while her head was exposed she heard a cry of some one from the house in the street opposite and bonivar beheld in the house of the broker an old wrinkled fellow that gesticulated to her in a frenzy she snatched her veil down and drew in her head in anger at him calling to her maids what is yonder hideous old dotard and they answered laughing tis indeed bulp the broker o fair mistress and mighty to divert herself she made them tell her of bulp and they told her a thousand anecdotes of the broker and verses of him and the constancy of his amorous condition and his greediness and bonivar was beguiled of her impatience till it was evening and the prince returned to her so they embraced and she greeted him as usual waiting what he would say searching his countenance for a token of wonderment but the youth knew not that aught was added to her beauty for he looked nowhere save in her eyes bonivar was nigh weeping with vexation and pushed him from her and chid him with lack of love and weariness of her and the eye of the prince rose to her brow to read it and he saw the jewel almeril clapped his hands crying wondrous and this thy surprise for me my fond one beloved of mine then he gazed on her a space and said knowest thou thou art terrible in thy beauty bonivar and hast the face of lightning under that jewel of the serpent she kissed him whispering not lightning to thee yet lovest thou bonivar he replied surely so and all save bonivar in this world is darkness of oblivion to me when it was the next morning almeril rose to go forth again ere he had passed the curtain of the chamber bonivar caught him by the arm and she was trembling violently her visage was a wild inquiry thou goest and again there is something hidden from me almeril took her to his heart and caressed her with fond flatteries saying ask but what is beating under these two pomegranates and thou learnest all of me but she stamped her foot crying no no i will hear it there's a mystery so he said well then it is this only small matter enough i have a business with the captain of the vessel that brought us hither and i must see him ere he setteth sail no other than that thou jealous watchful star pierce me with thine eyes it is no other than that she levelled her lids at him till her lustrous black eyelashes were as arrows and mimicked him softly no other than that and he replied even so then she clung to him like a hungry creature repeating even so and let him go alone she summoned a slave a black and bade him fetch to her without delay akleet the porter and the porter was presently ushered into her protesting service and devotion so she questioned him of almeril and the prince's business abroad what he knew of it akleet commenced reciting verses on the ills of jealousy but bonivar checked him with an eye that akleet had seen never before in woman or in man and he gaped at her helplessly as one that has swallowed a bone she laughed crying learn o thy fellow to answer my like by the letter now what she heard from ukli when he had recovered his wits was that the prince had a business with none save the lenders of money so she spake to ukli in a kindly tone thou art mine to serve me he was as one fascinated and delivered himself yea o my mistress with tongue service toe service back service brain service whatsoever pleaseth thy sweet presence said she hie over to the broker opposite and bring him hither to me akleet departed saying to hear is to obey end of part two of chapter two
Section 5 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 2, Part 3. And this is the story of Bonivar the Beautiful. She sat gazing on the jewel and its counter-changing splendors in her hand, and the thought of Almeral and his necessity was her only thought. Not ten minutes of the hour had passed before the women, waiting on her, announced Uckleet and the broker Bulp. Bonivar gave little heed to the old fellow's grimaces and the compliments he addressed her, but handed him the jewel and desired his valuation of its worth. The face of Bulp was a keen edge when he regarded Bonivar, but the sight of the jewel sharpened it tenfold, and he crossed his arms, exclaiming, A jewel, this? So Bonivar cried to him, Fix a price for it, O thy broker. And Bulp, the old miser, debated and began prating. O lady, the soul of thy slave is abashed by a double beam. This the jewel of jewels, thou truly of thy sex. And saving thee, there's no jewel of worth like this one. And together ye be, well a high. Never felt I aught like this, since my espousal of sulka that's gone. And twas nothing like it then. Now, O my princess, Confess it freely, this is but a pretext, this valuation of the jewel, and Uckleet our go-between, and leave the rewarding of him to me, well a high, I can be generous, and my days of favour with fair ladies be not yet over. Blessed be Allah for this day, and thinkest thou those eyes fell on me with discriminating observation, ere my sense of perception was struck by thee? Not so, for I had noted thee. O moon of hearts, from my window yonder. In this fashion, Bulp the broker went on prating and bowing and screwing the corners of his little acid eyes to wink the wink of common accord between himself and Bonivar. Meantime, she had spoken aside to one of her women, and a second black slave entered the chamber, bearing in his hand a twisted scourge, and that slave laid it on the back of Bulp the broker and by this means he was brought quickly to the valuation of the jewel. Then he named a sum that was a great sum, but not the value of the jewel to the fiftieth part, nay, nor the five hundredth part of its value. And Uckleet remonstrated with him, but he was resolute, saying, Even that sum leaves me a beggar. So Bonivar said, My desire is for immediate payment of the money, and the jewel is thine for that sum. Now the broker went to fetch the money, and returned with it, in bags of gold, one half the amount, and bags of silver, one third, and the remainder in writing made due at a certain period for payment. And he groaned and handed her the money, and took the jewel in his hands, ejaculating, In the name of Allah. That evening, when it was dark, and the lamps lit in the chamber, and the wine set in the nosegay, Almeral asked of Bonivar to see her under the light of the jewel. She warded him with an excuse. But he was earnest with her, so she feigned that he teased her, saying, "'Tis that thou art no longer content with me, as I am, O my husband? Then she said, "'Wert thou successful in thy dealings this day?' His arm slackened round her, and he answered nothing. So she cried, "'Fie on thee, thou foolish one! And what is thy need of running over this city? Know I not thy case and thine occasion, O my beloved? Surely I am queen of serpents.' a mistress of enchantments, a diviner of things hidden, and I know thee. Here, then, is what thou requirest, and conceal not from me thy necessity another time, my husband. Upon that she pointed his eye to the money-bags of gold and of silver. Almeral was amazed, and asked her, How came these? For I was at the last extremity, without coin of any kind. She answered, How but by the serpents? And he exclaimed, would that I might work as that porter worketh, rather than this. Now seeing he bewailed her use of the powers of the jewel, Bonivar fell between his arms and related to him her discovery of his condition, and how she disposed of the jewel to the broker, and of the scourging of Bulp. And he praised her and clave to her, and they laughed and delighted their souls in plenteousness, and bliss was their portion. As the poet says, Bliss that is born of mutual esteem, and tried companionship, I truly deem. A well-based palace, wherein fountains rise, from springs that have their sources in the skies. 
so were they for a while. It happened that one day, that was the last day of the year since her wearing of the jewel, Akleet said to them, Be wary, the vizier Aswarak hath his eye on you, and it is no cool one. I say nothing, the wise are discreet in their tellings of the great. Tis certain the broker Bulp forgetteth not his treatment here. They smiled, turning to each other, and said, We live innocently, we harm no one, what should we fear? During the night of that day, Bonivar awoke and kissed the prince, and, lo, he shuddered in his sleep, as with the grave cold. A second time she was awakened on the breast of Almeril by a dream of the serpents of the lake Caratis, the lake of the jewel. And she stood up, and there was in the street a hum of voices, and she saw there, before the house, armed men with naked steel in their hands. Scarce had she called Almeril to her, when the outer door of their house was forced, and she shrieked to him, "'Tis thou they come for! Fly, O my prince, my husband! The way of the garden is clear!' But he said sadly, "'Nay, what am I? It is thou they would win from me. I'll leave thee not in this life.' So she cried, "'O my soul, then together! But I shall hinder thee, and be a burden to thy flight.' And she called on the All-Powerful for aid, and ran with him into the garden of the house, and lo, by the waterside, at the end of the garden, a boat full of armed soldiers with scimitars. So these fell upon them, and bound them, and haled them into the house again, where was the dark vizier Aswarak, and certain officers of the night watch with a force. The vizier cried when he saw them, I accuse thee, Prince Almeral, of being here in the city of our lord the king, to conspire against him and his authority. Almeral faced the vizier firmly, and replied, I knew not in my life I had made an enemy, but there is one here who telleth that of me. The vizier frowned, saying, Thou deniest this, and thou here, in thy father at war with the sovereignty of our lord the king? Almeral beheld his danger, and he said, Is this so? Then cried the vizier, Hear him, is not that a fair simulation? So he called to the guard, Shackle him. When that was done, he ordered the house to be sacked, and the women and the slaves he divided for a spoil. But he reserved Bonivar to himself. And, lo, twice she burst away from them that held her, to hang upon the lips of Almeril, and twice was she torn from him, as a grape bunch is torn from the streaming vine. And the third time she swooned, and the anguish of life left her. Now Bonivar was born to the harem of the vizier, and for days she suffered no morsel of food to enter her mouth, and was dying, had not the vizier, in the cunning of his dissimulation, fed her with distant glimpses of Almeril to show her he yet lived. Then she thought, While my beloved liveth, life is due to me. And she ate and drank, and reassumed her fair fullness and the queenliness that was hers. But the vizier had no love of her, and respected her, considering in his mind, Time will exhaust the fury of this tigress, and she is a fruit worth the waiting for. Well, a high, I shall have possessed her ere the days of over-ripening. There was in the harem of the vizier a mountain girl that had been brought there in her childhood and trained to play upon the lute and accompany her voice with the instrument. To this little damsel, Bonivar gave her heart and would listen all day as in a trance to her luting till the desire to escape from that bondage and gather tidings of Almeril mastered her, and she persuaded one of the blacks of the harem with a bribe to procure her an interview with the porter Akleet. So at a certain hour of the night Akleet was introduced into the garden of the harem, and he was in the darkness of that garden, a white-faced porter with knees that knocked the dread march together. But Bonivar strengthened his soul, and he said to her, "'Twas the doing of Bulp the broker, and he whispered the vizier of thee and thy beauty, O oh, my mistress, surely thy punishment and this ruin is but a part payment to bulb of the price of the jewel, the great jewel that's in the hands of the vizier. Then she questioned him, And Almeril the prince, my husband, what of him? Akleet was dumb, and Bonivar asked to hear no more. Surely she was at the gates of pale spirits within an hour of her interview with Akleet, and there was no blessedness for her save in death the stiffer of ills, the drug that is infallible. As is said, 
Dark is that last stage of sorrow, which from death alone can borrow comfort. Bonivar would have died then, but in a certain pause of her fever, the vizier stood by her. She looked at him long as she lay, and the life of her large eyes was ebbing away slowly, but there seemed presently a check, as an eddy comes in the stream, and the light of intelligence flowed like a reviving fire into her eyes, and her heart quickened with the desire of life while she looked on the vizier. So she passed the pitch of that fever, and bloomed anew in her beauty, and cherished it, for she had a purpose. Now there was rejoicing in the harem of the vizier Aswarak when Bonivar arose from the couch, and the vizier exulted, thinking, I have tamed this wild beauty, or she had reached death in that extremity. So he allowed Bonivar greater freedom and indulgences, and Bonivar feigned to give her soul to the pleasures women delight in, and the vizier buried her in gems and trinkets and costly raiment, robes of exquisite silks, the choicest of Samarsand in China, and he permitted her to make purchases among certain of the warehouses of the city and the shops of the tradesmen, jewellers and others, so that she went about as she would, but for the slaves that attended her and the overseer of the harem. This continued, and Aswarak became urgent with her, and to remove suspicion from him, she named a day from that period when she would be his. Meantime, she contrived to see Ukleet the porter frequently, and within a week of her engagement with the vizier, she gazed from a lattice window of the harem, and beheld in the garden, by the beams of the moon, Ukleet, and he was looking as on the watch for her. So she sent to him the little mountain girl she loved, but Ukleet would tell her nothing. Then went she herself, greeting him graciously, for his service was other than that of self-seeking. Ukleet said, O oh, lady, mistress of hearts, moon of the tides of will, "'Tis certain I was thy slave from the hour I beheld thee first, "'and of the prince thy husband, Allah rest his soul. "'Now these be my tidings, wallah high. "'The king is one maddened with the reports I've spread about of thy beauty, "'yea, raging, and I have a friend in his palace, even an undercook, "'acute in the interpreting of wishes. "'There was he always gabbling of thy case, O my princess, "'till the head cook seized hold on it, and so it went to the chamberlain.' thence to the chief of the eunuchs, and from him, in a natural course, to the king. Now from the king the tracking of this tale went to the undercook down again, and from him to me. So was I summoned to the king, and the king discoursed with me, I with him, in fair fluency, he in ejaculations of desire to have sight of thee, I in expiation on what he would see when he had his desire. Now in this have I not done thee a service, O sovereign of fancies. Bonivar mused and said, On the after-morrow I pass through the city to make a selection of goods, and I shall pass at noon by the great mosque, on my way to the shop of Eben Rulchuk, the king's jeweller, beyond the meat-market. Of a surety I know not how my lord the king may see me. Said the porter, Tis enough on my head be it, and he went from her singing the song. How little a thing serves fortune's turn when she's intent on doing. How easily the world may burn when kings come out a wooing. Now, ere she set forth on the after morrow to make her purchases, Bonivar sent word to the vizier Aswarak that she would see him, and he came to her drunken with alacrity, for he augured favorably that her reluctance was melting toward him. So she said, O oh, master, my time of mourning is at an end, and I would look well before thee, even as one worthy of being thy bride. So bestow on me, I pray thee, for my wearing that day, the jewel that be in thy treasury, the brightest and clearest of them, and the largest. The vizier Aswarak replied, and he was one in great satisfaction of soul, All that I have are thine, wallahi, and one a marvel that I bought of Bolt the broker, that had it from an African merchant. So he commanded the box wherein he had deposited the jewel to be brought to him there in the chamber of Bonivar and took forth the serpent jewel between his forefinger and thumb, and laughed at the eager eyes of Bonivar when she beheld it, saying, "'Tis thine, thy bridal gift, the day I possess thee. Bonivar trembled at the sight of the jewel, and its redness was to her as the blood of Zervan and Almeril. She stretched her hand out for it, and cried, "'This day, O oh my lord, make it mine.' 
So the vizier said, Nay, what I have spoken will I keep to. It has cost me much. Bonivar looked at him and uttered in a soft tone, Truly it has cost thee much. Then she exclaimed as in play, See me how I look by its beam? And in her guile she snatched the jewel from him and held it to her brow. Then Aswarak started from her and feared her, for the red light of the jewel glowed and darkened the chamber with its beam, darkening all save the luster that was on the visage of Bonivar. He shouted, What's this? Art thou a sorceress? She removed the jewel and ceased glaring on him and said, Nothing but thy poor slave. Then he coaxed her to give him the jewel, and she would not. He commanded her peremptorily, and she hesitated. So he grasped her tightened hand, and his face lowered with wrath. Yet she withheld the jewel from him, laughing, and he was stirred to extreme wrath, and drew from his girdle the naked scimitar, and menaced her with it. And he looked mighty, but she dreaded him little, and stirred her full height before him, daring him, and she was as the tigress defending a cub from a wilder beast. Now when he was about to call in the armed slaves of the palace, she said, I warn thee, Vizier Aswarak, tempt me not to match them that serve me with them that serve thee. He ground his teeth in fury, crying, A conspiracy and in the harem? Now thy traitress, the logic of the lash, shall be tried upon thee. And he roared, Ho, ye without there, ho! But ere the slaves had entered, Bonavar rubbed the jewel on her bosom, muttering, I have forborne till now, now will I have a sacrifice, though I be it. And rubbing the jewel, she sang, Hither, hither, come to your queen, come through the grey wall, come through the green. There was heard a noise like the noise of a wind coming down a narrow gorge above falling waters, a hissing and a rushing of wings, and behold, Bonavar was circled by rings and rings of serpent folds, that glowed round her, twisted each in each with the fierceness of fire, she like a flame rising up white in the mists of them. The black slaves, when they had lifted the curtain of the harem chamber, shrieked to see her, and Aswarak crouched at her feet with the aspect of an angry beast carved in stone. Then Bonavar loosed on either of the slaves a serpent, saying, What these have seen they shall not say. And while the sweat dropped heavily from the forehead of Aswarak, she stepped out of the circle of serpents, singing, Over, over, high to the lake, Sleep with the left eye, keep the right awake. Then the serpents spread with a great whirr, and flew through the high window and the walls as they had come, and she said to the vizier, What now, fearest thou? I have spared thee, thou that madest me desolate, and thy slaves are a sacrifice for thee. Now this I ask, Where lies my beloved? the prince my husband, speak nothing of him save the place of his burial. So he told her, in the burial ground of the great prison. She rolled her eyes on the vizier darkly, exclaiming, Even where the felons lie entombed, he lieth? And she began to pant, pale with what she had done, and leaned to the floor and called, Yellow stripe with freckle red, coil and curl and watch by my head and a serpent with yellow stripes and red freckles came like a javelin down to her, and coiled and curled round her head, and she slept an hour. When she arose, the vizier was yet there, sitting with folded knees. So she sped the serpent to the lake Caratus, and called her women to her, and went to an inner room, and drew an outer robe and a vest over that she had on, and passed the vizier, and said, Art thou not rejoiced in thy bride, O Azorak? "'Twas a wondrous clemency hers. "'Now but four more days, and thou claimest her. "'Say nothing of what thou hast seen, "'or thou wilt shortly see nothing further to say, my master.' "'So she left the vizier, sitting still in that chamber, "'and mounted a mule, attended by slaves on foot, "'before and behind her, and passed through the streets, "'till she came to the shop of Eben Rulchik. "'The king was in disguise at the extremity of the shop, and while she examined this and that of the precious stones, Bonavar for a moment made bare the beauty of her face, and love's fires took fast hold of the king, and he cried, I marvel not at the eloquence of the porter. Now she made Eben Rulchuk bring to her a circlet of gold, with a hollow in the frontal center, and fit into that hollow the serpent jewel. 
So while she laughed and chatted with her women, Bonivar lifted the circlet, and made her countenance wholly bare even to the neck, and the beginning slope of the bosom, and fixed the circlet to her head with the jewel burning on her brow. Then when he beheld the glory of excelling loveliness that she was, and the splendor in her eyes under the jewel, the king shouted and parted with his disguise, and Eben Rolchuk and the women and slaves, with Bonivar, fled to the courtyard that was behind the shop, leaving Bonivar alone with the king. Surely Bonivar returned not to the dwelling of the vizier. Now the king Marshalid espoused Bonivar, and she became his queen and ruled him, and her word was the dictate of the land. Then caused she the body of Almeril, with the severed head of the prince, to be disinterred and entombed secretly in the palace, and she had lamps lit in the vault, and the pall spread, and the readers of the Koran to read by the tomb, and then she stole to the tomb hourly, in the day and in the night, wailing of him in her utter misery, repeating verses at the side of the tomb, and they were, Take me to thee like the deep-rooted tree, my life is half in earth and draws, thence all sweetness, O oh, may my being pause, soon beside thee. Welcome me soon as to the queenly moon, man's homage to my beauty sets, yet am I a rose-shrub budding regrets, welcome me soon. Soul of my soul, have me not half but whole, dear dust thou art my eyes, my breath, draw me to thee down the dark sea of death, soul of my soul. And she sang, Sad are they who drink life's cup, Till they have come to the bitter sweet, Better at once to toss it up, And trample it beneath the feet, For venom charged as serpent's eggs, Tis then and knows not other change, Early, early, early have I reached the dregs, Of life and loathe and love the bitter sweet revenge. Then turned she aside and sang musingly, I came to his arms like the flower of the spring, and he was my bird of the radiant wing. He fluttered above me a moment and won the bliss of my breast as a beam of the sun, untouched and untasted till then. The voice in her throat was like a drowning creature, and she rose up and chanted wildly, I weep again. What play is this? For the thing is dead in me long since. With all the reviving rain of heaven bring me back my prince. But I, when I weep, when I weep, blood will I weep. And when I weep, Sons for fathers shall weep, mothers for sons shall weep, wives for husbands shall weep, earth shall complain of floods red and deep, when I weep. Upon that she ran up a secret passage to her chamber, and rubbed the jewel, and called the serpents, to delight her soul with the sight of her power, and rolled and sported madly among them, clutching them by the necks, till their thin little red tongues hung out, and their eyes were as discoloured blisters of venom. Then she arose, and her arms and neck and lips were glazed with the slime of the serpents, and she flung off her robes to the close-fitting silken inner vest looped across her bosom with pearls, and whirled in a mazy dance measure among them, and sang melancholy melodies, making them delirious, fascinating them, and they followed her round and round, in twines and twists and curves, with arched heads and stiffened tails, and the chamber swam like an undulating sea, of swift sapphire lit by the moon of midnight. Not before the moon of midnight was in the sky ceased, Bonivar sporting with the serpents, and she sank to sleep exhausted in their mist. Such was the occupation of the queen of Marshalid, when he came not to her. The women and slaves of the palace dreaded her, and the king himself was her very slave. Meanwhile the plot of her unforgivingness against Aswarak ripened, and the vizier, beholding the bride he had lost, Queen of Marshalid, his master, it was as she conceived, that his heart was eaten with jealousy and fierce rage. Bonivar, as she came across him, spake mildly, and gave him gentle looks, sad glances, suffering not his fires to abate, the torment of his love to cool. Each night he awoke with a serpent in his bed. The beam of her beauty was as the constant bite of a serpent, poisoning his blood, and he deluded his soul with the belief that Bonivar loved him notwithstanding, and that she was seized forcibly from him by the king. Otherwise, thought he, why loosed she not a serpent from the host to strangle me even as yonder black slaves? Bonivar knew the mind of Aswarak, and considered, The king is cunning and weak, a slave to his desires, and in the bondage of the jewel my beauty. The vizier is unscrupulous, a hatcher of intrigues, 
but that he dreads me in hopes a favour of me he would have wrought against me ere now tis then a combat twixt him and me o my soul art thou dreaming of a fair youth that was the bliss of thy bosom night and day night and day the vizier shall die one morning and it was a year from the day she had become queen of marshalide bonnevar sprang up quickly from the side of the king and he was gazing on her in amazement and loathing she flew to her chamber chasing forth her women and ran to a mirror therein she saw three lines that were on her brow lines of age and at the corners of her mouth and about her throat a slackness of skin the skin no longer its soft rosy white but withered brown as leaves of the forest she shrieked and fell back in a swoon of horror when she recovered she ran to the mirror again and it was the same sight and she rose from swooning a third time and still she beheld the visage of a hag nothing of beauty there save the hair and the brilliant eyes then summoned she the serpents in a circle and the number of them was that of the days in the year and she bared her wrist and seized one a grey silver with sapphire spots and hissed at him till he hissed and foam whitened the lips of each thereupon she cried treble tongue and throat of hell what has come upon me tell and the serpent replied jewel queen beauty's sprice tis the time for sacrifice she grasped another one of leaden colour with yellow bars and silver crescents and said treble tongue and throat of fire name the creature ye require and the serpent replied ruby lip poison tooth we are hungry for a youth she grasped another that writhed in her fingers like liquid emerald and cried treble tongue and throat of glue how to know the one that's due and the serpent replied breast of snow baleful bliss he that wooing wins a kiss she clutched one at her elbow a hairy serpent with yellow languid eyes and flame sockets and livid lustrous length a disease to look on and cried treble tongue and throat of gall there's a youth beneath the pall and the serpent replied brilliant eye bloody tear he has fed us for a year she squeezed that hairy serpent till her finger points whitened in his neck and he dropped lifelessly crying treble tongues and things of mud spring my beauty from his blood and the serpents rose erect replying yearly one of us must die yearly for us dieth one else the queen an ugly lie lives till all our lives be done bonnevar stood up and hurried them to caratus when she was alone she fell toward the floor repeating tis the curse Suddenly she thought, Yet another year my beauty shall be nourished by my vengeance, yet another, and, O oh, vizier, the kiss shall be thine, the kiss of doom, for I have doomed the air now. Thou, thou shalt restore me to my beauty, that only love I now, my prince is lost. She veiled her face in the close veil of the virtuous, and dispatched Akleet, whom she exalted in the palace of the king to the vizier, and Akleet stood before Aswarak and said, O vizier, my mistress truly is longing for you with excessive longing, and in what she now undergoeth is forgotten an evil done by you to her, and she bids you come and concert with her a scheme deliberately as to the getting rid of this tyrant who is an affliction to her, and her life is lessened by him. The vizier was deceived by his passion, and he chuckled and exclaimed, My very dream, and to mind me of her then she sent the serpents, while a high in the matter of women wait for as the poet declareth tis vanity our souls for such to vex patience is a harvest of the sex and they fret themselves not over long for husbands that are gone these young beauties i know them tell the queen of serpents i am even hers to the sole of my foot so it was understood between them that the vizier should be at the gate of the garden of the palace that night disguised and the vizier rejoiced thinking if she have not the jewel with her, it shall go ill with me, and I foiled this time. Ucleet then proceeded to the house of Bulk the broker, fronting the gutted ruins where Bonnevar had been happy in her innocence with Almeril, the mountain prince, her husband. Bulk was engaged haggling with a slave merchant the price of a fair slave, and Ucleet said to him, Yet a while delay, old Bulk, ere you expend a fraction of treasure, for truly a mighty bargain of jewels is waiting for you at the palace of my lord the king. So come thither with all your money-bags of gold and silver, and your securities, and your bonds and dues in writing, 
for tis the favourite of the king, requireth you to complete a bargain with her, and the price of her jewels is the price of a kingdom. Said Bulp, hearing is compliance in such a case. And Duckleek continued, What a fortune is yours, O Bulp? Truly the tide of fortune setteth into your lap. Fail not, Walla High, to come with all you possess, or if you have not enough when she requireth it to complete the bargain, my mistress will break off with you. I know not if she intend even other game for you, O lucky one. Bull pitched his girdle and shrugged, saying, "'Tis she will fail, I won't. She, in having therewith to complete the bargain between us. Wah, wah, there, I have done this before now. Well, a high, if she have not enough of her rubies and pearls to outweigh me and my gold, go to. Bull will school her. What says the poet? Earth and ocean search east, west, and north to the south. None will match the bright rubies and pearls of her mouth. Aha, what? Oh, Akleet, and he says, The lovely one's a bargain made with me, and I renounce my trade. The lovely one's a bargain made with me, and I renounced my trade. Half ruined, ah, said they, return and win. To even scales ourselves we will throw in. How so? But let discreetness reign, and security flourisheth. Akleet nodded at him, and repeated the distich. Men of worth and men of wits, shoot with two arrows and make two hits. So he arranged with Bulk the same appointment as with the vizier, and returned to Queen Bonivar. Now in the dark of night, Aswarak stood within the gate of the palace garden of Marshalid that was ajar, and a hand from a veiled figure reached to him, and he caught it in the fullness of his delusion, crying, Thou my queen? But the hand signified silence, and drew him past the tank of the garden, and through a court of the palace, into a passage lit with lamps, and on into a closed curtain chamber, and beyond a heavy curtain into another, a circular passage, descending between black hangings, and at the bottom a square vault draped with black, and in it precious woods burning, oils and censers, and the odor of ambergris and myrrh and musk floating in clouds, and the sight of the vizier, was for a time obscured by the thickness of the incenses floating. As he became familiar with the place, he saw marked therein a board spread at one end with viands and wines, and the nosegay in a water-vase, and cups of gold and a service of gold, every preparation for feasting mightily. So the soul of Aswarak leapt, and he cried, Now unveil thyself, O moon of our meeting, my mistress. The voice of Bonivar answered him, not till we have feasted and drunken, and it seemeth little in our eyes. Surely the chamber is secure. Could I have chosen one better for our meeting, O Aswarak? Upon that he entreated her to sit with him to the feast, but she cried, Nay, delay till the other is come. Cried he, Another? But she exclaimed, Hush! And saying thus, went forward to the foot of the passage, and Bulp was there, following Ukli both of them under a weight of bags and boxes. So she welcomed the broker, and led him to the feast, he coughing and wheezing and blinking, unwitting the vexation of the vizier, nor that one other than himself was there. When Bulp heard the voice of the vizier, in astonishment addressing him, he started back and fell upon his bags, and the task of coaxing him to the board was as that of hailing a distempered beast to the water. Then they sat and feasted together, and Ukleet with them, and if Aswarak or Bulp waxed impatient of each other's presence, he whispered to them, Only wait, see what she reserveth for you. And Bonivar mused with herself, Truly that reserved shall be not long coming. So they drank, and wine got the mastery of Aswarak, so that he made no secret of his passion, and began to lean to her, and verse extemporaneously in her ear, and she stinted not in her replies answering to his urgency in girlish guise, sighing behind the veil, as if under love's influence, and the vizier pressed close, and sang, "'Tis said that love brings beauty to the cheeks, of them that love and meet, but mine are pale, for merciless disdain on me she reeks, and hides her visage from her passionate tale. I have her only, only when she speaks, Bonivar unveil. I have thee, and I have thee not, like one, lifted by spirits to a shining dale." In paradise who seeks to leap and run, And clasp the beauty by his foot doth fail, For he is blind, ah, then more woeful none, 
Bonnevar unveil. He thrust the wine cup to her, and she lifted it under her veil, and then sang in answer to him, My beauty for thy worth, thank the vizier. He giveth thee second birth, thank the vizier. His blooming form without a fault, thank the vizier, is at thy foot in this blessed vault, thank the vizier. He knoweth not he telleth such a truth, thank the vizier, that thou through him springest fresh in blushing youth, thank the vizier. He knoweth little now, but he shall soon be wise, thank the vizier. This meeting bringeth bloom to cheeks and lips and eyes, thank the vizier. O oh, my beloved, in this blessed vault, if I love thee for I, thank the vizier. Thine am I, thine, and learns his soul what it has taught, to die. Thank the vizier. End of part three of chapter two. Section six of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 2, Part 4. And this is the story of Bonavar the Beautiful. Now Aswarak divined not her meaning, and was enraptured with her, and cried, Wallahi, so and such thy love. Thine am I, thine. And what a music is thy voice, O oh, my mistress! Twere a bliss to Eblis in his torment could he hear it. Life of my head, and is thy beauty increased by me? Nay, thou flatterer. Then he said to her, Away with these importunate dogs! Tis the very hour of tenderness. Wallahi, they offend my nostril. Stung am I at the sight of them. She rejoined, O oh, Aswarak, star of the morn, thou that wakenest my beauty from night and scorn, Thy time is near, and when tis come, Long will a jackal howl, That this thy request had been dumb, O Aswarak, star of the morn. So the vizier imaged in his mind The neglect of Marshalid from these words, and said, Leave the king to my care, O queen of serpents, And expend no portion of thy power on him, But hasten now the going of these fellows, My heart is straitened by them, And I, Wallahi, would gladly see a serpent round the necks of either. She continued, O oh, Azorak, star of the morn, Lo, the star must die, When splendid our light is born, And stronger floods the beam will drown. Shrink thou puny orb, And dread to bring me my crown. O oh, Azorak, star of the morn. Then said she, Hark a while at those two, There's a disputation between them. So they hearkened, And Uckleet was pledging Bulp, And passing the cup to him. But a sullenness had seized the broker, And he refused it and Uckleet shouted, Out, boon fellow, and what a company art thou, that thou refusest the pledge of friendliness, plague on all sulkers. And the broker, the old miser, obstinate, as are the half-fuddled, began to mumble, I came not here to drink, O Uckleet, but to make a bargain, and my bags be here, and I like not yonder veil, nor the presence of yonder vizier, nor the secrecy of this. Now by the prophet and that interdict of this, I'll drink no further. And Uckleet said, Let her not mark your want of friendship, or twill go ill with you. Here be fine wines, spirited wines, choice flavors, and you drink not. Where's the soul in you, O Bulp, and where's the life in you, that you yield her to the vizier utterly? Surely she waiteth a gallant sign from you, so challenge her cheerily. Quoth Bulp, I care not. Shall I leave my wealth and all I possess void of eyes? And she so that I recognize her not behind the veil? Ukli pushed the old miser jeeringly. You not recognize her? Oh, Bulp, a pretty dissimulation. Pledge her now a cup to the snatching of the veil, and bethink you of a fitting verse, a seemly compliment, something sugary. Then Bulp smoothed his head and was bothered, and tapped it, and commenced repeating to Bonavar, I saw the moon behind a cloud, and I was cold as one that's in his shroud. And I cried, Moon! Uckleet chorused him, Moon! And Bulp was deranged in what he had to say, and gasped, Moon! I cried, Moon! And I cried, Moon! Then the vizier and Uckleet laughed till they fell on their backs. So Bonavar took up his verse where he left it, singing, And to the cry, Moon did make fair the following reply, Daughter, be still for thy desire, 
is to embrace consuming fire. Then said Pulp, O oh, my mistress, the laws of conviviality have till now restrained me, but my coming here was on business, and with me my bags, and good faith. So let us transact this matter of the jewels, and after that the song of Thou and I a couple try, even as thou wilt. Bonivar threw aside her outer robe and veil, and appeared in a dress of sumptuous blue, spotted with gold bees, her face veiled with a veil of gauzy silver, and she was as the moon in summer heavens, and strode majestically forward, saying, The jewels tis but one, behold! The lamps were extinguished, and in her hand was the glory of the serpent jewel, no other light save it in the vaulted chamber. So the old miser perked his chin and brows, and cried wondering, I know it, this jewel, O my mistress! She turned to the vizier, and said, Lifting the red gloom of the jewel on him, And thou? Aswarak ate his underlip. Then she cried, There's much ye know in common ye, too. Thereupon Bonivar passed from the feast on to the centre of the vault, and stood before the tomb of Almeral, and drew the cloth from it, and they saw by the glow of the jewel that it was a tomb. When she had mounted some steps at the side of the tomb, she beckoned them to come, crying in a voice of sobs, This which is here, likewise you may know. So they came with the coldness of a mystery in their blood, and looked as she looked intently over a tomb. The lid was of glass, and through the glass of the lid the jewel flung a dark rosy ray on the body of Almeral lying beneath it. Now the miser was perplexed at the sight, but Aswarak stepped backward in defiance, bellowing, "'Twas for this I was tricked to come here. Is it fooling me a second time? By Allah, look to it. Not a second time will Aswarak be fooled. Then she ran to him and exclaimed, Fooled? For what camest thou to me? And he, foaming and grinding his breath, Thou woman of wiles, thou serpent, but I'll be gone from here. So she faltered in sweetness, knowing him doomed, and loving to dally with him in her wickedness. Indeed, if thou camest not for my kiss. Then said the vizier, Yet a further guile. Was it not an outrage to bring me here? She faltered again, leaning the fair length of her limbs on a couch. "'Tis ill that we are not alone, else could these lips convince thee well, else indeed. And the vizier cried, "'Chase then these intruders from us, O thou sorceress, and above all serpents in power, for thou poisonest with a touch, and the eye and the ear alike take in thy poisons greedily. Thou overcomes the senses, the reasons, the judgment, yea, vindictiveness, wrath, suspicions, leading the soul captive with a breath of thine, as twere a breeze from the gardens of bliss. Bonivar changed her manner a little, lisping, And why that starting from the tomb of a dead harmless youth? And that abuse of me? He peered at her inquiringly, echoing, Why? And she repeated, as a child might repeat it, Why that? Then the vizier smote his forehead in the madness of utter perplexity, changing his eye from Bonivar to the tomb of Almeral, doubting her truth, yet dreading to disbelieve it. So she saw him fast enmeshed in her subtleties, and clapped her hands, crying, Come again with me to the tomb, and note if there be aught I am to blame in, O Aswarak, and plight thyself to me beside it. He did nothing save to widen his eyes at her somewhat. And she said, The two are yon side the tomb, and they hear us not, and see us not by this light of the jewel, so come up to it boldly with me, free thy mind of its doubt, and for a reconcilement kiss me on the way. Aswarak moved not forward, but as Bonivar laid the jewel in her bosom, he tore the veil from her darkened head, and caught her to him, and kissed her. Then Bonivar laughed, and shouted, How is it with thee, vizier Aswarak? He was tottering, and muttered, Tis a death chill hath struck me even to my marrow. So she drew the jewel forth once more, and rubbed it ablaze, and the noise of the serpents neared, and they streamed into the vault, and under it, and fiery jets surrounding Bonivar, and whizzing about her, till in their velocity they were indivisible. And she stood as a fountain of fire, clothed in flashes of the underworld, the new loveliness of her face growing vivid violet, like an incessant lightning above them. Then stretched she her two hands, and saying to the serpents, Hither, hither to the feast, hither to the sacrifice, virtue for my sake hath ceased, now to make an end of vice. Twisted tail and treble tongue, swelling length and greedy maw, I have had a horrid wrong. Retribution is the law. Ye that sucked my youthful lord, now shall make another meal. 
Seize the black vizier abhorred. Seize him, seize him, throat and heel. Such a serpent wits to find. Torches of a new device. Have him, have him, heart and mind. Hither to the sacrifice. Then she whirled with them round and round as a tempest whirls. And when she had wound them to a fury, lo, she burst from the hissing circle and dragged Akleet from the vault into the passage and blocked the entrance to the vaults. So was Queen Bonivar avenged. Now she said to Akleet, Ransom presently the broker, him they will not harm, and hastened to the king that he might see her in her beauty. The king reclined on cushions in the harem with a fair slave girl, newly from the mountains, toying with the pearls in her locks. Then thought Bonivar, Let him not slight me. So she drew a rose-colored veil over her face and sat beside Marshalid. The king continued his fondling with the girl, saying to her, Was there no destiny foretold of thy coming to the palace of the king to rule it? O Nashta, star-beam in the waters, and hadst thou no dream of it? Bonivar struck the king's arm, but he noticed her not, and Nashta laughed. Then Bonivar controlled her trembling, and said, O word, O king, and vouchsafe me a hearing. The king replied languidly, still looking on Nashta, "'Tis a command that the voice of none that are crabbed and hideous be heard in the harem, and I find comfort in it. O oh, Nashta, but speak thou, my fountain of sweet-dropping lute-notes. Bonivar caught the king's hand and said, "'I have to speak with thee. Tis the queen. Chase from us this little wax puppet a space.' The king disengaged his hand and leaned it over to Nashta, who began playing with it and fitting on it a ring, giggling. Then, as he answered nothing, Bonivar came nearer and slapped him on the cheek. Marshalid started to his feet, and his hand grasped his girdle. But that wrathfulness was stayed when he beheld the veil slide from her visage. So he cried, My queen, my soul! She pointed to Nashta, and the king chid the girl, and sent her forth lean with his shifted displeasure, as a kitten slinks wet from a fish-pond, where it had thought to catch a great fish. Then Bonivar exclaimed, there was a change in thy manner to me before that creature. He sought to dissimulate with her, but at last he confessed, I was truly this morning the victim of a sorcery. Thereupon she cried, And thou went angered to find me not by thee on the couch, but one in my place a hag of ugliness? Here then the case, O Marshalid. Surely that old crone had a dream, and it was that if she slept one night by the king, she would arise fresh in health from her ills, and with powers lasting a year, to heal others of all maladies with a touch. So she came to me, petitioning me to bring this about. O oh, my lord the king, did I well in being privy to her desire? The king could not doubt this story of Bonivar, seeing her constant loveliness, and the arch of her flashing brow, and the oval of her cheek and chin, smooth as milk. So he said, O oh, my queen, I had thought to go as I must, gladly, but how shall I go knowing thy truth? thy beauty unchanged, thee faithful, a follower of the injunctions of the prophet in charitable deeds, cried she, and whither goeth my lord, and on what errand? He answered, the people of a province southward have raised the standard of revolt, and mocked my authority. They have been joined by certain of the Arab chiefs, subject to my dominion, and have defeated my armies. Tis to subdue them I go, yea, to crush them. Yet while the high I know not, Care I if kingdoms fall away in nations, so that I have thee? Nay, let all pass, so that thou remain by me. Bonivar paced from him to a mirror, and frowned at the reflection of her fairness, thinking, Such had he spoken to the girl Nashta, or another, this king. And she thought, I have been beloved by the noblest three on earth. I will ask no more of love. Vengeance I have had. Tis time that I demand of my beauty nothing save power and I will make this king my stepping-stone to power, rejoicing my soul with the shock of armies. Now she persuaded Marshalid to take her with him on his expedition against the Arabs, and they set forth, heading a great assemblage of warriors, southward to the land bordering the desert. The king credited the suggestions of Bonivar that Aswarak had disappeared to join the rebels, and pressed forward in his eagerness to inflict a chastisement signal and swiftness upon them, and that traitor, so eagerly marshally journeyed to his army in advance that the main body, with Bonivar, was left by him long behind. She had encouraged him, saying, 
I shall love thee much if thou art speedy in winning success. The queen was housed on an elephant, harnessed with gold and with silk and purple trappings. From the rose-hued curtains of her palanquin, she looked on a mighty march of warriors. Filling the extent of the plains, all day she fed her sight on them. Surely the story of her beauty became noised among the guards of her person that rode and ran beneath the royal elephant, till the soldiers of Marshalid spake but of the beauty of the queen, and Bonivar was as a moon shining over that sea of men. Now they had passed the cultivated fields, and were halting by the ford of a river bordering the desert, when, lo, a warrior on the yon side, riding in a cloud of dust, and his shout was, The king Marshalid is defeated and flying. Then the captains of the host witnessed to the greatness of Allah, and were troubled with a dread, fearing to advance. But Bonivar commanded a horse to be saddled for her, and mounted it, and plunged through the ford singly. So they followed her, and all day she rode forward on horseback, touching neither food nor drink. By night she was a league beyond the foremost of them, and fell upon the king encamped in the desert, with the loose remnant of his forces. Marshalid, when he had looked on her, forgot his affliction, and stood up to embrace her, but Bonivar spurned him, crying, A time for this, in the time of disgrace? Then she said, How came it? He answered her, There was a chief among the enemy, an Arab, before the terror of whom... My people fled. Cried she, Conquer him on the morrow. Until then I eat not, drink not, sleep not. On the morrow, Marshalid again encountered the rebels, and Bonivar, seated on her elephant, from a sand hillock under a palm, beheld the prowess of the Arab chief and the tempest of battle that he was. She thought, I have seen but one mighty in combat like that one, Ruark, the chief of the Beni Asser. Thereupon she coursed toward the king, even where the arrows gloomed like locusts, thick and dark in the air aloof, and said, The victory is with yonder chief. Hurl on him three of thy sons of valor. The three were selected and made onslaught on this chief and perished under his arm. Bonivar saw them fall and exclaimed, Another attack on him, and with thrice three. Her will was the mandate of Marshalid and these likewise were ordered forth and closed on the chief. But he darted from their toils and wheeled about them, spearing them one by one till the nine were in the dust. Bonivar compressed her dry lips and muttered to the king, Head thou a body against him. Marshalid gathered round his standard the chosen of his warriors, and smoothed his beard and headed them. Then the chief struck his lance behind them and stretched rapidly a half-circle across the sand and halted on a knoll. When they neared him, he retreated in a further half-circle, and continued this wise, wasting the fury of Marshalid, till he stood among his followers. There, as the king hesitated and prepared to retreat, he and the others of the tribe leveled their lances, and hung upon his rear, fretting them, slaughtering captains of the troop. When Marshalid turned to face his pursuer, the chief was alone, immovable on his mare, fronting the ranks. Then Bonivar taunted the king, and he essayed the capture of that chief a second time, and a third, and it was each time as the first. Bonivar looked about her, with rapid eyes, murmuring, Oh, what a chief is he! Oh, that a cloud would fall, a smoke arise, to blind these hosts, that I might sling my serpents on him unseen! For I will not be vanquished, though it be by Ruark. So she drew to the king, and the altercation between them was fierce in the fury of the battle, he saying, "'Tis a feint of the chief, this challenge and I. "'Must succor the left of my army by the well, "'that he is overmatching with numbers.' "'Said she, "'If thou hid them not, then will I, "'and thou shalt behold a woman do what thou durst not, "'and lose her love and win her scorn.' "'While they spake, the Arabs they looked on "'seemed to flutter and waver, "'and the chief was backing to them, "'calling to them as for words of shame to rally them.' Seeing this, Marshalid charged against the chief once more, and, lo, the Arabs opened to receive him, closing on his band of warriors like waters whitened by the storm on a fleet of swift scudding vessels. And there was a dust and a tumult visible, such as is seen in the darkness when a vessel struck by the lightning bolt is sinking flashes of steel, lifting of hands, rolling of horsemen and horses. Then Bonivar groaned aloud, they are lost, shame to us, only one hope is left, 
that tis Ruark, this chief. Now the view of the plain cleared, and with it she beheld the army of Marshally broken, the king borne down by a dust of Arabs. So she unveiled her face, and rode on the host within the horsemen that guarded her, glorious with a crown of gold and the glowing jewel on her brow. When she was a javelin's flight from them, the Arabs shouted and paused in terror, for the light of her head was as the sun setting between the clouds of thunder. But that chief dashed forward like a flame, beaten level by the wind, crying, Banavar, Banavar, and she knew the features of Ruark. So she said, Even I, and he cried again, Bonavar, Bonavar, and was as one stricken by a shaft. Then Bonavar threw on him certain of the horsemen with her, and he suffered them without a sign to surround him and grasp his mare by the bridle rein and bring him, disarmed, before the queen. At sight of Ruark, a captive, the Arabs fell into confusion and lost heart and were speedily chased and scattered from the scene like a loose spray before the wind. But Marshally, the king, rejoiced mightily and praised Bonavar, and the whole army of the king praised her, magnifying her. Now with Ruark she interchanged no syllable, and said not farewell to him, when she departed with Marshalid to encounter other tribes, and the chief was bound and conducted a prisoner to the city of the inland sea, and cast into prison, in expectation of death the releaser, and continued there well nigh a year, eating the bitter bread of captivity. In the evening of every seventh day there came to him a little mountain girl that sat by him and leaned a lute to her bosom, singing of the mountain in the desert. But he turned his face from her to the wall. One day she sang of death the releaser, and Ruark thought, "'Tis come, she warneth me, merciful as Allah. On the morning that followed, Akleet entered the cell, and with him three slaves, blacks, armed with scimitars. So Ruark stood up and bore witness to his faith, saying, Swift with the stroke. But Ukleet exclaimed, Fear not, the end is not yet. Then said he, Peace with thee, these slaves, O chief, excelling in martial qualities. Surely they my retinue, and the retinue of them of my rank in the palace. And where I go, they go. For the exalted have more shadows than one. Yea, three have they in my case, even very grimly black shadows whereupon the idle expends not laughter, and whoso joketh in their hearing, tis Wallahai, the last joke of that person. In such wise are the powerful known among men, they that stand very prominent in the beams of prosperity. Now this of myself, but for thee, of a surety, the Queen Bonavar, my mistress, will be here by the time of the rising of the moon, in the name of Allah. Saying that, he departed in his greatness, and Ruark watched for her, that rose in his soul as the moon in the heavens. Meanwhile, Bonavar had mused, "'Tis this day, the day when the serpents desire their due, and the king martially they shall have. For what is life to him but a treachery and a dalliance, and what is my hold on him but this jewel of the serpents? He has had the profit of beauty, and he shall yield the penalty. My kiss is for him, my serpent kiss." and I will release Ruark, and espouse him, and war with kings, sultans, emperors, infidels, subduing them till they worship me. She flashed her figure in the glass, and was lovely therein, as one in the light of paradise. But ere she reached the king Marshalid, lo, the hour of the serpents had struck, and her beauty melted from her as snow melts from off the rock. And she was suddenly haggard in utter uncomeliness, and knew it not, but marched, smiling a grand smile, on to the king. Now, as Marshally lifted his eyes to her, he started, amazed, crying, The hag again! And she said, What of the hag, O my lord the king? Thereat he was yet more amazed, and exclaimed, The hag of ugliness with the voice of Bonavar. Has then the queen lent that loathsomeness her voice also? Bonavar chilled a moment, and looked on the faces of the women present, and they were staring at her, the younger ones tittering, and among them Nashta, whom she hated. So she cried, Away with thee! But the king commanded them, Stay. Then the queen leaned to him, saying, I will speak with my lord alone. Whereat he shrank from her and spat. Ice and flame shivered through the blood of Bonavar. Yet such was her eagerness to give the kiss to Marshalid, that she leaned to him, still wooing him to her with smiles. 
Then the king seized her violently and flung her over the marble floor to the very basin of the fountain, and the crown that was on her brow fell and rolled to the feet of Nashta. The girl lifted it, laughing, and was in the act of fitting it to her fair head amid the chuckles of her companions, when a slap from the hand of Bonivar spun her round twice, and she dropped to the marble insensible. The king bellowed in wrath and ran to Nashta, crying to the queen, Surrender that crown to her, foul hag. But Bonivar had bent over the basin of the fountain, and beheld the image of her change therein, and was hurrying from the hall and down the corridors of the palace to the private chamber. So he made bare the steel by his side, and followed her with a number of the harem guard, menacing her, and commanding her to surrender the crown with the jewel. Ere she could lay hand on a veil, he was beside her, and she was encompassed. In that extremity Barnivar plucked the jewel from her crown, and rubbed it, calling the serpents to her. One came, one only, and that one would not move from her to sling himself about the neck of Marshalid, but whirled round her, hissing, Every hour a serpent dies, till we have the sacrifice. Sweeten, sweeten with thy kiss, quick a soul for Caratis. Surely the king bit his breath marvelling, and his fury became an awful fear, and he fell back from her, molesting her no further. Then she squeezed the serpent, till his body writhed in knots, and veiled herself, and sprang down a secret passage to the garden, and it was the time of the rising of the moon. Coolness and soothingness dropped on her, as a balm from the great light, and she gazed on it murmuring, as in a memory, Shall I counsel the moon in her ascending? Stay under that dark palm tree through the night. Rest on the mountain slope by the couching antelope. O thou enthroned supremacy of light, and for ever the luster thou art lending, lean on the fair long brook that leaps and leaps, silvery leaps and falls, hang by the mountain walls, moon and arise no more to crown the steeps, for a danger and dollar is thy wending. And she panted and sighed and wept, crying, Who, who will kiss me or have my kiss now, that I may indeed be as yonder beam? Who, that I may be avenged on this king? And who sang that song of the ascending of the moon, that comes to me as a part of me from old times? As she gazed on the circled radiance swimming under a plume of palm leaves, she exclaimed, Ruark, Ruark the chief. So she clasped her hands to her bosom, and crouched under the shadows of the garden, and fled through the garden gates and the streets of the city, heavily veiled to the prison where Ruark awaited her within the walls, and Akalit without. The governor of the prison had been warned by Akalit of her coming, and the doors and bars opened before her unchallenged, till she stood in the cell of Ruark. Her eyes that were alone unveiled scanned the countenance of the chief, the fevered luster jet of his looks, and by the little moonlight in the cell she saw with a glance the straw heap and the fetters, and the black bread and water untasted on the bench, signs of his misery and desire for her coming. So she greeted him with the word of peace, and he replied with the name of the All-Merciful. Then said she, O Ruark, of Ruckruth thy mother, tell me somewhat. He answered, I know not of her since that day. Allah have her in his keeping. So she cried, How? What sayest thou, Ruark? Tis a riddle. Then he said, The oath of Ruark is no rope of sand. He swore to see her not till he had set eyes on Bonivar. She knelt by the chief, saying in a soft voice, Very greatly the chief of the Beni Asar loved Bonivar. And she thought, Yea, greatly and verily loved I him and he shall be no victim of the serpents, for I defy them, and give them other prey. So she said in deeper tones, Ruark, the queen has come hither to release thee. O my chief, O thou soul of wrath, Ruark, my fire-eye, my eagle of the desert, where is one on earth, beloved as thou art by Bonivar? The dark light in his eyes kindled as light in the eyes of a lion, and she continued, Ruark, what a yoke is hers, who weareth this crown? He that is my lord, how am I mated to him, save in loathing? O my chief, my lion, hadst thou no dream of Bonivar, that she would come hither to unbind thee, and lift thee beside her, and live with thee in love, and veilness loveliness, thine, yea, and in power over lands and nations and armies, lording the infidel, taming them to submission, exulting in defiance and assaults, in victories and magnanimities, thou and she? 
Then, while his breast heaved like a broad wave, the queen started to her feet, crying, Lo, she is here, and this she offereth thee, Ruart. A shrill cry parted from her lips, and to the clapping of her hands, slaves entered the cell with lamps and instruments to strike off the fetters from the chief. And they released him, and Ruark leaned on their shoulders to bear the weight of a limb. So was he weakened by captivity. But Bonivar thrust them from the chief, and took the pressure of his elbow on her own shoulder, and walked with him thus to the door of the cell, he sighing as one in a dream that dreameth the bliss of bliss. Now they had gone three paces onward, and were in the light of many lamps, when, behold, the veil of Bonivar caught in the sleeve of Ruark as he lifted it, and her visage became bare. She shrieked and caught up her two hands to her brow, but the slaves had a glimpse of her, and said among themselves, this is not the queen. And they murmured, "'Tis an impostor, one in league with the chief. Bonivar heard them say, "'Arrest her with him at the governor's gate,' and summoned her soul, thinking, "'He loveth me, the chief. He will look into my eyes and mark not the change. What need I then to dread his scorn when I ask of him the kiss? Now must it be given, or we are lost, both of us.' And she raised her head on Ruark, and said to him, "'My chief,' Ere we leave these walls and join our fates, wilt thou plight thyself to me with a kiss? Ruark leaped to her like the bounding leopard, and gave her the kiss, as were it his whole soul he gave. Then in a moment Bonivar felt the blush of beauty burn over her, and drew the veil down on her face, and suffered the slaves to arrest her with Ruark, and bring her before the governor, and from the governor to the king in his council chamber, with the chief of the Beniasser. Now the king marshally had called to her, Thou traitress, thou sorceress, thou serpent. And she answered under the veil, What? O my lord the king, and wherefore these evil names of me? Cried he, Thou thing of guile, and thou hast pleaded with me for the life of the chief, thus long to visit him in secret? Life of my head, I but marshalled is not one to be fooled. So she said, Tis Bonivar, hast thou forgotten her? Then he waxed white with rage, exclaiming, Yea, tis she, a serpent in the slough, and Ukli in the torture hath told of thee what is known to him. Unveil, unveil. She threw the veil from her figure, and smiled, for Marshalid was mute, the torrent of invective frozen on his mouth, when he beheld the miracle of beauty that she was, the splendid jewel of throbbing loveliness. So to scourge him, with the bitter lash of jealousy, Bonivar turned her eyes on Ruark, and said sweetly, Yet shalt thou live to taste again the bliss of the desert. Pleasant was our time in it, O my chief. The king glared and choked, and she said again, Nor he conquered thee, but I, and I that conquered thee. Little will it be for me to conquer him. His threats are the winds of idleness. Surely the world darkened before the eyes of Marshalid, and he arose and called to his guard hoarsely, Have off their heads. They hesitated, dreading the queen, and he roared, Slay them! Bonivar beheld the winking of the steel, but ere the scimitars descended, she seized Ruark, and they stood in a whizzing ring of serpents, the sound of whom was as the hum of a thousand wires, struck by storm winds. Then she glowed, towering over them, with the chief clasped to her, and crying, King of vileness, match thy slaves, with my creatures of the caves. And she sang to the serpents, Seize upon him, sting him through, Thrice this day shall pay your due. But they, instead of obeying her injunction, made narrower their circle round Bonivar and the chief. She yellowed and took hold of the nearest serpent, horribly crying, Dare against me to rebel, ye the bitter brood of hell? And the serpent gasped in reply, When the kiss to us secures, give us ours, and we are yours. Thereupon another of the serpents swung on, the feet of Ruark winding his length upward round the body of the chief. So she tugged at that one, tearing it from him violently and crying, Him ye shall not have, I swear. Seize the king that's crouching there. And that serpent hissed, This is he the kiss ensures. Give us ours, and we are yours. Another and another serpent she flung from the chief, and they began to swarm venomously, answering her no more. Then Ruark bore witness to his faith, and folded his arms with the grave smile she had known in the desert, and Bonivar struggled and tussled with the serpents in fierceness, strangling and tossing them to right and left. 
"'Great is Allah!' cried all present, and the king trembled, for never was sight like that seen. The hall flashing with the serpents, and a woman serpent, their queen, raging to save one from their fury, shrieking at intervals, "'Never, never shall ye fold! Save with me the man I hold!' But now the hiss and scream of the serpents and the noise of their circling was quickened to a slurred, savage sound, and they closed on Ruark, and she felt him stifling, and that they were relentless. So in the height of the tempest, Bonnevar seized the jewel in the gold circlet on her brow and cast it from her. Lo, the serpents instantly abated their frenzy, and flew all of them to pluck the jewel, chasing the one that had it in his fangs through the casement, and the hall breathed empty of them. Then, in the silence that was, Bonnevar veiled her face, and said to the chief, Pass from the hall, while they yet dread me, no longer am I queen of the serpents. But he replied, Nay, said I not, my soul is thine? She cried to him, Seest thou not the change in me? I was bound to those serpents for my beauty, and tis gone. Now I am powerless, hateful to look on. O Ruark, my chief! He remained still, saying, what thou hast been, thou art! She exclaimed, O oh, true soul, the light is hateful to me, as I to the light, but I will yet save thee to comfort Ruckruth, thy mother. So she drew him with her swiftly from the hall of the king, ere the king had recovered his voice of command. But now the wrath of the all-powerful was upon her and him. Surely within an hour from the flight of the serpents, the slaves and soldiers of Marshalid laid at his feet, two heads that were the heads of ruark and bonnevar and they said o great king we tracked them to her chamber and through to a passage and a vault hung with black wherein were two corpses one in a tomb and one unburied and we slew them there clasping each other o king of the age marshalid gazed upon the head of bonnevar and sighed for death had made the head again fair with a wondrous beauty a loveliness never before seen on earth End of chapter 2。Section 7 of The Shaving of Shagpat。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees。The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith。Chapter 3. The Betrothal Now, when Shibli Bagarag had ceased speaking, the vizier smiled gravely and shook his beard with satisfaction, and said to the Eclipser of Reason, What opinest thou of this nephew of the barber, O Noorna bin Noorka? She answered, O Feshnavat, my father, truly I am content with the bargain of my betrothal. He, Wallahi, is a fair youth of flowing speech. Then she said, Ask thou him what he opineth of me, his betrothed. So the vizier put that interrogation to Shibli Bagarag, and the youth was in perplexity, thinking, Is it possible to be joyful in the embrace of one that hath brought thwackings upon us, serious blows? Thinking, Yet hath she, when the mood cometh, kindly looks, and I marked her eye dwelling on me admiringly. And he thought, Mayhap she that groweth younger, and counteth nature backwards, hath a history that would affect me, or it may be my kisses. Wah! I like not to give them, and it is said, Love is withered by the withered lip, and that, on bones become too prominent, he'll trip. Yet put the case that my kisses, I shower them not, Allah the all-seeing is my witness, and they be given daintily as twere to the leaf of a nettle, or over hot pillow. Yet haply kisses repeated might restore her to a bloom, and it is certain youth is somehow stolen from her. If the vizier Feshnavat went before her, and his blood be her blood, and he is powerful, she wise. I'll decide to act the part of a rejoicer, and express of her opinions honeyed to the soul of that sex. Now while he was thus debating, he hung his head, and the vizier awaited his response, knitting his brows angrily at the delay, and at the last he cried, What? No answer? How's this? Shall thy like dare hold debate when questioned of my like? And is my daughter, Noorna bin Noorka, thinkest thou a slave-girl in the market, thou haggling at her price, O thou nephew of the barber? So Shibli Bagarag exclaimed, O exalted one, bestower of the bride, 
Surely I debated with myself but for appropriate terms, and I delayed to select the meter of the verse fitting my thoughts of her, and my wondrous good fortune, and the honor done me. Then the vizier, let us hear. We listen. And Shibli Bagarag was advised to deal with illustrations in his dilemma, by ways of expression, and spake in extemporaneous verse, and with full voice. The pupils of the sage for living beauty sought, and one a vision clasped, and one a model wrought. I have it, each exclaimed, and rivalry arose. Paint me thy maid of air, thy grace of clay disclose. What? Limbs that cannot move. What? Lips that melt away. Keep thou thy maid of air. Shroud up thy grace of clay. Twas thus, contending hot, they went before the sage, and knelt at the wise wells of cold ascetic age. The fairest of the twain, O father, thou record. He answered, Fairest she who's likest to her lord. Said they, What fairer thing matched with them might prevail? The sage austerely smiled, and said, Yon monkey's tail. Tis left for after time his wisdom to declare, That's loveliest we best love, and to ourselves compare. Yet lovelier than all hands shape or fancies build, The meanest thing of earth God with his fire hath filled. Now, when Shibli Bagarag ceased, Noorna bin Noorka cried, Enough, O wondrous turner of verse, thou that art honest. And she laughed loudly, rustling like a bag of shavings, and rolling in her laughter. Then said she, O my betrothed, is not the thing thou wouldst say no other than, Each to his mind doth the fairest enfold, for broken long since was beauty's mould? And, Thou that art old, withered, I cannot flatter thee, as I can in no way pay compliments to the monkey's tale of high design, nevertheless the sage would do thee honour. So read I thy illustration, O keen of wit, and thou art forgiven its boldness, my betrothed, Wallahi, utterly so. Now the youth was abashed at her discernment, and the kindliness of her manner won him to say, There's many a flower of sweetness, there's many a gem of earth, would thrill with bliss our being, could we perceive its worth. O beauteous is creation, in fashion and device, if I have failed to think thee fair, tis blindness is my vice. And she answered him, I've proved thy wit and power of verse, that is at will diffuse and terse. Lest thou commence to lie, be dumb. I am content. The time will come. Then she said to the vizier Feshnavat, O my father, there is all in this youth the nephew of the barber that's desirable for the undertaking, and his feet will be on a level with the task we propose for him, he the height of a man above it. Tis clear that vanity will trip him, but honesty is a strong upholder, and he is one that hath the spirit of enterprise and the mask of dissimulation. Gratitude I observe in him, and it is as I thought when I came upon him on the sand-hill outside the city, that his star is clearly in a web with our star, he destined for the shaving of Shagpat. So the vizier replied, He hath had thwackings, yet he is not deterred from making further attempt on Shagpat. I think well of him, and I agur hopefully. Wallahi, the Kadi shall be sent for. I can sleep in his secrecy, and he shall perform the ceremonies of betrothal, even now and where we sit, and it shall be for him to write the terms of contract. So shall we bind the youth firmly to us, and he will be one of us as we are, devoted to the undertaking by three bonds, the bond of vengeance, the bond of ambition, and that of love. Now so it was that the vizier dispatched a summons for the attendance of the Kadi, and he came and performed between Shibli Bagarag and Nurna bin Nurka ceremonies of betrothal, and wrote terms of contract, and they were witnessed duly by the legal number of witnesses, and so worded that he had no claim on her as wife till such time as the event to which he bound himself was mastered. Then the fees being paid, and compliments interchanged, the vizier exclaimed, Be ye happy, and let the weak cling to the strong, and be ye two to one in this world, and no split halves that betray division and stick not together when the gum is heated. Then he made a sign to the Kadi, and them that had witnessed the contract to follow him, leaving the betrothed ones to their own company. So when they were alone, Nurna gazed on the youth wistfully, and said in a soft tone, Thou art dazed with the adventure, O youth. Surely there is one kiss owing me. Art thou willing? Am I reduced to beg it of thee? Or dreamest thou? He lifted his head and replied, Even so. 
Thereat he stood up languidly, and went to her and kissed her. And she smiled and said, I wot it will be otherwise, and thou wilt learn swiftness of limb, brightness of eye, and the longing for earthly beatitude, when next I ask thee, O my betrothed. Lo, while she spake, new light seemed in her, and it was as if a splendid jewel were struggling to cast its beams through the sides of a crystal vase, smeared with dust and old dirt, and spinnings of the damp spider. He was amazed, and cried, How's this? What change is passing in thee? She said, Joy in thy kiss, and that I have escaped Shagpat. Then he, Shagpat? How? Had that wretch claim over thee ere I came? But she looked fearfully at the corners of the room, and exclaimed, Hush, my betrothed, speak not of him in that fashion, tis dangerous, and my power cannot keep off his emissaries at all times. Then she said, O oh, my betrothed, know me a sorceress and sorcelled, not that I seem, but that I shall be. Wait thou for the time, and it will reward thee. What? Thou thinkest to have plucked a wrinkled or ripe fruit, a mouldy pomegranate under the branches, a sour tamarind? Tis well, I say not, save that time will come, and be thou content. It is truly, as I said, that I have thee between me and Shagpat, and that honoured one of our city thought fit in his presumption to demand me in marriage at the hands of my father, knowing me wise, and knowing the thing that transformed me to this, the abominable fellow. Surely my father entertained not his proposal, save with scorn. But the king looked favourably on it, and it is even now matter of reproach to Feshnavat, my father, that he withholdeth me from Shagpat. Quoth Shibli Bagarag, A clothier, O Nurna, control the vizier, and demand of him his daughter in marriage, and a clothier influence the king against his vizier. Tis, wullahi, a riddle. She replied, Tis even so, eyes of mine, my betrothed. But thou knowest not Shagpat, and that he is. Lo, the king, and all of the city, save we three, are held in enchantment by him, and made foolish by one hair that's in his head. Shibli Bagarag started in his seat, like one that shineth with a discovery, and cried, The identical! Then she, sighing, Tis that, indeed, but the identical of identicals, the chief and head of them, and I, woe's me, I, the planter of it. So he said, How so? But she cried, I'll tell thee not here, nor aught of myself in him, and the genie held in bondage by me, till thou art proved by adventure, and we float peacefully on the sea of the bright lily. There shalt thou see me as I am, and hear my story, and marvel at it, for it is wondrous, and a manifestation of the power that dwelleth unseen. So Shibli Bagrag pondered a while on the strange nature of the things she hinted, and laughter seized him as he reflected on Shagpat, and the whole city enchanted by one hair in his head. And he exclaimed, O Nurna, knoweth he, Shagpat, of the might in him? She answered, Enough for his vain soul that homage is paid to him, and he careth not for the wherefore. Shibli Bagarag fixed his eyes on the deep-flowered carpets of the floor, as if reading there a matter quaintly written, and smiled, saying, What boldness was mine, the making offer to sheer Shagpat, the lion in his lair, he that holdeth a whole city in enchantment. Wah, t'was an instance of daring. And Nurna said, Not only an entire city, but other cities affected by him, as witness Ulb, whither thou wilt go, and there be governments and states, and conditions of men remote that hang upon him, Shagpat. Tis even so I swell not his size. When thou hast mastered the event, and sent him forth shivering from thy blade like the shorn lamb, twill be known how great a thing has been achieved, and a record for the generations to come. Choice is that historian destined to record it. Quoth he, looking eagerly at her, O Nurna, what is it in thy speech affecteth me? Surely it infuseth the vigour of wine, old wine, and I shiver with desire to shave Shagpat, and spin threads for the historian to weave in order. I, Wallahi, had but dry visions of the greatness destined for me till now, my betrothed. Shall I master an event in shearing him, and be told of to future ages? By Allah and his prophet, praise be to that name, this is greatness. Say, Nurna, hadst thou foreknowledge of me and my coming to this city? So she said, I was on the roofs one night, among the stars ere moonrise, O my betrothed, and t'was close on the rise of this very month's moon. The star of our enemy Shagpat was large and red, mine as it were menaced by its proximity, 
nigh shallowed in its haughty beams and the steady overbearings of its effulgence. "'Twas so it has long been, when suddenly, lo, a star from the upper heaven that shot down between them wildly, and my star took luster from it, and the star of Shagpat trembled like a ring on a tightened rope, and waved and flickered, and seemed to come forward and to retire, and t'was presently as a comet in the sky, bright, a tadpole, with large head and lengthy tail, in the assembly of the planets. This I saw, and that the stranger's star was stationed by my star, shielding it, and that it drew nearer to my star and entered its circle, and that the two stars seemed mixing the splendor that was theirs. Now, that sight amazed me, and my heart in its beating quickened with the expectation of things approaching. Surely I rendered praise and pressed both hands on my bosom, and watched, and behold, the comet, the illumined tadpole, was becoming restless beneath the joint rays of the twain that were dominating him, and he diminished, and lashed his tail uneasily, half madly, darting as do captured beasts from the fetters that constrain them. Then went there from thy star, for I now know t'was thine a momentary flash across the head of the tadpole, and again another and another rapidly, pertinaciously. And from thy star there passed repeated flashes across the head of the tadpole, till his brilliance were as t'were severed from him, and he, like drossy silver, a dead shape in the conspicuous heavens. And he became yellow as the rolling eyes of sick wretches in pain, and shrank in his place like pale parchment at the touch of flame. Dull was he as an animal fascinated by fear, and deprived of all power to make head against the foe. Darkness that now beset him, and usurped part of his yet lively tail, and settled on his head, and coated part of his body. So when this tadpole, that was once terrible to me, became turbaned, shoed, and shawled with darkness, and there was little of him remaining visible, lo, a concluding flash shot from thy star, and he fell heavily down the sky and below the hills, into the sea, that is, the enchanted sea, whose queen is Rabeskorat, mistress of illusions. Now when my soul recovered from amazement at the marvel scene, I arose and went from the starry roofs to consult my books of magic, and t'was revealed to me that one was wandering to a junction with my destiny, and that by his means the great aim would of a surety be accomplished, Shagpat shaved. So my purpose was to discover him, and I made calculations, and summoned them that served me to search for such a youth as thou art. Fairly, O my betrothed, did I preconceive thee." and so it was that I traced a magic line from the sand-hills to the city, and from the outer hills to the sand-hills, and whoso approached by that line I knew was he marked out as my champion, my betrothed, a youth destined for great things. Was I right? The egg hatcheth. Thou art already proved by thwackings, seasoned to the undertaking, and I doubt not thou art he that will finish with that tadpole shagpat, and sit in the high seat, thy name and odour in distant lands, a joy to the historian, the compiler of events, thou master of the event, the greatest which time will witness for ages to come. When she had spoken, Shibli Bagarag considered her words, and the knowledge that he was selected by destiny as master of the event inflated him, and he was a hawk in eagerness, a peacock in pride, an ostrich in fullness of chest, crying, O Nurna bin Nurka, is it really so? Truly it must be, for the readers of planets were also busy with me at the time of my birth, interpreting of me in excessive agitation, and the thing they foretold is as thou foretellest. I am, wallahi, marked. I walk manifest in the eye of providence. Thereupon he exulted, and his mind strutted through the future of his days, and down the ladder of all time, exacting homage from men, his brethren, and t'was beyond the art of Nurna to fix him to the present duties of the enterprise. He was as feathered seed before the breath of vanity. Now, while the twain discoursed, she of the preparations for shaving Shagpat, he of his completion of the deed, and the honours due to him as master of the event, Feshnavat the vizier returned to them, from his entertainment of the Kadi, and he bribed them to silence with a mighty bribe. So he called to them, Ho! Be ye ready to commence the work? And have ye advised together as to the beginning? True is that triplet. Whatever enterprise man hath, for waking love or curbing wrath, tis the first step that makes a path. And how have ye determined as to that first step? Nurna replied, O oh, my father, we have not decided, and there hath been yet no deliberation between us as to that. Then he said, All this while have ye talked, and no deliberation as to that. Lo, I have drawn the Kadi to our plot, and bribed him with a mighty bribe, and I have prepared possible disguises for this nephew of the barber, 
and I have had the witnesses of thy betrothal dispatched to foreign parts, far kingdoms in the land of Rome, to prevent tattling and gabbling, and ye that were left alone for debating as to the great deed, ye have not yet deliberated as to that. Is it known to ye, O gabblers, aught of the punishment inflicted by Shapesh, the Persian, on Kippil the builder? A punishment that, by Allah! Shibli Bagarag said, How of that punishment, O vizier? And the vizier narrated as followeth. End of chapter 3 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 8 of The Shaving of Shakbat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn. The Shaving of Shakbat by George Meredith. Chapter 4. And this is the punishment of Shapesh, the Persian, on Kipil the Builder. They relate that Shapesh, the Persian, commanded the building of a palace, and Kipil was his builder. The work lingered from the first year of the reign of Shapesh, even to his fourth. One day, Shapesh went to the riverside where it stood to inspect it. Kipil was sitting on a marble slab among the stones and blocks. Round him stretched lazily the masons and stone cutters and slaves of burden, and they, with the curve of humorous enjoyment on their lips, for he was reciting to them adventures, interspersed with anecdotes and recitations and poetic instances, as was his wont. They were like pleased flocks whom the shepherd had led to a pasture freshened with brooks, there to feed indolently, he the shepherd in the midst. Now the king said to him, O Kapil, show me my palace where it standeth, for I desire to gratify my sight with its fairness. Kipil abased himself before Shapesh and answered, "'Tis even here, O king of the age, where thou delightest the earth with thy foot and the ear of thy slave with sweetness. Surely a sight of vantage, one that dominated earth, air, and water, which is the builder's first and chief requisition for a noble palace, a palace to fill foreign kings and sultans with the distractions of envy. And it is, O sovereign of the time, a sight, this sight I have chosen to occupy the tongues of travellers and awaken the flights of poets. Shapesh smiled and said, The sight is good. I laud the sight. Likewise, I laud the wisdom of Ebn Busrak, where he exclaims, Be sure, where virtue faileth to appear, for her a gorgeous mansion men will rear, and day and night her praises will be heard, where never yet she spake a single word. Then said he, O Kipil, my builder, there was once a farm servant that, having neglected in the seed time to sow, took to singing the richness of the soil when it was harvest, in proof of which he displayed the abundance of weeds that coloured the land everywhere. Discover to me now the completeness of my halls and apartments, I pray thee, O Kipil, and be the excellence of thy construction made visible to me. Quoth Kipil, to hear is to obey. He conducted Sharpesh among the unfinished saloons and imperfect courts and roofless rooms, and by half-erected obliques and columns pierced and chipped of the palace of his building. And he was bewildered at the words spoken by Sharpesh. But now the king exalted him and admired the perfection of his craft, the greatness of his labour, the speediness of his construction, his assiduity feigning not to behold his negligence. Presently they went up winding balusters to a marble terrace, and the king said, Such is thy devotion and constancy in toil, Kipil, that thou shalt walk before me here. He then commanded Kipil to precede him, and Kipil was heightened with the honour. When Kipil had paraded a short space, he stopped quickly and said to Shapish, here is, as it chanceth, a gap, O king, and we can go no further this way. Sharpish said, All is perfect, and it is my will thou delay not to advance. Kipil cried, The gap is wide, O mighty king, and manifest, and it is an incomplete part of thy palace. Then said Sharpish, 
O oh, Kepil, I see no distinction between one part and another. Excellent are all parts in beauty and proportion, and there can be no part incomplete in this palace that occupied the builder four years in its building. So advance, do my bidding. Kipil yet hesitated, for the gap was of many strides, and at the bottom of the gap was a deep water, and he, one that knew not the motion of swimming. But Sharpish ordered his guard to point their arrows in the direction of Kipil, and Kipil stepped forward hurriedly and fell in the gap and was swallowed by the water below. When he rose the second time, succor reached him, and he was drawn to land, trembling, his teeth chattering. And Sharpesh praised him and said, This is an apt contrivance for a bath, Kepil, O my builder, well conceived, one that take it by surprise, and it shall be thy reward daily, when much talking hath fatigued thee. Then he bade Kepil lead him to the hall of state. And when they were there, Sharpesh said, For a privilege, and as a mark of my approbation, I give thee permission to sit in the marble chair of yonder throne, even in my presence, O Kipil. Kipil said, Surely, O king, the chair is not yet executed. And Sharpesh exclaimed, If this be so, thou art but the length of thy measure on the ground, O talkative one. Kipil said, Nay, tis not so, O king of splendors. Blind that I am, yonder is indeed the chair. And Kepil feared the king, and went to the place where the chair should be, and bent his body in a sitting posture, eyeing the king, and made pretense to sit in the chair of Sharpesh, as in conspiracy to amuse his master. Then said Sharpesh, For a token that I approve thy execution of the chair, thou shalt be honoured by remaining seated in it up to the hour of noon. But move thou to the right or to the left, showing thy soul insensible of the honour done thee, transfixed thou shalt be with twenty arrows and five. The king then left him with a guard of twenty-five of his bodyguard, and they stood around him with bent bows, so that Kepil dared not move from his sitting posture. And the masons and the people crowded to see Kepil sitting on his master's chair, for it became rumoured about. When they beheld him sitting upon nothing, and he trembling to stir for fear of the loosening of the arrows, they laughed so that they rolled upon the floor of the hall, and the echoes of laughter were a thousandfold. Surely the arrows of the guards swayed with the laughter that shook them. Now, when the time had expired for his sitting in the chair, Sharpesh returned to him, and he was cramped, pitiable to see, and Sharpesh said, Thou hast been exalted above men, O Kipil, for that thou didst execute for thy master has been found fitting for thee. Then he bade Kipil lead the way to the noble gardens of dalliance and pleasure that he had planted and contrived. And Kipil went in that state described by the poet where we go draggingly with remonstrating members, knowing a dreadful strength behind and a dark fate before. They came to the gardens, and behold, these were full of weeds and nettles, the fountains dry, no tree to be seen, a desert, and Sharpesh cried, This is indeed of admirable design, O Kipil. Feelst thou not the coolness of the fountains, their refreshingness? Truly I am grateful to thee. And these flowers, pluck me now a handful, and tell me of their perfume. Kipil plucked a handful of the nettles that were there in place of flowers, and put his nose to them before Sharpish, till his nose was reddened, and desire to rub it waxed in him, and possessed him, and became a passion, so that he could scarce refrain from rubbing it, even in the king's presence. And the king encouraged him to sniff and enjoy their fragrance, repeating the poet's words. Methinks I am a lover and a child, a little child and happy lover both, when, by the breath of flowers, I am beguiled, from sense of pain and lulled in odorous sloth. So I adore them, that no mistress sweet seems worthier of the love which they awake. In innocence and beauty more complete was never maiden cheek in morning lake. Oh, while I live, surround me with flowers. Oh, when I die, then bury me in their bowers. And the king said, What sayest thou, O my builder? 
That is a fair quotation applicable to thy feelings, one that expresseth them? Kipil answered, "'Tis eloquent, O great king. Comprehensiveness would be its portion, but that it alludeth not to the delight of chafing. Then Shapish laughed and cried, Chafe not, it is an ill thing and a hideous. This knows gay O Kipil, it is for thee to present to thy mistress. Truly, she will receive thee well after its presentation. I will have it now sent in thy name, with word that thou followest quickly. And for thy nettled nose, surely, if the whim sees thee, that thou desirest is chafing, to thy neighbour is permitted what to thy hand is refused. The king set a guard upon Kipil to see that his orders were executed, and appointed a time for him to return to the gardens. At the hour indicated, Kipil stood before Sharpesh again. He was pale, saddened. His tongue drooped like the tongue of a heavy bell, that when it soundeth, giveth forth mournful sounds only. He had also the look of one battered with many beatings. So the king said, How of the presentation of the flowers of thy culture, O Kipil? He answered, Surely, O king, she received me with wrath, and I am shamed by her. And the king said, How of my clemency in the matter of the chafing? Kipil answered, O king of splendours, I made petition to my neighbours whom I met, accosting them civilly and with imploring, for I ached to chafe, and it was the very raging thirst of desire to chafe that was mine, devouring eagerness for solace of chafing, and they chafed me, O king, yet not in those parts which throbbed for the chafing, but in those which abhorred it. Then Sharpish smiled and said, "'Tis certain that the magnanimity of monarchs is as the rain that falleth, the sun that shineth, and in this spot it fertilizeth richness, in that encourageth rankness. So thou art but a weed, O Kipil, and my grace is thy chastment. Now the king ceased not persecuting Kipil under pretense of doing him honour and heaping favours upon him. Three days and three nights was Kipil gasping without water, compelled to drink of the drought of the fountain as an honour at the hands of the king. And he was seven days and seven nights made to stand with stretched arms as they were the branches of a tree, in each hand a pomegranate. And Shapesh brought the people of his court to regard the wondrous pomegranate shoot planted by Kipil, very wondrous, and a new sort, worthy the gardens of a king. So the wisdom of the king was applauded, and men wotted he knew how to punish offences in coin, by the punishment inflicted on Kipil the builder. Before that time his affairs had languished, and the currents of business, instead of flowing, had become stagnant pools. It was the fashion to do as did Kipil, and fancy the tongue a constructor rather than a commentator and there is a doom upon that people and that man which runneth to seed and gabble. As the poet says in his wisdom, If thou wouldst be famous and rich in splendid fruits, leave to bloom the flower of things, and dig among the roots. Truly, after Kipil's punishment, there were few in the dominions of Sharpesh who sought to win the honours bestowed by him on gabblers and idlers, as again the poet when to loquacious fools with patience rare, I listen, I have thoughts of Kipil's chair, his bath, his nosegay, and his fount I see, himself stretched out as a pomegranate tree, and that I am not sharpish I regret, so to enmesh the babbler in his net. Well is that wisdom worthy to be sung, which raised the palace of the wagging tongue. And whoso is punished after the fashion of Sharpesh the Persian on Kipil the builder, is said to be one in the palace of the wagging tongue to this time. End of chapter 4 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 9 of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gabriel Glenn The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith Chapter 5 The Genie Karaz Now, when the voice of the wazir had ceased, Shibli Bagarag exclaimed, O wazir, this night, no later, I'll surprise Shagpat and shave him while he sleepeth, and he shall wake shone beside his spouse. 
Willa he. I'll delay no longer, I, Shibli Bagarag, said the wazir. Thou? And he replied, Surely, O wazir, thou knowest little of my dexterity. So the wazir laughed, and Noorna bin Noorka laughed, and he was at a loss to interpret the cause of their laughter. Then said Noorna, O oh, my betrothed, there is not a doubt among us of thy dexterity, nor question of thy willingness, but this shaving of Shagpat, Wullahi, tis longer work than what you makest of it. And he cried, How? Because the chief of identicals planted by thee in his head? She answered, Because of that, but tis the smallest opposer that. Then the wazir said, Let us consult. So Shipli Bagarag gave ear, and the wazir continued, There's first the chief of identicals planted by thee in the head of that presumptuous fellow, O my daughter. By what means shall that be overcome? She said, I rank not that first, O Feshnavat, my father. Surely I rank first the illusions with which Rabesquarath hath surrounded him, and made it difficult to know him from his semblances whenever real danger threateneth him. The wazir assented, saying, Second, then, the chief of identicals? She answered, Nay, O father, second, the weakness that's in man, and the little probability of his finishing with Shagpat at one effort, and there is but a sole chance for whoso attempteth, and if he faileth, tis forever he faileth. So the wazir said, Even I knew not twas so grave. Third, then, the chief of identicals? She replied, Third, which showeth the difficulty of the task. Read ye not first how the barber must come upon Shagpat and fix him for his operation. Second, how the barber must be possessed of more than mortal strength to master him in so many strokes. Third, how the barber must have a blade like no other blade in this world in sharpness, in temper, in velocity of sweep, that he may reap this crop which flourisheth on Shagpat, and with it the magic hair which defieth edge of mortal blades? Now the wazir sighed at the words, saying, Powerful is Shagpat. I knew not the thing I undertook. I fear his mastery of us, and we shall be contemned. Objects for the red finger of scorn. Noorna turned to Shibli Bagarag and asked, Do the three bonds of enterprise, vengeance, ambition, and love shrink in thee from this great contest? Shibli Bagarag said, "'Tis terrible. On my head be it.' She gazed at him a moment tenderly, and said, "'Thou art worthy of what is in store for thee, O my betrothed, and I think little of the dangers in contemplation of the courage in thee. Lo, if vengeance and ambition spur thee so, how will not love when added to the two? Then said she, as to the enchantments and spells that shall overreach him, and as to the blade wherewith to share him? Feshnavath exclaimed, Yonder's indeed where we stumble and are tripped at starting. But she cried, What if I know of a sword that not on earth or under resisteth, and before the keen edge of which all illusions and identicals are as summer grass to the sight? They both shouted, The whereabouts of that sword, O Noorna? So she said, "'Tis in Aklis, in the mountains of the Kush, and the seven sons of Aklis sharpen it day and night, till the adventurer cometh to claim it for his occasion. Whoso succeedeth in coming to them, they know to have power over the sword, and tis then holiday for them. Many are the impediments, and they are as holes where the fox haunteth. So they deliver to his hand the sword, Till his object is attained, his event mastered, smitten through with it, and tis called the sword of events. Surely with it the father of the seven vanquished the mighty rock, Krugis, that threatened mankind with ruin, and a stain of the rock's blood is yet on the hilt of the sword. How sayest thou, O Feshnavat, shall we devote ourselves to get possession of that sword? So the wazir brightened at her words and said, O oh, excellent in wisdom and star of counsel, speak further and as to the means. Nurna bin Nurka continued, Thou knowest, O oh my father, I am proficient in the arts of magic, and I am what I am. 
and what I shall be by its uses. Tis known to thee also that I hold a genie in bondage, and can utter ten spells and one spell in a breath. Surely my services to the youth in his attainment of the sword will be beyond price. Now to reach Aklis and the sword, there are three things needed, charms, and one is a phial full of the waters of Paraweed from the wells in the mountain yon side the desert, and one, certain hairs that grow in the tail of the horse Garavine, he that roameth wild in the meadows of Melistan, and one, that the youth gather and bear to Aklis for the white antelope Gulravaz, the lily of the lovely light that groweth in the hollow of the crags over the enchanted sea. With these spells he will command the sword of Aklis, and nothing can bar him passage. Moreover, I will expend in his aid all my subtleties, my transformations, the stores of my wisdom. Many seek this sword, and people, the realms of Rabeskorath, or are beasts in Aklis, or crowned apes, or go to feed the rock Krugis in the abyss beneath the rock's egg bridge. But there's virtue in Shibli Bagarag, Wullahi. I am wistful in him of the hands of destiny, and he will succeed in this undertaking if he dareth it. Shibli Bagarag cried, At thy bidding, O Noorna, care I for dangers? I am on fire to wield the sword and master the event. Thereupon Noorna bin Noorka arose instantly, and took him by the cheeks a tender pinch and praised him. Then she drew round him a circle with her forefinger, that left a mark like the shimmering of a vanescent green flame, saying, White was the day I set eyes on thee. Round the wazir, her father, she drew a like circle, and she took an unguent and traced with it characters on the two circles, and letters of strange form, arrowy, lance-like, like leaning sheaves, and crouching baboons, and kicking jackasses, and cocks a crow, and lutes slack-strung, and she knelt and mumbled over and over words of magic, like the drone of a bee to hear, and as a roll of water, nothing distinguishable. After that she sought for an unguent of a red colour, and smeared it on a part of the floor by the corner of the room, and wrote on it in silver fluid a word that was the word a bliss, and over that likewise she droned a while. Presently she arose with a white, heated face, the sweat on her brow, and said to Shibli Bagarag and Feshnavath hurriedly and in a harsh tone, How? Have ye fear? They answered, Our faith is in Allah, our confidence in thee. Said she then, I summon the genie I hold in bondage. He will be wrathful, but ye are secure from him. He is this moment in the farthest region of earth, doing ill as is his wont and the wont of the stock of a bliss. So the wazir said, He'll be no true helper, this genie, and I care not for his company. She answered, O my father, leave thou that to me. What says the poet? It is the sapiency of fools to shrink from handling evil tools. Now, while she was speaking, she suddenly inclined her head as to a distant noise, but they heard nothing. Then, after again listening, she cried in a sharp voice, Ho! Muffle your mouths with both hands and stir not from the ring of the circles as ye value life and its blessings. So they did as she bade them, and watched her curiously. Lo! She swathed the upper and lower part of her face in linen, leaving the lips and eyes exposed, and she took water from an ewer and sprinkled it on her head and on her arms and her feet, murmuring incantations. Then she listened a third time, and stooped to the floor and put her lips on it, and called the name Karaz. And she called this name seven times loudly, sneezing between whiles. Then, as it were in answer to her summons, there was a deep growl of thunder, and the palace rocked, tottering, and the air became smoky and full of curling vapours. Presently, they were aware of the cry of a cat and its meowlings, and the patch of red unguent on the floor parted, and they beheld a tawny cat with an arced back. So Noorna bin Noorka frowned fiercely at the cat and cried, 
This is thy shape, O Karaz. Change, for it serves not the purpose. The cat changed, and was a leopard with glowing yellow eyes, crouched for the spring. So Noorna bin Noorka stamped and cried again, This is thy shape, O Karaz. Change, for it serves not the purpose. And the leopard changed, and was a serpent with many folds, sleek, curled, venomous, hissing. Noorna bin Noorka cried in wrath, This is thy shape, O Karaz. Change, or thou'lt be no other till Iblis is accepted in paradise. And the serpent vanished. Lo, in its place, a genie of terrible aspect, black as a solitary tree, seared by lightning, his forehead ridged and cloven with red streaks, his hair and ears reddened, his eyes like two hollow pits dug by the shepherd for the wolf and the wolf in them. He shouted, What work is it now, thou accursed traitress? Noorna replied, I have need of thee, he said. What shape? she answered. The shape of an ass that'll carry two on its back, thou perversity. Upon that he cried, O faithless woman, how long shall I be the slave of thy plotting? Now, but for that hair of my head, plucked by thy hand while I slept, I were free, no doer of thy tasks. Say, who be these that mark us? She answered, One, the Wazir Feshnavat, and one, Shibli Bagarag of Shiraz, he that's destined to shave Shagpat, the son of Shimpur, the son of Shulpi, the son of Shulum, and the youth is my betrothed. Now at her words, the whole genie became as live coal with anger, and he panted black and bright and made a stride towards Shibli Bagarag, and stretched his arm out to seize him. But Noorna blew quickly on the circles she had drawn, and the circles rose up in a white flame high as the heads of those present, and the genie shrank hastily back from the flame and was seized with fits of sneezing. Then she said in scorn, Easily your Karaz is a woman outwitted. Surely I could not guess what would be thy action. And I was wanting in foresight and insight, and I am a woman bearing the weight of my power as a woodman staggereth under the logs he hath felled. So she taunted him, and he, still sneezing and bent double with the might of the sneeze. Then said Noorna in a stern voice, No more altercation between us. Wait thou here till I reappear, Karaz. Thereupon she went from them, and the two, Feshnavat and Shibli Bagarag, feared greatly being left with the genie, for he became all colours, and lowed on them each time that he ceased sneezing. He was clearly menacing them when Noorna returned, and in her hand a saddle made of hide, traced over with mystic characters and gold stripes. So she cried, Take this. Then seeing he hesitated, she unclosed from a left palm a powder and scattered it over him, and he grew meek, and the bending knee of obedience was his, and he took the saddle. So she said, Tis well. Go now, and wait outside the city in the shape of an ass, with this saddle on thy back. The genie groaned, and said, To hear is to obey. And he departed with those words, for she held him in bondage. Then she calmed down the white flames of the circles that enclosed Shibdi Bagarag and the Wazir Feshnavat, and they stepped forth, marvelling at the greatness of her sorceries that held such a genie in bondage. End of chapter 5 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 10 of The Shaving of Shakpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gabriel Glenn the Shaving of Shakpat by George Meredith Chapter 6 The Well of Paravid Now there was haste in the movements of Noorna bin Noorka, and she arrayed herself and clutched Shibli Bagarag by the arm, and the twain departed from Feshnavat the wazir, and came to the outside of the city. And lo, there was the genie by a well under a palm, and he, standing in the shape of an ass, saddled. So they mounted him, and in a moment they were in the midst of the desert, and not around them save the hot glimmer of the sands and the grey of the sky. Surely 
the ass went at such a pace as never ass went before in this world, resting not by the rivulets, nor under the palms, nor beside the date boughs. It was as if the ass scurried without motion of his legs, so swiftly went he. At last the desert gave signs of a border on the low line of the distance, and this grew rapidly higher as they advanced, revealing a country of hills and rocks, and at the base of these the ass rested. So Nudna said, This desert that we have passed, O my betrothed, many are they that perish in it, and reach not the well, but give thanks to Allah that it is past. Then said she, Dismount, and be wary of moving to the front or to the rear of this ass, and measure thy distance from the lash of his tail. So Shibli Bagarak dismounted, and followed her up the hills and the rocks, through ravines and gorges of the rocks, and by tumbling torrents, among hanging woods, over perilous precipices, where no sun hath pierced, and the bones of travellers whiten in loneliness. And they continued mounting upward by winding paths, now closed in by coverts, now upon open heights having great views, and presently a mountain was disclosed to them, green at the sides high up it. And Noorna bin Noorka said to Shibli Bagarag, Mount here, for the cunning of this ass can furnish him no excuse further for making thee food for the birds of prey. So Shibli Bagarag mounted, and they ceased not to ascend the green slopes till the grass became scanty and darkness fell, and they were in a region of snow and cold. Then Noorna bin Noorka tethered the ass to a stump of a tree and breathed in his ear, and the ass became as a creature carved in stone. And she drew from her bosom two bags of silk, and blew in one and entered it, bidding Shibli Bagarag do likewise with the other bag. And he obeyed her, drawing it up to his neck, and the delightfulness of warmth came over him. Then said she, Tomorrow, at noon, we shall reach near the summit of the mountain and the well of Paravid, if my power last over this ass and from that time thou wilt be on the high road to greatness. So fail not to remember what I have done for thee, and be not guilty of ingratitude, when thy hand is the stronger. He promised her, and they lay and slept. When he awoke, the sun was half risen, and he looked at Noona bin Nurka in the silken bag, and she was yet in the peacefulness of pleasant dreams. But for the ass, surely his eyes rolled, and his head and four legs were endued with life, while his latter half seemed of stone. And the youth called to Noorna bin Nurka, and pointed to her the strangeness of the condition of the ass. As she cast eyes on him, she cried out and rushed to him, and took him by the ears and blew up his nostrils, and the animal was quiet. Then she and Shibli Bagarag mounted him again, and she said to him, It is well thou wert more vigilant than I, and that the sun rose not on this ass while I slept, or my enchantment would have thawed on him, and he would have escaped us. She gave her heel to the ass, and the ass hung his tail in sullenness and drooped his head, and she laughed, crying, Karaz, silly fellow, do thy work willingly, and take wisely thine outwitting. She jeered him as they journeyed, and made the soul of Shibli Bagarag merry, so that he jerked in his seat upon the ass. Now, as they ascended the mountain, they came to the opening of a cavern, and Noorna bin Noorka halted the ass, and said to Shibli Bagarag, We part here, and I wait for thee in this place. Take this phial, and fill it with the waters of the well, after thy bath. The way is before thee. Speed on it. He climbed the sides of the mountain, and was soon hidden in the clefts and beyond the perches of the vulture. She kept her eyes on the rocky point when he disappeared, awaiting his return. And the sun went over her head and sank on the yon side of the mountain, and it was by the beams of the moon that she beheld Shibli Bagarag dropping from the crags and ledges of rock, sliding and steadying himself downward, till he reached her with the phial in his hand, filled, and he was radiant, as it were divine with freshness, so that Noorna, before she spoke welcome to him, was lost in contemplating the warm shine of his visage, calling to mind the poet's words. 
the wealth of light and sun and moon, all nature's wealth, hath mortal beauty for a boon when matched with health. Then said she, O Shibli Bagarag, tis achieved this first of thy tasks, for mutely on the fresh red of thy mouth, my betrothed, speaketh the honey of persuasiveness, and the children of Aklis will not resist thee. So she took the file from him and led forth the ass, and the twain mounted the ass and descended the slopes of the mountain in moonlight. And Shibli Bagarag said, Lo, I have marked wonders and lived a life since a parting, and this well, tis a miracle to dip in it, and by it sit many maidens weeping and old men babbling, and youth that were idle youths striking bubbles from the surface of the water. The well is rounded with marble, and the sky is clear in it, cool in it, the whole earth imaged therein. Then Nuna said, Hadst thou a difficulty in obtaining the waters of the well? He answered, Surely all was made smooth for me by thy aid. Now when I came to the well, I marked not them by it, but plunged, and the depth of that well seemed to me the very depth of the earth itself. So went I ever downward, and when I was near the bottom of the well, I had forgotten life above. And lo, no sooner had I touched the bottom of the well when my head emerged from the surface. It was wondrous. But for a sign that touched the bottom of the well, see, O Nuna bin Nurka, the jewel, the one of the myriads that glitter at the bottom, and I plucked it for a gift to thee. So Noorna took the jewel from his hand that was torn and crimson, and she cried, Thou fair youth, thou bleedst with the plucking of it, and it was written, No hand shall pluck a jewel at the bottom of that well without letting of blood. Even so it is. Worthy art thou, and I was not mistaken in thee. At her words, Shibli Bagarag burst forth into praises of her, and he sang, What is my worthiness matched with thy worth? Darkness and earthiness, dust and dearth. O Noorna, thou art wise above women, great and glorious over them. In this fashion, the youth lauded her that was his betrothed, but she exclaimed, Hush, or the jealousy of this ass will be aroused, and of a surety he'll spill us. Then he laughed, and she laughed till the tail of Karaz trembled. End of chapter 6 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 11 of The Shaving of Shakpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn The Shaving of Shakpat by George Meredith Chapter 7 The Horse Garavin now they descended leisurely the slopes of the mountain, and when they were again in the green of its base, Noorna called to the ass, Ho, Karaz, sniff now the breezes, for the end of our journey by night is the meadows of Melistan. Forward in thy might, and bray not when we are in them, for thy comfort's sake. The ass sniffed turning to the four quarters, and chose a certain direction, and bore them swiftly over hills and streams, eddying in silver, over huge mounds of sands where the tents of Bedouins stood in white clusters, over lakes smooth as the cheeks of sleeping loveliness, by walls of cities, mosques and palaces, under towers that rose as an armed man with the steel on his brows and the frown of battle. By the shores of the pale foaming sea it bore them, going at a pace that the Arab on his steel outstrippeth not. So when the sun was red and the dews were blushing with new light, they struggled from a wilderness of barren broken ground and saw beneath them, in the warm beams, green, peaceful, deep, the meadows of Melistan. They were meadows dancing with flowers, as it had been fresh damsels of the mountain, fair with variety of colours that were so many gleams of changing light as the breezes of the morn swept over them, lavish of hues, of sweetness, of pleasantness, fur for the souls of the blessed. Then after they had gazed a while, 
Noorna bin Noorka said, In these meadows the horse Garavin roameth at will. Heroes of bliss bestride him on great days. He is black to look on. Speed quivers in his flanks like the lightning. His nostrils are wide with flame. There is that in his eye which is settled fire, and that in his hoofs which is ready thunder. When he paws the earth, kingdoms quake. No animal liveth with blood like the horse Garavin. He is under a curse, for that he bore on his back one who defied the prophet. Now to make him come to thee thou must blow the call of battle, and to catch him thou must contrive to strike him on the fetlock as he runs with this musk-ball which I give thee, and to tame him thou must trace between his eyes a figure or the crescent with thy fore-nail. When that is done, bring him to me here where I await thee, and I will advise thee further. So she said, Go, and Shibli Bagarag showed her the breadth of his shoulders, and stepping briskly towards the meadows, was soon brushing among the flowers and soft mosses of the meadows, lifting his nostrils to the joyful smells, looking about him with the broad eye of one that hungereth for a coming thing. The birds went above him, and the trees shook and sparkled, and the waters of the brooks and broad rivers flashed like waving mirrors, waved by the slave girls in sport when the beauties of the harem riot and dip their gleaming shoulders in the bath. He wandered on, lost in the gladness that lived, till the loud neigh of a steed startled him, and by the banks of a river before him he beheld the horse Garavin, stooping to drink of the river. Glorious was the look of the creature, silver-hoofed, fashioned in the curves of beauty and swiftness. So Shibli Bagarag put up his two hands and blew the call of battle, and the horse Garavin arced his neck at the call, and swung upon his haunches and sought the call, answering it, and tossing his mane as he advanced swiftly. Then as he neared, Shibli Bagarag held the musk-ball in his fingers, and aimed at the fetlock of the horse Garavin, and flung it, and struck him so that he stumbled and fell. He snorted fiercely as he bent to the grass, but Shibli Bagarag ran to him, and grasped strongly the tuft of hair hanging forward between his ears, and traced between his eyes a figure of the crescent with his forenail, and the horse ceased plunging, and was gentle as a colt by its mother's side, and suffered Shibli Bagarag to bestride him, and spurn him with his heel to speed, and bore him fleetly across the fair length of the golden meadow to where Nuna Binurka sat awaiting him. She uttered a cry of welcome, saying, This is achieved with diligence and skill, O my betrothed, and on thy right wrist I mark strength like a sleeping leopard, and the children of Aklis will not resist thee. So she bade him alight from the horse, but he said, Nay. And she called to him again to alight, but he cried, I will not alight from him, by Allah. Such a bounding wave of bliss have I never yet had beneath me, and I will give him rain once again, as the poet says. Divinely rings the rushing air when I am on my mettled mare, when fast along the plains we fly, a creature of the heavens am I. Then she levelled her brows at him and said gravely, This is the temptation thou art falling into, as have thousands before thy time. Give him the rein a second time, and he will bear thee to the red pit, and halt upon the brink, and pitch thee into it, among bleeding masses and skeletons of thy kind, where they lie who were men like to thee, and were borne away by the horse Garavin. He gave no heed to her words, taunting her, and making the animal prance up and prove its spirit. And she cried reproachfully, O fool, it is thus a great aim will be defeated by thy silly conceit? Lo, now, the greatness and the happiness thou art losing for this idle vanity is to be as a dunghill cock matched with an ostrich, and think not to escape the calamities thou bringest on thyself, for, as is said, no runner can outstrip his fate, and it will overtake thee, though thou part like an arrow from the bow. He still made a jest of her remonstrance, trying the temper of the animal and rejoicing in its dark flushes of ireful vigour. And she cried out furiously, How? Art thou past counsel? Then we will match strength with strength, ere it is too late, though it weaken both. Upon that, she turned quickly to the ass, and stroked it from one extremity to the other, crying, Coraz! Coraz! shouting, 
come forth in thy power. And the ass vanished, and the genie stood in his place, tall, dark, terrible as a pillar of storm to travellers ranging the desert. He exclaimed, What is it, O woman? Charge me with thy command. And she said, Wrestle with him thou seest on the horse Garavine, and fling him from his seat. Then he yelled a glad yell, and stooped to Shibli Bagarag on the horse, and enveloped him, and seized him, and plucked him from the horse, and whirled him round, and flung him off. The youth went circling in the air, high in it, and descended, circling, at a distance in the deep meadow waters. When he crept up the bank, he saw the genie astride the horse Garavine, with a black flame around his head and the genie urged him to speed and put him to the gallop and was soon lost to sight, as he had been a thunderbeam passing over a still lake at midnight. And Shibli Bagarag was smitten with the wrong and the folly of his act, and sought to hide his sight from Noorna. But she called to him, Look up, O youth, and face the calamity. Lo, we have now lost the service of Karaz, for though I utter ten spells and one spell in a breath, the horse Garavine will ere that have stretched beyond the circle of my magic, and the genie will be free to do his ill deeds and plot against us. Sad it is, but profit thou by a knowledge of thy weakness. Then said she, See, I have not failed to possess myself of the three hairs of Garavine, and there is that to rejoice in. She displayed them, and they were sapphire hairs, and had a flickering light, and they seemed to live, wriggling their lengths, and were as snakes with sapphire skins. Then she said, Thy right wrist, O my betrothed. He gave her his right wrist, and she tied round it the three hairs of Caravine, exclaiming, Thus do skilful carpenters make stronger what has broken an indicated disaster. Surely I confide in thy star. I have faith in my foresight. And she cried, Eyes of mine, what sayest thou to me? Lo, we must part a while, it is written, said he. Leave me not, my betrothed, what am I without counsel? And go not from me, or this adventure will come to miserable issue. So she said, Thou beginnest to feel my worth? He answered, O Noorna, was woman like thee before in this world? Surely tis a mask I mark thee under, yet art thou perforce of sheer wisdom and sweet manners lovely in my sight, and I have a thirst to hear thee and look on thee. While he spake, a beam of struggling splendour burst from her, and she said, O oh dear youth, yes, I must even go, but I go glad of heart, knowing thee prepared to love me. I must go to counteract the machinations of Karaz, for he is at once busy, vindictive, and cunning, and there is no time for us to lose. So farewell, my betrothed, and make thy wits keen to know me when we next meet. So he said, And I... Whither go I? She answered, To the city of Ulb, straight away. Then he, But I know not its bearing from the spot. How reach it? She answered, What? Thou with the phial of Paraweed in thy west, that endoweth a single drop of it, the flowers, the herbage, the very stones and desert sands, with a tongue to articulate intelligible talk? Said he, Is it so? She answered, Even so. Ere Shibli Bagarag could question her further, she embraced him, and blew upon his eyes, and he was blinded by her breath, and saw not her departure, groping for a seat on the rocks, and thinking her still by him. Scythe returned not to him, till long after weariness had brought the balm of sleep upon his eyelids. End of chapter 7 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 12 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 8 The Talking Hawk. Now, when he awoke, he found himself alone in that place, the moon shining over the low meadows and flower cups fair with night dew. Odors of night flowers were abroad filling the cool air with deliciousness, and he heard in the gardens below songs of the bulbul. It was like a dream to his soul, and he lay some while contemplating the rich loveliness of the scene that showed no moving thing. 
Then rose he, and bethought him of the words of Nura, and of the city of Ub, and the phial of the waters of Paravin in his best. And he drew it forth, and dropped a drop of it on the rock where he had reclined. A deep harmony seemed suddenly to awake inside the rock, and to his interrogation as to the direction of Ulb, he heard, The path of the shadows of the moon. Thereupon he advanced to a prominent part of the rocks above the meadows, and beheld the shadows of the moon thrown forward into dimness across a waste of sand, and he stepped downward to the level of sand, and went the way of the shadows till it was dawn. Then dropped he a drop of the waters of the phial on a spike of lavender, and there was a voice said to him, in reply to what he questioned, The path of the shadows of the sun. The shadows of the sun were thrown forward across the same waste of sand, and he turned and pursued his way, resting at noon beneath a date tree, and refreshing himself at a clear spring beside it. Surely he was joyful as he went, and elated with high prospects, singing, Sun and moon, with their bright fingers, point the hero's path. If in his great work he lingers, well may they be wroth. Now the extent of the duration of his travel was four days and an equal number of nights, and it was on the fifth morn that he entered the gates of a city by the sea. Even at that hour when the inhabitants were rising from sleep, fair was the sea beyond it, and the harbor was crowded with vessels, ships stored with merchandise, silks, dates, diamonds, Damascus steel, Huge bales piled on the decks for the land of Roam and other lands. Shibli Bagarag thought, There's scarce a doubt but that one of those sails will set for Ulb shortly. Well, I, if I knew which, I'd board her and win a berth in her. Presently, he thought, I'll go to the public fountain and question it with the speech-winning waters. Thereupon he passed down the streets of the city and came to an open space where stood the fountain and sprinkled it with paravit. And the fountain spake, saying, Where men are, question not dumb things. Cried he, Faileth Paverded in its power? Have I done aught to baffle myself? Then he thought, Twere nevertheless well to do as the fountain directeth, and question men while I see them. And he walked about among the people, and came to the quays of the harbour, where the ships lay close in, many of them an easy leap from shore, and considered whom to address. So as he loitered about the quays, meditating on the means at the disposal of the all-wise, and marking the vessels wistfully, behold, there advanced to him, one at a quick pace, in the garb of a sailor. He observed Shibli Bagarag attentively a moment, and exclaimed, as it were in the plenitude of respect, and with the manner of one that is abashed, Surely thou art Shibli Bagarag, the nephew of the barber, him we watch for, so Shibli Bagarag marvelled at this recognition, and answered, Am I then already famous to that extent? And he that accosted him said, Tis certain the trumpet was blown before thy steps, and there is not a man in this city but knoweth of thy destination to the city of Ulb, and that thou art upon the track of great things, one chosen to bring about imminent changes. Then said Shibli Bagarag, For this I praise Nura bin Norka, daughter of Feshnavat, vizier of the king that ruleth in the city of Shagpat. She saw me, that I was marked for greatness. Well, ahai, the eagle knoweth me from afar, and proclaimeth me, the antelope of the hills, scenteth the coming of one not as other man, and telleth his tidings. The wind of the desert shapeth its gust to a meaning, so that the stranger, may wot, shibbly bagarag is at hand. He puffed his chest, and straightened his legs like the cock and was as a man upon whom the sultan has bestowed a dress of honour, even as the plumed peacock. Then the other said, Know that I am a captain of yonder vessel, that stands farthest out from the harbour, with her sails slackened. And she is laden with figs and fruits, which I exchange for silks, spices, and other merchandise, with the people of Ulb. Now what says the poet? Delay in thine undertaking, is disaster of thy own making. And he says also, Greatness is solely for them that succeed. Tis a rotten applause that gives earlier meed. Therefore it is advisable for thee to follow me on board without loss of time, and we will sail this very night for the city of Ulb. Now Shibli Bagarag was ruled by the words of the captain, albeit he desired to stay a while and receive the homage of the people of that city. So he followed him into a boat that was by, 
and the twain were rowed by sailors to the ship. Then, when they were aboard, the captain set sail, and they were soon in the hollows of deep waters. There was a berth in the ship set apart for Shibli Bagarag, and one for the captain. Shibli Bagarag, when he entered his berth, beheld at the head of his couch a hawk, its eyes red as rubies, its beak sharp as the curve of a scimitar. So he called out to the captain, and the captain came to him. But when he saw the hawk, he plucked his turban from his head, and dashed it at the hawk, and afterward ran to it, trying to catch it. And the hawk flitted from corner to corner of the berth, he after it with open arms. Then he took a sword, but the hawk flew past him, and fixed on the back part of his head, tearing up his hair by the talons, and pecking over his forehead at his eyes. And Shibli Bagarag heard the hawk scream the name, Karaz, and he looked closely at the captain of the vessel, and knew him for the genie Karaz. Then trembled he with exceeding terror, cursing his credulities, for he saw himself in the hands of the genie, and nothing but this hawk friendly to him on the fearful waters. When the hawk had torn up a certain hair, the genie stiffened and glowed like copper in the furnace, the whole length of him, and he descended heavily through the bottom of the ship, and sank into the waters beneath, which hissed and smoked, as at a bar of heated iron. Then Shibli Bagarag gave thanks to the prophet, and praised the hawk. But the hawk darted out of the cabin, and he followed it on deck. And lo, the vessel was in flames, and the hawk in a circle of the flames, and the flames soared with it, and left it no outlet. Now as Shibli Bagarag watched the hawk, the flames stretched out towards him, and took hold of his vestments. So he delayed not to commend his soul to the All-Merciful and bore witness to his faith, and plunged into the sea headlong. When he rose, the ship had vanished, and all was darkness where it had been. So he buffeted with the billows, thinking his last hour had come, and there was no help for him in this world. And the spray shaken from the billows blinded him. The great walls of water crumbled over him. Strength failed him, and his memory ceased to picture images of the old time. His heart to beat with ambition, and to keep the weight of his head above the surface, was becoming a thing worth the ransom of kings. As he was sinking and turning his eyes upward, he heard a flutter as of fledglings' wings, and the two red ruby eyes of the hawk were visible above him, like steady fires in the gloom. And the hawk perched on him, and buried itself among the wet hairs of his head, and presently, taking the identical in its beak, the hawk lifted him half out of the water, and bore him a distance, and dropped him. This the hawk did many times, and at the last Shibli Bagarag felt land beneath him, and could wade through the surges to the shore. He gave thanks to the supreme disposer, kneeling prostrate on the shore, and fell into a sleep deep in peacefulness, as a fathomless well, unruffled by a breath. Now when it was dawn, Shibli Bagarag awoke, and looked inland, and saw plainly the minarets of a city shining in the first beams, and the front of yellow mountains and people moving about the walls, and on the towers, and among the pastures round the city. So he made toward them, and inquired of them the name of their city. And they stared at him, crying, What? Knowest thou not the city of Ulb? The hawk on thy shoulder could tell thee that much. He looked and saw that the hawk was on his shoulder, and its left wing was scorched, the plumage blackened. So he said to the hawk, is it profitable, O preserving bird, to ask thee questions? The hawk shook its wings and closed an eye. So he said, Do I well in entering the city? The hawk shook its wings again and closed an eye. So he said, To what house shall I direct my steps in this strange city for the attainment of the purpose I have? The hawk flew and soared and alighted on the topmost of the towers of Ulb. So when it returned, he said, O oh, bird, rare bird, my counsellor, it is an indication, this alighting on the highest tower, that thou advisest me to go straight to the palace of the king. The hawk flapped its wings and winked both eyes, so Shibli Bagarag took forth the file from his breast, remembering the virtues of the waters of the well of Paravid, and touched his lips with them, that he might be endowed with flowing speech before the king of Ulb. As he did this, the file was open, and the hawk leaned to it, and dipped its beak into the water. And he entered the city, and passed through the long streets, towards the palace of the king, 
and craved audience of him, as one that had a thing marvellous to tell. So the king commanded that Shibli Bagarag should be brought before him, for he was a lover of marvels. As he went into the presence of the king, Shibli Bagarag listened to the hawk, for the hawk spake his language, and it said, Proclaim to the king a new wonder, the talking hawk. So when he had bent his body to the king, he proclaimed the new wonder, and the king seemed not to observe the hawk, and said, From what city art thou? He answered, Native, O king, to Shiraz, newly from the city of Shagpat. And the king asked, How is it with that hairy wonder? He answered, The dark forest flourisheth about him. And the king said, That is well. We of the city of Ulb take our fashions from them of the city of Shagpat, and it is but yesterday that I bastinadoed a barber that strayed among us. Shibli Bagarag sighed when he heard the king, and thought to himself, How unfortunate is the race of barbers, once honorable and in esteem! Surely it will not be otherwise till Shagpat is shaved. And the king called out to him for the cause of his sighing. So he said, I sigh, O king of the age, considering how like may be the case of the barber bastionadoed but yesterday in his worth and value to that of Rumdrum, the reader of planets that was a barber and he related the story of Rumdrum for the edification of the king and the exaltation of barbercraft delivering himself neatly and winningly and pointedly so that the story should apply which was its merit and its origin end of chapter eight Section 13 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 9 The Gorelka of Ulb. When Shibli Bagarag had finished his narration of the case of Rumdrum the barber, the king of Ulb said, O thou native of Shiraz, there is persuasion and sweetness and fascination on thy tongue, and I am touched with compassion for the souls of Baba Mustafa that I bastinadoed but yesterday, and he was from Shiraz likewise. Now the heart of Shibli Bagarag leapt when he heard mention of Baba Mustafa, and he knew him for his uncle that was searching him. He would have cried aloud his relationship, but the hawk whispered in his ear. Then the hawk said to him, there is danger in the king's muteness respecting me, for I am visible to him. Proclaim the spirit of prophecy. So he proclaimed that spirit, and the king said, Prophecy to me of barbercraft. And he cried, O king of the age, the barber is abased, trodden underfoot, given over to the sneers and the jibes of them that flatter the powerful ones. He is as the winter worm, as the crocodile in the slime of his sleep by the bank, as the sick eagle before molting. But I say, O king, that he will come forth like the serpent in a new skin, shaming the old one. He slept a caterpillar, and will come forth a butterfly. He sank a star, and, lo, he riseth a constellation. Now while he was speaking in the fervor of his soul, the king said something to one of the court officers surrounding him, and there was brought to the king a basin, a soap bowl, and a barber's tackle. When Shibli Bagarag saw these, the uses of the barber rushed upon his mind, and desire to sway the tackle pushed him forward and agitated him, so that he could not keep his hands from them. Then the king exclaimed, It is as I thought, our passions betray themselves, and our habits, so is it written, By Allah, I swear thou art thyself none other than a barber, O youth. Shibli Bagrag was nigh fainting with terror at this discovery of the king, but the hawk said in his ear, Proclaim speech in the tackle. So he proclaimed speech in the tackle, and the king smiled doubtfully, and said, If this be a cheat, Shiraz will not see thy face more. Then the hawk whispered in his ear, Drop on the tackle secretly a drop from the file. This he did, spreading his garments, and commanded the tackle to speak. And the tackle spake, each portion of it, confusedly as the noise of Babel. So the king marveled greatly, and said, "'Tis a greater wonder than the talking hawk, the talking tackle, while a high, it ennobleth barbercraft. Yet it were well to comprehend the saying of the tackle.' Then the hawk flew to the tackle, and fluttered about it, and, lo, 
the blade in the brush stood up and said in a shrill tone, "'It is ordained that Shagpat shall be shaved, and that Shibli Bagarag shall shave him.' The king bit the forefinger of amazement, and said, "'What then ensueth, O talking tackle?' And the brush and the blade stood up, and said in a shrill tone, "'Honour to Shibli Bagarag and barbers! Shame unto Shagpat and his fellows!' Upon that the king cried, "'Enough, O talking tackle! I will forestall the coming thing. I will be shaved. Wallahi, that will I!' Then the hawk whispered to Shibli Bagarag, "'Forward and shear him!' So he stepped forth and seized the tackle, and addressed himself keenly to the shaving of the king of Ulb, lathering him and performing his task with perfect skill. And the courtiers crowded to follow the example of the king, and Shibli Bagarag shaved them, all of them. Now, when they were shaved, fear smote them, the fear of ridicule, and each laughed at the change that was in the other. But the king cried, See that order is issued for the people of Ulb to be as we before tomorrow's sun. So is laughter taken in reverse. And the king said aside to Shibli Bagarag, Say now, what may be thy price for yonder hawk? And the hawk bade him say, The loan of thy cockle shell. The king mused and said, That is much to ask, for it is that which beareth the princess my daughter to the lily of the enchanted sea, which she nourisheth. And if tis harmed, she will be stricken with ugliness, as was the daughter of the vizier Feshnavat, who tended it before her. Yet is this hawk a bird of price, what be its qualities besides the gift of speech? Shibli Bagrag answered, to counsel in extremity, to forewarn, to counteract enchantments and foul magic. Upon that the king said, Follow me. And the king led the way from the hall, through many spacious chambers, fair with mirrors, and silks, and precious woods, and smooth marble floors, down into a vault lit by a lamp that was shaped like an eye. Round the vault were hung helm-pieces, and swords, and rich-studded housings, and there were silken dresses, and costly shawls, and tall vases and jars of china, tapestries, and gold services. And the king said, Take thy choice of these in exchange for the hawk. But Shibli Bagarag said, Not save alone of the cockle shell, king. Then the king threatened him, saying, There is a virtue in each of the things thou seest. The china jar is brimmed with wine, and remaineth so, though a thousand drink of it. The dress of Samarsand rendereth the wearer invisible, yet thou refusest to exchange them for thy hawk? And the king swore by the beard of his father, he would seize perforce the hawk, and shut up Shigli Bagarag in the vault, if he fell not into his bargain. Shibli Bagarag was advised by the hawk to accept the china jar and the dress of Samarsand, and handed the hawk to the king in exchange for these things. So the king took the hawk upon his wrist, and departed with it to the apartments of his daughter, and Shibli Bagarag went to the chamber prepared for him in the palace. Now was it night. Shibli Bagarag heard a noise at his lattice, and he arose and peered through it, and, lo, the hawk was fluttering without. So he let it in and caressed it, and the hawk bade him put on his silken dress, and carry forth his china jar, and go the round of the palace, and offer drink to the sentinels and the slaves. So he did as the hawk directed, and the sentinels and slaves were aware of a china jar, brimmed with wine, that was lifted to their lips, but him that lifted it they saw not. Surely they drank deep of the draught of astonishment. Then the hawk flew before him, and he followed it to a chamber lit with golden lamps, gorgeously hung, and full of a dusky splendor, and the faint sparkle of gems, ruby, amethyst, topaz, and beryl. In it there was the hush of sleep, and the heart of Shibli Bagarag told him that one beautiful was near. So he approached on tiptoe a couch of blue silk, bordered with gold wire, and inwoven with stars of blue turquoise stones, as it had been the heavens of midnight. On the couch lay one, a woman, pure in loveliness, the dark fringes of her closed lids like living flashes of darkness, her mouth like an unstrung bow, and as a double rosebud, even as two isles of coral, between which and the clear transparent watery beds the pearls shine freshly. And the hawk said to Shibli Bagarag, This is the princess Gorilka, 
the daughter of the king of Ulb, a sorceress, the guardian of the lily of the enchanted sea. Beneath her pillow is the cockle shell. Grasp it, but gaze not upon her. He approached and slid his arm beneath the pillow of the princess, and grasped the cockle shell. But ere he drew it forth, he gazed upon her, and the luster of her countenance transfixed him as with a javelin, so that he could not stir nor move his eyes from the contemplation of her sweetness of feature. The hawk darted at him fiercely, and pecked at him to draw his attention from her, and he stepped back, yet he continued, taking fatal draughts from the magic cup of her beauty. Then the hawk screamed a loud scream of anguish, and the princess awoke, and started halfway from the couch, and stared about her, and saw the bird in agitation. As she looked at the bird a shudder passed over her, and she snatched a veil and drew it over her face, murmuring, I dream, or I am under the eye of a man. Then she felt beneath the pillow, and knew that the cockle-shell had been touched, and in a moment she leapt from her couch, and ran to a mirror, and saw herself as she was, a full moon made to snare the wariest, and sit singly high on a throne in the hearts of men. At the sight of her beauty she smiled, and seemed at peace, murmuring still, I am under the eye of a man, or I dream. Now while she so murmured, she arrayed herself, and took the cockle-shell, and passed through the ante-room among her women sleeping. And Shibli Bagarag tracked her till she came to the vault, and she entered it, and walked to the corner from which had hung the dress of Samarsand. When she saw it gone, her face waxed pale, and she gazed slowly at all points, muttering, "'There is no further doubt but that I am under the eye of a man.' Thereupon she ran hastily from the vault, and passed between the sentinels of the palace, and saw them where they lay drowsy with intoxication. So she knew that the china jar and the dress of Samarsan had been used that night, and for no purpose friendly to her wishes. Then she passed down the palace steps, and through the gates of the palace and the city, till she came to the shore of the sea. There she launched the cockle-shell, and took the wind in her garments, and sat in it, filling it to overflowing, Yet it floated, and Shibli Bagarag waded to the cockle-shell, and took hold of it, and was drawn along by its motion swiftly through the waters, so that a foam swept after him, and Gorelka marked the foam. Now they had passage over the billows smoothly, and soon the length of the sea was darkened with two high rocks, and between them there was a narrow channel of the sea, roughened with moonlight. So they sped between the rocks, and came upon a purple sea, dark blue overhead, with large stars leaning to the waves. There was a soft whisperingness in the breath of the breezes that swung there, and many sails of charmed ships were seen in momentary gleams, flapping the mast idly far away. Warm as new milk from the full udders were the waters of that sea, and figures of fair women stretched lengthwise with the current, and lifted ahead as they rushed rolling by. Truly it was enchanted even to the very bed. End of chapter 9。Section 14 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 10. The Lily of the Enchanted Sea. Now, after the cockle shell had skimmed calmly a while, it began to pitch and grew unquiet, and came upon a surging foam, pale, and with scintillating bubbles. The surges increased in volume and boiled, hissing as with anger, like savage animals. Presently the cockle shell rose upon one very lofty swell, and Shibli Bagarat lost hold of it, and lo, it was overturned and engulfed in the descent of the great mountain of water, and the princess Gorgerka was immersed in the depths. She would have sunk, but Shibli Bagarat caught hold of her and supported her to the shore by the strength of his arm. The shore was one of sand and shells. There were cheeks sparkling in the moonlight. Over it hung a promontory, a huge jet of black rock. Now the princess, when she landed, seeing not him that supported her, delayed not to run beneath the rock, and ascended by steps cut from the base of the rock, and Shibli Bagarak followed her by winding paths around the rock till she came to the highest peak, 
commanding the circle of the enchanted sea in glimpses of enthralled vessels and mariners bewitched on board long paths of starlight rippled into the distant gloom and the reflection of the moon opposite was a wide nuptial sheet of silver on the waters islands green and white with soft music floating from their foliage sailed slowly to and fro surely to dwell reclining among the slopes of those islands a man would forth the paradise now the princess as she stood upon the peak knew she was not alone and pretended to slip from her footing and shipley bagarak called out to him ran to her but she turned in the direction of his voice and laughed and he knew he was outwitted then to deceive her he dropped from the vial twenty drops round her on the rock and those twenty drops became twenty voices so that she was bewildered with their calls and stopped her ears and ran from them and descended from the eminence nimbly slipping over the ledges and leaping the abysses and shibli bagarak followed her clutching at the trailers and tearing them with him letting loose a torrent of stones and earth till on a sudden they stood together above a green sward basin of the rock opening to the sea and in the middle of the basin lo in stature like a maiden of the mountains one that drew with her head pensively thinking of her absent lover the enchanted lily wonder knocked at the breast of shibli bagarak when he saw the queenly flower waving its illumined head to the breeze he could not retain a cry of rapture as he did this the princess stretched her hand to where he was and groped a moment and caught him by the silken dress and tore in it a great rent and by the rent he stood revealed to her then said she o oh, youth thou hast done ill to follow me here and the danger of it is past computing surely the motive was a deep one not other than the love of me she spoke winningly sweet words to a luted voice and the youth fell upon his knees before her smitten by her beauty and he said i follow thee here as i would follow such loveliness to the gates of doom o princess of all she smiled and said playfully i will read by thy hand whether thou be one faithful in love she took his hand and sprinkled on it earth and gravel and commenced skinning it curiously as she scanned it her forehead wrinkled up and a shot like black lightning travelled across her countenance withering its beauty she cried in a forced voice aha it is well o youth for thee and for me that thou lovest me and art faithful in love the look of the princess of Alb and her voice affrighted the soul of shibli bagarak and he would have turned from her but she held him and went to the lily and emptied into the palm of her hand the dew that was in the lily and raised it to the lips of shibli bagarak bidding him drink as a pledge for her sake and her love and to appease his thirst as he was about to drink there fell into the palm of the princess from above what seemed like a bolt of storm scattering the dew and after he had blinked with the suddenness of the action he looked and beheld the hawk its red eyes inflamed with wrath and the hawk screamed into the ear of shibli bagarak pluck up the lily ere it is too late o oh, fool the dew was poison pluck it up by the root with thy right hand so thereat he strode to the lily and grasped it and pulled with his strength and the lily was loosened it yielded and came forth streaming with blood from the bulb of the root surely the bulb of the root was a palpitating heart yet warm even as we have within our bosoms now from the terror of that sight the princess hid her eyes and shrank away and the lines of malice avarice and envy seemed aging her at every breath then the hawk pecked at her three pecks and perched on the corner of a rock and called shrilly the name Karats! and the genie Karats came slanting down the night air like a praying bird and stood among them so the hawk cried see o Karats, the freshness of thy princess of Olb. and the genie regarded her till loathing curled his lip for she grew in ghastliness to the colour of a frog and a frog's face was hers a camel's back a pelican's throat the legs of a peacock then the hawk cried is this how ye meet ye lovers ye that will be wedded and the hawk made his tongue as a thorn to them at the last it exclaimed now let us fight our battle carats but the genie said nay there will come a time for that traitorous and the hawk cried thou delayest to the file of Pedibet. the hair is like an oven and this lily my three helps are expended thinking Agnes, for which we bought her striketh but a single blow that is well go then and take thy princess and obtain permission of the king of alb her father to wed her o Karats. the hawk whistled with laughter 
and the genie was stung with its mockeries and clutched the princess of Allah in a bunch and rose from the ground with her slanting up the night air like fire till he was seen high above even as an angry star reddening the seas beneath when he was lost to the eye shibli bagrak drew a long breath and cried aloud the likeness of that princess of alb in her ugliness the norna my betrothed is a thing marvellous if it be not she herself and he reflected yet she seemed not to recognize me and claim me and thought i am bound to her by gratitude and i should have rescued her from karatz but i know not if it be she well i i am bewildered i will ask counsel of the hawk he took to the corner of the rock where the hawk had perched but the hawk was gone and as he searched for it his eyes fell upon the bed of earth where the lily stood ere he plucked it and lo in the place of the lily there was a damsel dressed in white shining silks fairer than the enchanted flower straighter than the stalk of it her head slightly drooping like the moon on a border of the night her bosom like the swell of the sea in moonlight her eyes dark under a low arch of darker lashes like stars on the skirts of storm and she was the very dream of loveliness formed to freeze with awe and to inflame with passion so shibli bagarak gazed at her with adoration his hand stretched halfway to her as if to clasp her fearing she was a vision and would fade and the damsel smiled a sweet smile and lifted her antelope eyes and said who am i and to whom might i be likened o youth and he answered who thou art o young perfection i know not if not a hurry of paradise but thou art like the princess of olb yet lovelier o lovelier and thy voice is the voice of norna my betrothed yet purer sweeter younger so the damsel laughed a laugh like a sudden sweeping of wild chords of music and said o youth sawest thou not the scent of norna thy betrothed gathered in a bunch by karatz and he answered i saw her but i knew not o damsel of beauty surely i was bewildered amazed without power to contend with the genie then she said wouldst thou release her so kiss me on the lips on the eyes and on the forehead three kisses each time and with the first say by the well of paravid and with the second by the strength of garavan and with the third by the lily of the sea now the heart of the youth bounded at her words and he went to her and trembling kissed her all bashfully on the lips on the eyes and on the forehead saying each time as she directed and she took him by the hand and stepped from the bed of earth crying joyfully thanks be to allah and the prophet norna is released from the sorceries that held her and powerful so while she was wondering she said knowest thou not the woman thy betrothed he answered o damsel of beauty i am charged with many feelings doubts and hopes are mixed in me say first who thou art and fill my two ears with bliss and she said i will leave my name to the lips surely i am the daughter of the vizier freshnavat betrothed to a wandering youth a barber who sickened at the betrothal and consoled himself with a proverb when he gave me the kiss of contract and knew not how with truth to pay me a compliment now shibli bagarak saw this was indeed norna bin norka his betrothed and he fell before her in love and astonishment but she lifted him to her neck and embraced him saying said i not truly when i said i am that i shall be my youth is not as that of banavar beautiful gained it at another's cost but my own and stolen from me by wicked sorceries and he cried tell me o norna my betrothed how this matter came to pass she said on our way to Agnes, she bade him grasp the lily and follow her and he followed her down the rock and over the bright shells upon the sand admiring her stateliness her willowy lightness her slimness as of the palm tree then she waded in the water and began to strike out with her arms and swim boldly he likewise and presently they came to a current that hurried them off in its course and carried them as weeds streaming rapidly he was bearing witness to his faith as a man that has lost hope of life when a strong eddy stayed him and whirled him from the current into the calm water so he looked for norna and saw her safe beside him flinging back the wet tresses from her face that was like the full moon glowing radiant behind a dispersing cloud and she said ask not for the interpretation of wonders in the sea 
for they cluster like dates on a date branch surely to be with me is enough and she bewitched him in the midst of the waters making him oblivious of all save her so that he hugged the golden net of her smiles and fair flatteries and swam with an exulting stroke giving his breast broadly to the low billows and shouting verses of love and delight to her and while they swam sweetly behold there was a pearly shell of flashing crimson amethyst and emerald that came scudding over the waves toward them raised to the wind fan-shaped and in its front two silver seats when she saw it norna cried she has sent me this rapscar perchance is she favourable to my wishes and this were well then she swayed in the water sideways and drew the shell to her and the twain climbed into it and sat each on one of the silver seats folded together in its lightness it was like a foam bubble before the wind on the blue water and bore them onward airily at his feet shibli bagarag beheld a stool of carved topaz and above his head the arch of the shell was inlaid with wreaths of gems never was a vessel fairer than that and while they were speeding over the water norna said at the end of this fair sea is Aklis, and beyond it is the Kush. So while the wind is our helmsman, and we go circled by the quiet of this sea, I'll tell thee of myself, if thou carest to hear. And he cried with the ardor of love, Surely I would hear of naught save thyself, Norna, and the music of the happy garden compareth not in sweetness with it. I long for the freshness of thy voice, as the desert camel for the green spring, oh, my betrothed. So she said, and now give ear to the following. End of chapter 10chapter eleven and this is the story of norna bin norka the genie karatz and the princess of old part one know that when i was a babe i lay on my mother's bosom in the wilderness and it was the bosom of death surely i slept and smiled and dreamed the infant's dream and knew not the coldness of the thing i touched so were we even as two dead creatures lying there life was in me and i awoke with hunger at the time of feeding and turned to my mother and put up my little mouth to her for nourishment and sucked her but nothing came i cried and commenced chiding her and after a while it was decreed that certain horsemen of a troop passing through the wilderness beheld me and seeing my distress and the helpless being i was their hearts were stirred and they were mindful of what the poet says concerning succor given to the poor helpless and innocent of this world and took me up and mixed for me camel's milk and water from the bag and comforted me and bore me with them after they had paid funeral rites to the body of my mother now the rosebud showeth if the rose-tree be of the wilds or of the garden and the chief of that troop seeing me born to the uses of gentleness carried me in his arms with him to his wife and persuaded her that was childless to make me the child of their adoption so i abode with them during the period of infancy and childhood caressed and cared for as is said the flower a stranger's hand may gather strikes root into the stranger's breast affection is our mother father friend and of cherishers the best and i loved them as their own child witting not but that i was their child till on a day when i played among some children of my years the daughter of the king of Olb passed by us on a mule with her slaves and drawn swords and called to me thou little castaway and had me brought to her and peered upon my face in a manner that frightened me for i was young then she put me down from the neck of her mule where she had seated me saying child of a dead mother and a runaway father what need i fear from thy like and the dreams of a lovesick genie so she parted but i forgot not her words and dwelt upon them and grew fevered with them and drooped now when he saw my bloom of health gone heaviness on my feet the light hollowed from my eyes my benefactor Ravaloki, he that i thought my father took me between his knees and asked me what it was and the cause of my ailing and i told him then said he this is so thou art not my child but i love thee as mine o my little desert flower and why the princess should fancy fear of thee i like not to think but fear thou her for she is a mask of wiles and a vine trailing over pitfalls 
such a sorceress the world knoweth not as gorgelka of old now i was penetrated by what he said and ceased to be a companion to them that love childish games and romps and meditated by myself in gardens and closets feigning sleep when the elder ones discoursed that i might learn something of this mystery and all that was spoken perplexed me more as a sage declareth who in a labyrinth wandereth without clue more that he wandereth doth he undo though i was quick as a quick-eyed falcon i discovered not flying ever at the false game a follower of misleading beams a cheated soul the mock of dreams at times i thought it was the king of all was my father and plotted to come in his path and there were kings and princes of far countries who i sought to encounter that they might claim me but none claimed me o oh, my betrothed few gave me love besides ravaloki and when the wife that he cherished died he solely for i was lost in waywardness and the slave of moody imaginings tis said if thou the love of the world for thyself wouldst gain mould thy breast like the world to become for it's like the world loveth best and this was not i then now the sons and daughters of men are used to celebrate the days of their birth with gifts and rejoicings but i could only celebrate that day which delivered me from the death into the hands of Ravaloki, as none knew my birth hour and when it was the twelfth return of this event Ravaloki, my heart's father called me to him and pressed in my hand a glittering coin telling me to buy with it in the bazaars what i would so i went forth attended by a black slave after the mid-noon for i was eager to expend my store and cared not for the great heat scarcely had we passed the cheese market and were hurrying on to shops of the goldsmiths and jewellers when i saw an old man a beggar in a dirty yellow turban and piece particolored cloth stuff and linen and rags and his other gear so lean was he and looked so weak that i wondered he did not other than lay his length on the ground and as he asked me for alms his voice had a piteousness that made me to weep and i punished my slave for seeking to drive him away and gave him my one piece of gold into his hand then he asked me what i required of him in exchange and i said what can a poor man that is a beggar give he laughed and asked me then what i had intended to buy with that piece of money so beginning to regret the power that was gone from me of commanding with my gold piece this and that fine thing i mused and said truly a blue dress embroidered with gold and a gold crown and gold bracelets set with turquoise stones these and toys what could i buy in this city a book of magic that were my purchase the old fellow smiled and said to my black slave and thou hadst thou this coin what were thy purchase therewith he scoffing the old beggar answered a plaster for sores as broad as my buck and a camel's hump thou old villain the old man grunted in his chest and said thou art but a camel thyself to hinder a true muscle and from passing in peace down a street of olive so twere a good purchase and a fitting knowest thou what is said of the blessing given by them that receiveth the charity tis the fertilizing dew that streameth after the sun strong as the breath of allah to bless life well begun so is my blessing on this little damsel she shall have her wealth well eh, thou black face thou and thine this spake the old man and hobbled off while my slave was jeering him so i strolled to the bazaars and thought no more of the old man's words and longed to purchase a hundred fineries and came to the confectioner's and smelt the smell of his must-scented sweetmeats and lemon sweets and sugared pistachios that are delicious to crunch between the teeth my mouth watered and i said to my slave oh cobdrop a coin though it were small would give us privilege in yonder shop to select and feast and approved the skill of the confectioner he grinned and displayed in his black fist the petty coin of exchange but would not let me have it till i had sworn to give no more away to beggars so even as we were hurrying into the shop another old beggar wretcheder than the first fronted me and i was moved and forgot my promise to kabdrab and gave him the money then was kabdrab wroth and kicked the old beggar with his forefoot lifting him high into the air and lo he did not alight but rose over the roofs of the houses and beyond the city till he was but a speck in the blue of the sky above so kabdra bit his forefinger amazed and glanced at his foot and at what was visible of the old beggarman and again at his foot thinking but of what he had done with it and the might manifested in that kick fool that he was all the way homeward he kept scanning the sky and lifting his foot aloft and i saw him bewildered with a strange conceit 
as the poet has exclaimed in his scorn o world diseased o race empirical were fools of the fathers of every miracle now when i was in my bedchamber what saw i there but a dress of very costly blue raiment with gold work broidery and a lovely circlet of gold and gold bracelets set with stones of turquoise and a basket of gold woven wire wherein were toys wondrous ones soldiers that cut off each other's heads and put them on again springing antelopes palm trees that turned into fountains and others and lo a book in red binding with figures on it and clasps of gold a great book so i clapped my hands joyfully crying the old beggar has done it and robed myself in the dress and ran forth to tell ravaloki as i ran by a window looking on the inner court i saw below a crowd of all the slaves of ravaloki round one that was seeking to escape from them and twas kabdrab with a camel's hump on his back and a broad brown plaster over it the wretch howling peering across his shoulder and trying to bolt from his burden as a horse would run from his rider then i saw that kabdrab also had his wish his camel's hump and thought the old beggar what was he but a genie surely ravaloki caressed me when he heard of the adventure and what had befallen Kabdarab was a jest of the city. But for me I spared little time away from that book, and studied in it incessantly the ways and windings of magic, till I could hold communion with genie, and willed charms to summon them, and utter spells that subdue them, discovering the haunts of talismans that enthrall Aphrites, and are powerful among men. There was that Kabdarab coming to me daily to call out of the air for the old beggarman to rid him of his hump, and he would waste hours looking up into the sky moodily for him, and cursing the five toes of his foot, for he doubted not the two beggars were one, and that he was punished for the kick, and lamented it direly, saying in the thick of his whimpering, I'd give the foot that did it to be released for my hump, O oh, my fair mistress. So I pitied him, and made a power and a spell, and my first experiment in magic was to relieve Kabdarab of his hump and i succeeded in loosening it and it came away from him and sank into the ground of the garden where we stood so i told kabdarab to say nothing of this but the idle pated fellow blabbed it over the city and it came to the ears of gorgelka then she sent for me to visit her and by the advice of ravaloki i went and she fondled me and sought to get at the depth of my knowledge by a spell that tieth every faculty save the tongue and it is a spell of vain longing now because i baffled her arch she knew me more cunning than i seemed and as night advanced she affected to be possessed with pleasure in me and took me in her arms and sought to fascinate me and i heard her mutter once shall i doubt the warning of Garatz? so presently she came and said come with me and i went with her under the curtain of that apartment to another a long saloon wherein were couches round a fountain and beyond it a knavery lit with lamps when we were there she whistled and immediately there was a concert of birds a wondrous accord of exquisite piping and she leaned on a couch and took me by her to listen sweet and passionate was the harmony of the birds but i let not my faculties lull and observed that round the throat of every bird was a ringed mark of gold and stamps of divers gems similar in colour to a ring on the finger of her right hand which she dazzled my sight with as she flashed it when we had listened a long hour to this music the princess gazed on me as if to mark the effect of a charm and i saw disappointment on her lovely face and she bit her lip and looked spiteful saying thou art fair gone in the use of magic and weary old girl and she laughed unnaturally and called slaves to bring in sweet drinks to us and i drank with her and became less weary and she fondled me more calling me tender names heaping endearments on me and as the hour of the middle night approached i was losing all suspicion and deep languor and sighed at the song of the birds the long love songs and dozed awake with eyes half shut i felt her steal from me and continued still motionless without alarm so i was mastered what hour it was or what time had passed i cannot say when a bird that was chained on a perch before me a very quaint bird with a top knot awry and black heavy bill and ragged gorgeousness of plumage the only object between my lids and darkness suddenly in the midst of the singing let loose a hoarse laugh that was followed by peals of laughter from the other birds thereat i started up and beheld the princess standing over a brazier and she seized a slipper from her foot and flung it at the bird that had first laughed and struck him off his perch and went to him and seized him and shook him crying dare to laugh again 
he kept clearing his throat and trying to catch the tune he had lost pitching a high note and a low note but the marvel of this laughter of the bird wakened me thoroughly and i thanked the bird in my soul and i said to golgelka more wondrous than their singing this laughter o princess she would not speak till she had beaten every bird in the aviary and then said in the words of the poet shall they that deal in magic batch decrees of wonder from the bosom of one cloud comes the lightning and the thunder and then said she o norna i tell thee truly my intent which was to enchant thee but i find thee wise so let us join our powers and thou shalt become mighty as the sorceress now ravaloki had said to me her friendship is fire her enmity frost so be cold to the former and to the latter hot and i dissembled and replied teach me o princess so she asked me what i could do could i plant a mountain in the sea and people it could i anchor a purple cloud under the sun and live there a year with them i delighted in could i fix the eyes of the world upon one head and make the nations bow to it change men to birds fishes to men and so on a hundred sorceries that i had never attempted and dreamed not of my betrothed i had never offended allah by misuse of my powers when i told her she cried thou art then of a surety she that's fitted for the custody of the lily of light so come with me now i had heard of the lily even this thou holdest may its influence be unwithering and desired to see it so she led me from the palace to the shores of the sea and flung a cockle-shell on the waters and seated herself in it with me in her lap and we scudded over the waters and entered this enchanted sea and stood by the lily then i that loved flowers undertook the custody of this one knowing not the consequences and depths of her wiles tis truly said the overwise themselves hoodwink for simple eyesight is a modest thing they on the black abasin brink smile but when they fall bitterly think what difference twixt the fool and me creation's king nevertheless for a while nothing evil resulted and i had great joy in the flower and tended it with exceeding watchfulness and loved it so i was brought in my heart to thank the princess and think well of her End of part one of chapter eleven section sixteen of the shaving of shagpat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the shaving of shagpat by george meredith chapter eleven part two now on summer eve as ravaloki rested under the shade of his garden palm and i studied beside him great volumes of magic it happened that after i had read certain pages i closed one of the books marked on the cover aleph and shut the clasp louder than i intended so that he who was dozing started up and his head was in the sloped sun in an instant and i observed the shadow of his head lengthen out along the grass plot towards the mossed wall and it shot up the wall darkening it then drawing back and lessening then darting forth like a beast of darkness irritable for prey i was troubled for whatso is seen while the volume aleph is in use hath a portent but the discovery of what this might be baffled me so i determined to watch events and it was not many days ere ravaloki who was the leader of the armies of the king of Olb, was called forth to subdue certain revolted tributaries of the king and at my entreaty took me with him and i saw battles and encounters lasting a day's length once we were encamped in a fruitful country by a brook running with a bright eye between green banks and i that had freedom and the password of the camp wandered down to it and refreshed my forehead in the coolness so as i looked under the falling drops lo on the opposite bank the old beggar that had given me such fair return for my alms and cabs up his hunt i heard him call this night is the key to the mystery and he was gone every incantation i uttered was insufficient to bring him back surely i hurried to the tents and took no sleep watching zealously by the tent of ravaloki crouched in his shadow about the time of the setting of the moon i heard footsteps approach the tent within the circle of the guard and it was a youth that held in his hand naked steel when he was by the threshold of the tent i rose before him and beheld the favourite of ravaloki even the youth he had destined to espouse me so i reproached him and he wept 
denying not the attention he had to assassinate Ravaloki, and when his soul was softened he confessed to me, "'Twas that I might win the Princess Gorgelka, and she urged me to it, promising the king would promote me to the vacant post of Ravaloki. Then I said to him, "'Lovest thou Gorgelka?' And he answered, Yea, though I know my doom in loving her, and that it will be the doom of them now piping to her pleasure and denied the privilege of laughter. So I thought, O oh, cruel sorceress, the birds are men! And as I mused, my breast melted with pity at their desire to laugh, and the little restraint they had upon themselves notwithstanding her harshness. For could they think of their changed condition and folly without laughter? and the folly that sent them fresh mates in misery was indeed matter for laughter, fed to fullness by the constant meditation on the perch. Meantime I enchanted the youth and bade him retire quickly, but as he was going he said, Beware of the genie Karats. Then I held him back, and after a parley he told me what he had heard the princess say, and it was that Karats had seen me and sworn to possess me for my beauty. Strangely smiled Gorgalka when she spake that, said he now the city of all fronts the sea and behind it is a mountain and a wood there the king met ravaloki on his return victorious over the rebels so to escape the eye of the king i parted with ravaloki and sought to enter the city by a circuitous way but the paths wound about and zigzag and my slaves suffered nightfall to surprise us in the entanglements of the wood i sent them in different directions to strike into the main path retaining Kabdurab at the bridle of my mule. But that creature now began to address me in a familiar tone, and he said something of love for me that enraged me, so I hit him a blow, and then came from him sounds like the neighing of mares. And lo, he seized me and rose with me in the air, and I thought, the very heavens are opening to that black beast, when on a sudden he paused and shut down with me from the heights of the stars to the mouth of a cavern by the putrid sea and dragged me into a cavern greatly illuminated hung like a palace chamber and supported on pillars of shining jasper then i fell upon the floor in a swoon and awaking saw cabdrab no longer but in his place a genie oh my soul thou hast seen him i thought at once tis karatz and when he said to me this is thy abode o lady and i he that have sworn to possess thee from the hour i saw thee in the chamber of gorgelka then was I certain t'was Kratz. So collecting the strength of my soul, I said in the words of the poet, Woo, not a heart preoccupied, but thorn is like a loathing bride. Mark ye the shrubs, how they turn from the sea, the sea's rough whispers shun. But like the sun of heaven be, and every flower will open wide, who with the shining patience we beheld in heaven's sun. Then he sang, exquisite lady name the smart that fills thy heart thou art the foot and i the worm prescribe the term finding him compliant i said o oh, great genie truly this search of my life has been to discover him that is my father and how i was left in the wilderness there is no peace for me no understanding the word of love till i hear by whom i was left the babe on the bosom of a dead mother he exclaimed and his eyes twinkled tis that that thou shalt know in a span of time, O oh my mistress. Hast thou seen the birds of Gorgelka? Thy father Freshnavat is among them, perched like a bird. So I cried, And tell me how he may be disenchanted. He said, Swear first to be mine, unreluctantly. Then I said, What is thy oath? He answered, I swear when I swear by the identical. Thereupon I questioned him concerning the identical what it was and he not suspecting revealed to me the mighty hair in his head now in the head of shagbat even that so i swore by that to give myself to the possessor of the identical and flattered him and said he o oh, lovely damsel i am truly one of the most powerful of the genii yet am i in bondage to that sorceress golgalka by reason of a ring she holdeth and could i get that ring from her and be slave to nothing mortal an hour I could light creation as a torch, and broil the inhabitants of earth at one fire. I thought, that ring is known to me. And he continued, Surely I cannot assist thee in this work, other than by revealing the means of this enchantment, and it is to keep the birds laughing uninterruptedly an hour. Then are they men again, and take the forms of men that are laughers. 
I know not why. So I cried, Tis well, carry me back to Olp. Then the genie lifted me in the air, and ceased not speeding rapidly through it, till I was on the roof of the house of Ravaloki. O oh, sweet youth, moon of my soul! From that time to the disenchantment of Freshnavat, I pored over my books, trying experiments in magic, dreadful ones, hunting for talismans to countervail Gorgelka. But her power was great, and was not in me to get her away from the birds one hour to free them. On a certain occasion I had stolen to them, and kept them laughing with the stories of man to within an instant of the hour. And they were laughing exultantly with the easy, happy laugh for them that perceived deliverance sure. But she burst in and beat them even to the door of death. I saw too in her eyes that glowed like the eyes of wild cats in the dark. She suspected me, and I called Allah to aid the just cause against the sinful, and prepared to war with her. Now in my desire, which was to liberate my father and his fellows in tribulation, I knew pure and had no fear of the sequel, as is declared. Fear not so much as fear itself, for armed with fear the foe finds passage to the vital part and strikes the double blow. So one day, as I leaned from my casement looking on the garden seaward, I saw a strange red and yellow feathered bird that flew to the branch of a citron tree opposite, with a ring in its beak, and the bird was singing, and with every note the ring dropped from its bill and descended swiftly, and an arrow is slant downward and seized it ere it reached the ground, and commenced singing afresh. When I had marked this to happen many times, I thought, how like this bird to an innocent soul possessed of magic and using its powers! Lo, it seeketh still to sing as one of the careless, and cannot relinquish the ring and be as the careless, and between the two there is neither peace for it nor pleasure. Now while my eyes were on the pretty bird, dwelling on it, I saw it struck suddenly by an arrow beneath the left wing, and the bird fluttered to my bosom, and dropped in it the ring from its beak. Then it sprang weakly, and sought to fly and soar, and fluttered, but a blue film lodged over its eyes, and its panting was quickly ended. So I looked at the ring, and knew it for the one I had noted on the finger of Gorgelka. Red blush my bliss, and twas revealed to me that the bird was of the birds of the princess, that had escaped from her with the ring. I buried the bird, weeping for it, and flew to my books, and as I read, a glow stole over me. O oh, my betrothed eyes of my soul, I read the possessor of that ring was mistress of the marvellous hair, which is a magnet to the homage of men, so that they crowd and rush and hunger to adore it, even the identical. This was the power that peopled the avery of Gordigelka, and had well nigh conquered all the resistance of my craft. Now as I read there rose a hubbub and noise in the outer court, and shrieks of slaves. The noise approached with rapid strides, and before I could close my books, Gorgelica burst in upon me, crying, Non, non! Wild and haggard was her head, and she rushed to my books and saw them open at the sign of the ring, and then began our combat. She menaced me as never mortal was menaced. Rapid lightning flashes were her transformations, and she was a serpent, a scorpion, a lizard, a lioness in succession, but I leapt perpetually into fresh rings of fire and of witched water and at the fiftieth transformation she fell on the floor exhausted a shuddering heap seeing that i ran from her to the aviary in her palace and hurried over a story of men to the birds that rocked them on their perches with chestquakes of irresistible laughter i flew back to the princess and she still puffing on the floor commenced wheedling and begging the ring of me stinting no promises at last she cried girl what is this ring to thee without beauty thy beauty is in my keeping and i exclaimed how how smitten to the soul she answered yea and i can wear it as my own adding to it my own when thou art a hag my betrothed i was on the verge of giving her the ring for this secret when a violent remote laughter filled the inner hollow of my ears and it increased till the princess heard it and now the light of my casement was darkened with birds the birds of gorgelka laughing as on a wind of laughter so I opened to them, and they darted in, laughing all of them, till I could hold out no longer, and the infection of laughter seized me, and I rolled with it, and the princess, she laughed too, a hyena laugh under a cat's grin. And we all of us remained in this way some minutes, laughing the breath out of our bodies, 
as if death would take us whoso in the city of all us, the slaves the people and the king laughed knowing not the cause this day it is still remembered at all as a day of laughter now as the stroke of the hour the laughter ceased and i saw in the chamber a crowd of youths and elders of various ranks but their visages were become long and solemn as that of them that have seen a dark experience tis certain they laughed a little in their lives from that time and the muscles of their cheeks had rest so i cut down my veil and cried to the princess my father is among these point him out to me ere she replied one steppeth forth even fresh about my father and called me by name and knew me by spot on the left arm and made himself known to me and told me the story of my dead mother how she had missed away from the caravan in the desert and he searching for her was set upon by the robbers and borne on their expeditions nothing said he of the sorceries of gorgelka and i not wishing to provoke the princess suffered his dread to exist so i kissed him and bowed my head to him and she fled from the sight of innocent happiness then i took the ring summoned karatz and ordered him to reinstate those princes and chiefs and officers in their possessions and powers on what part of the earth whatsoever that might be never till i stood as the lily and thy voice sweetened the name of love in my ears heard i aught of delicate delightfulness like the sound of their gratitude many wooed me to let them stay by me and guard me and do service all their lives to me but this i would not allow and though they were fair as moons some of them i responded not to their soft glances speaking calmly the word of farewell for i was burdened with other thoughts now when the genie had done my bidding he returned to me joyfully my soul sickened to think of myself as his by a promise but i revolved the words of my promise and saw in them a loophole of escape so when he claimed me i said hi i lay thy head in my lap as if my mind treasured it and then he lay there and revealed to me his plans for the destruction of men or said he they should be our slaves and burdened beasts for there is no restraint on me now that thou art mistress of the ring and mine thereupon his imagination swelled and he saw his evil will enthroned and the hopes of men beneath his heel crying and the more i crush them the thicker they crowd for the identical compelleth their very souls to adore in spite of distaste then said i tell me o genie is the identical subservient to me in another head save thine he answered nay in another head tis a counteraction to the power of the ring the ring powerless over it and i said must it live in a head the identical cried he woe to what else holdeth it i whispered in his hairy pointed red ear sleep sleep and lulled him with a song and he slept being weary with my commissioning then i bade fresh about my father fetch me one of my books of magic and read in it of the discovery of the identical by means of the ring and i took the ring and hung it on a hair from my own head over the head of the genie and saw one of the thin lines begin to twist and dart and wreathe and shift lustres as a creature in anguish so i put the ring on my forefinger and turned the hair round and round it and tugged lo with a noise that stunned me the hair came out oh my betrothed what shrieks and roars were those with which the genie awoke finding himself bare of the identical Orb heard them and the sea foamed like the mouth of madness as the genie sped thunder like over it following me in mid-air such a flight that it was now i found it is not possible to hold the identical for it twisted and stung and was nigh slipping from me while i flew i saw white on a corner of the desert a city and i descended on it by the shop of a clothier that sat quietly by his goods and stuffs thinking a fate less than that of kebabs and stews and rare seasonings that city now hath his name well eh, had i not then sown in his head that hair which he weareth yet how had i escaped karatz and met thee wonders are the decrees of providence praise be to allah for them for the genie when he found himself baffled by me and shagpat with the mighty hair in his head the identical he yelled and fetched shagpat a slap that sent him into the middle of the street but kansa screamed after him and there was immediately such a lamentation in the city about shagpat and such tearing of hair about him that i perceived at once the virtue that was in the identical as for karatz finding his claim as possessor of the identical no more valid he vanished and has been my rebellious slave since till thou o my betrothed madest to me spend him in the curing of thy folly on the horse garavan and he escaped from my circles beyond the dominion of the ring yet had he his revenge 
for i that with keep of the lily had i now learned ruefully a bond of beauty with it and whatever was a stain to one with it the other then that sorceress gorgelka stole my beauty from me by sprinkling a blight on the petals of that fair flower and i became as thou first sawest me but what am i as i now am blissful blissful surely i grew humble in the loss of beauty and by humility wise so that i assisted freshnavat to become vizier by the ring and watched for thy coming to shave shakepot as a star watches for tis written a barber alone shall be the sharer of the identical and he only my betrothed has power to plant it in achilles where it groweth as a pillar bringing due reverence to achilles End of chapter eleven Section seventeen of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter twelve, part one. The Wiles of Rebeskorat. Now, when Norna bin Norka had made an end of her narration, she folded her hands and was mute a while and to the ear of Shibli Bagarag it seemed as if a sweet instrument had on a sudden ceased luting. So as he leaned, listening for her voice to recommence, she said quickly, See yonder fire on the mountain's height? He looked and saw a great light on the summit of a lofty mountain before them. Then she said, That is Aklis, and it is ablaze, knowing a visitant near. Tighten now the hairs of Garavine about thy wrist, touch thy lips with the waters of Paravid, Hold before thee the lily, and make ready to enter the mountain. Lo, my betrothed, thou art in possession of the three means that melt opposition, and the fault is thine if thou fail. He did as she directed, and they were taken on a tide and advanced rapidly to the mountain, so that the water smacked and crackled beneath the shell, covering it with silver-showering arches of glittering spray. Then the fair beams of the moon became obscured, and the twain reddened with the reflection of the fire, and the billows waxed like riotous flames, and presently the shell rose upon the peak of many waves, swollen to one, and looking below, they saw in the scarlet abyss of waters at their feet a monstrous fish, with open jaws and one baleful eye. And the fish was lengthy as a caravan winding through the desert, and covered with fiery scales. Shibli Bagarag heard the voice of Norna shriek affrightedly, Caraz, and as they were sliding on the downslope, she stood upright in the shell, pronouncing rapidly some words in magic, and the shell closed upon them both, pressing them together and writing darkness on their very eyeballs. So while they were thus, they felt themselves gulped in and borne forward with terrible swiftness, they knew not where, like one that hath a dream of sinking, and outside the shell a rushing, gurgling noise, and a noise as of shouting multitudes, and muffled multitudes, muttering complaints and yells and querulous cries, told them they were yet speeding through the body of the depths in the belly of the fish. Then there came a shock, and the shell was struck with light, and they were sensible of stillness without motion. Then a blow on the shell shivered it to fragments, and they were blinded with seas of brilliancy on all sides from lamps and tapers and crystals, cornelians and gems of fiery luster, liquid lights and flashing mirrors, and eyes of crowding damsels, bright ones. So when they had risen and could bear to gaze on the insufferable splendor, they saw, sitting on a throne of coral and surrounded by slaves with scimitars, a fair queen, with black eyes, kindlers of storms, torches in the tempest, and with floating tresses, crowned with a circlet of green spiked precious stones and masses of crimson weed with flaps of pearl. And she was robed with a robe of amber, and had saffron sandals, loose, silvery silken trousers tied in at the ankle, the ankle white as silver. Wonderful was the quivering of rays from the jewels upon her, when she but moved a finger. Now as they stood with their hands across their brows, she cried out, O ye traversers of my sea, how is this that I am made to thank Karaz for a sight of ye? And Norna bin Norka answered, Surely, O Queen Rabskarat, the haven of our voyage was at Cleese, and we feared delay, seeing the fire of the mountain ablaze with expectations of us. Then the queen cried angrily, "'Tis well thou hadst wit to close the shell, O Norna, 
or there would have been delay indeed. Say, is not the road to act least through my palace? And it is the road thousands travel. So Norna bin Norka said, O queen, this do they, but are they of them that reach Aklis? And the queen cried violently, purpling with passion, This to me, when I helped ye to the plucking of the lily? Now the queen muttered an imprecation, and called the name Abarak, and lo, a door opened in one of the pillars of Jasper, leading from the throne, and there came forth a little man humped with legs like bows and arms reaching to his feet, in his hand a net weighted with leaden weights. So the queen leveled her finger at Norna, and he spun the net above her head, and dropped it on her shoulder, and dragged her with him to the pillar. When Shibli Bagarag saw that, the world darkened to him, and he rushed upon Abarak. But Norna called swiftly in his ear, Wait! Thou by thy spells art stronger than all here save Abarak. Be true. Remember the seventh pillar. Then with a spurn from the hand of Abarak, the youth fell back senseless at the feet of the queen. Now with the return of consciousness, his hearing was bewitched with strange, delicious melodies, the touch of stringed instruments, and others breathed into softly, as by the breath of love. Delicate, tender, alive, with enamored bashfulness. Surely the soul that heard them dissolved like a sweet in the goblet, mingling with so much ecstasy of sound, and those melodies filling the white cave of the ear, were even at once to drown the soul in delightfulness, and buoy it with bliss, as a heavy-leaved flower is withered and refreshed by sun and dews. Surely the youth ceased not to listen, and oblivion of cares and aught other in this life, save that hidden looting and piping, pillowed his drowsy head. At last there was a pause, and it seemed every maze of music had been wandered through. Opening his eyes hurriedly, as with the loss of the music his own breath had gone likewise, he beheld a garden golden with the light of lamps, hung profusely from branches and twigs of trees, by the glowing cheeks of fruits, apple and grape, pomegranate and quince, and he was reclining on a bank piled with purple cushions, his limbs clad in the richest figured silks, fringed like the ends of clouds round the sun, with amber fringes. He started up, striving to recall the confused memory of his adventures, and what evil had befallen him, and he would have struggled with the vision of these glories, but it mastered him with the strength of a potent drug, so that the very name of his betrothed was forgotten by him, and he knew not whether he would, or the thing he wished for. Now, when he had risen from the soft bank that was his couch, lo, at his feet a damsel weeping, so he lifted her by the hand, and she arose and looked at him, and began plaining of love and its tyrannies, softening him, already softened. Then said she, what I suffer, there is another, lovelier than I, suffering. Thou the cause of it, O cruel youth. He said, How, O damsel, what of my cruelty? Surely I know nothing of it. But she exclaimed, Ah, worse to feign forgetfulness. Now he was bewildered at the words of the damsel, and followed her, leading, till they entered a dell in the garden canopied with foliage. And beyond it a green rise, and on the rise a throne. So he looked earnestly, and beheld thereon, Queen Rabscrat, she sobbing, her dark hair pouring in streams from the crown of her head. Seeing him, she cleared her eyes and advanced to meet him timidly and with hesitating steps. But he shrank from her, and the queen shrieked with grief, crying, Is there in this cold heart no relenting? Then she said to him winningly, and in a low voice, O youth, my husband, to whom I am a bride. He marveled, saying, this is a game, for indeed I am no husband, neither have I a bride. Yet have I confused memory of some betrothal. Thereupon she cried, Said I not so? And I the betrothed? Still he exclaimed, I cannot think it, wallah, it were a wonder. So she said, Consider how a poor youth of excellent proportions came to a flourishing court before one, a widowed queen, and she cast eyes of love on him and gave him rule over her and all that was hers, when he had achieved a task, and they were wedded. Oh, the bliss of it, knit together with bond and a writing, and these were the dominions, I the queen, woe's me, thou the youth. Now he was roiled by the enchantments of the queen, caught in the snare of her beguilings, and he let her lead him to a seat beside her on the throne, and sat there a while in the midst of feastings, mazed, thinking, what life have I lived before this, if the matter be as I behold? Thinking, 
"'Tis true I have had visions of a widowed queen, and I a poor youth that came to her court, and espoused her, sitting in the vacant seat behind her, ruling a realm. But it was a dream, a dream. Yet, wah, here is she, here am I. Yonder my dominions. Then he thought, I will solve it. So on a sudden he said to her beside him, O queen, sovereign of hearts, enlighten me as to a perplexity. She answered, The voice of my lord is music in the ear of the bride. Then said he, in the tone of one doubting realities, O fair queen, is there truly now such a one as Shagpat in the world? She laughed at his speech and the puzzled appearance of his visage, replying, Surely there liveth one, Shagpat by name in the world, strange is the history of him, his friends and enemies, and it would bear recital. Then he said, And one the daughter of a vizier, vizier to the king in the city of Shagpat? Thereat she shook her head, saying, I know not of that one. Now Shibli Bagarag was mindful of his thwackings, and in this the wisdom of Norna is manifest, that the sting of them yet chased away doubts of illusion regarding their having been, as the poet says. If thou wouldest fix remembrance, thwack, tis that oblivion controls, I care not if it be on the back, or on the soles. He thought, wah, yet feel I the thong and the hiss of it as of the serpent in the descent, and the smack of it as the mouth of satisfaction in its contact with tender regions. This, will a high, was no dream. Nevertheless, he was ashamed to elude thereto before the queen, and he said, O oh, my mistress, another question, one only. This shagpat, is he shaved? She said, Clean shorn. Quoth he astonished, grief-stricken, with drawn lips, By which hand chosen above men? And she exclaimed, O oh, thou witty one that feignest not to know, well a high, by this hand of thine, O oh, my lord and king, daring that it is, dexterous, surely so, and the shaving of Shagpat was the task achieved, I the dower of it, and the rich reward. Now he was meshed yet deeper in the net of her subtleties, and by her calling him lord and king, and she gave a signal for fresh entertainments, exhausting the resources of her art, the mines of her wealth, to fascinate him. Ravishments of design and taste were on every side, and he was in the lap of abundance, beguiled by magic, caressed by beauty and a queen. Marvel not that he was dazzled, and imagined himself already come to the great things foretold of him by the readers of planets and the casters of nativities in Shiraz. He assisted in beguiling himself, trusting willfully to the two witnesses of things visible, as is declared by him of wise sayings, there is in every wizard net a hole, so the entangler first must blind the soul. And it is again said by the same teacher, Ye that the inner spirit's sight would seal, not credit but what outward orbs reveal. And the soul of Shibli Bagrag was blinded by Rabskarat in the depths of the enchanted sea. She sang to him, looting deliriously, and he was intoxicated with the blissfulness of his fortune, and took a lute and sang to her, love verses, in praise of her, rhyming his rapture. Then they handed the goblet to each other, and drank till they were on fire with the joys of things, and life blushed beauteousness. Surely Rabscrat was becoming forgetful of her arts through the strength of those draughts, till her eye marked the lily by his side, which he grasped constantly, the bright flower, and she started and said, One grant, O my king, my husband. So he said courteously, all grants are granted to the lovely, the fascinating, and their grief will be lack of aught to ask for. Then said she, O my husband, my king, I am jealous of that silly flower. Laugh at my weakness, but fling it from thee. Now he was about to cast it from him, when a vanity possessed his mind, and he exclaimed, See first the thing I will do, a wonder. She cried, No wonders, my life, I am sated with them. And he said, I am oblivious, O queen, of how I came by this flower and this phial, and thou shalt hear a thing beyond the power of common magic, and see that I am something. Now she plucked at him to abstain from his action, but he held the phial to the flower. She signed imperiously to some slaves to stay his right wrist, and they seized on it. But not all of them together could withhold him from dropping a drop into the petals of the flower, and lo, the lily spake, a voice from it, like the voice of Norna, saying, 
Remember the seventh pillar. Thereat he lifted his eyes to his brows, and frowned back memory to his aid, and the scene of Karaz, Rabskarat, Abarak, and his betrothed was present to him. So perceiving that, the queen delayed not, while he grasped the phial, to take in her hand some water from a basin near, and fling it over him, crying, Oblivion! And while his mind was strained to bring back images of what had happened, he fell forward once more at the feet of Rabskarat, senseless as a stone falls. Such was the force of her enchantments. Now when he awoke the second time, he was in the bosom of darkness, and the lily gone from his hand. So he lifted the phial to make certain of that, and groped about till he came to what seemed an urn to the touch, and into this he dropped a drop, and asked for the lily, and a voice said, I caught a light from it in passing, and he came in the darkness to a tree, and a bejeweled bank, and other urns, and swinging lamps without light, and a running water, and a grassy bank, and flowers, and a silver seat, sprinkling each, and they said all, in answer to this question of the lily, I caught a light from it in passing. At the last he stumbled upon the steps of a palace, and ascended them, endowing the steps with speech as he went, and they said, The light of it went over us. He groped at the porch of the palace, and gave the door a voice, and it opened on jasper hinges, shrieking, The light of it went through me. Then he entered a spacious hall. Scattering drops and voices exclaimed, We glow with the light of it. He passed, groping his way through other halls and dusk chambers, scattering drops, and as he advanced the voices increased in the fervor of their replies, saying sequently, We blush with the light of it, we beam with the light of it, we burn with the light of it. So presently he found himself in a long low room, somberly lit, roofed with crystals, and in a corner of the room, lo, a damsel on a couch of purple, she white as silver, spreading radiance, of such lustrous beauty was she, that beside her, the princess Gorilka, as Shibli Bagrag first beheld her, would have paled like a morning moon. Even Norna had waned as both a flower in fierce heat, and the queen of enchantments was but the sun behind a sandstorm, in comparison with that effulgent damsel on the length of the purple couch. Well for him he wilt of the magic which floated through that palace, as is said, Tempted by extremes, the soul is most secure. To vivid loveliness blinds with its beams, and eyes turned inward perceive the lore. Pulling down his turban hastily, he stepped on tiptoe to within arm's reach of her, and looking another way, inclined over her soft, vermeil mouth the phial, slowly till it brimmed the neck, and dropped a drop of paravid between the bow of those sweet lips. Still not daring to gaze on her, he said then, My question is of the lily, the lily of the sea. And where is it, O oh marvel? And he heard a voice answer in the tones of a silver bell, clear as a wind in the strung wires. Where I lie lies the lily, the lily of the sea. I with it, it with me. Said he, O oh breather of music, tell me how I may lay hand on the flower of beauty to bear it forth. And he heard the voice, An equal space betwixt my right side and my left, and from the shoulder one span and half a span downward. Still without power to eye her, he measured the space and the spans, his hand beneath the coverlids of the couch, and at a spot of the bosom his hand sank in, and he felt a fluttering thing, fluttering like a frighted bird in the mist of the fire. And the voice said, Quick, seize it, and draw it out, and tie it to my feet by the twines of red silk about it. He seized it, and drew it out, and it was a heart, a heart of blood streaming with crimson, palpitating. Tears flashed on his sight beholding it, and pity took the seat of fear and he turned his eyes full on her, crying, O sad fair thing, O creature of anguish, O painful beauty, O what have I done to thee? End of part one of chapter twelve Section eighteen of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE SHAVING OF SHAGPAT BY GEORGE MEREDITH CHAPTER Twelve, PART Two, THE WILES OF RABASCARAT But she panted and gasped, shorter and shorter gasps, pointing with one finger to her feet. Then he took the warm living heart, while it yet leapt, and quivered and sobbed, and he held it with a trembling hand, and tied it by the red twines of silk about it, to her feet, staining their whiteness. 
When that was done, his whole soul melted with pity and swelled with sorrow, and ere he could meet her eyes, a swoon overcame him. Surely when the world dawned to him a third time in those regions, the damsel was no longer there, but in her place the lily of light. He thought, It was a vision, that damsel, a terrible one, one to terrify and bewilder, a bitter sweetness. Oh, the heart, the heart! Reflecting on the heart brought to his lids an overcharging of tears, and he wept violently a while. Then was he warned by the thought of his betrothed to take the lily and speed with it from the realms of Rapscrat, and he stole along the halls of the palace, and by the plashing fountains, and across the magic courts, passing chambers of sleepers, fair dreamers, and through ante-rooms crowded with thick-lipped slaves. Lo, as he held the lily to light him on, and the light of the lily fell on them that were asleep. They paled and shrank, and were such as the death-chill maketh of us. So he called upon his head the protection of Allah, and went swifter, to chase from his limbs the shudder of awe. And there were some that slept not, but stared at him with fixed eyes, eyes frozen by the light of the lily. And he shunned those, for they were like spectres haunting spirits. After he had coursed the length of the palace, he came to a steep place outside it, a rock with steps cut in stairs, and up these he went till he came to a small door in the rock, and lying by it a bar. So he seized the bar, and smote the door, and the door shivered, for on his right wrist were the hairs of Garavine. Bending his body, he slipped through the opening, and behold, an orchard dropping with blossoms and ripe golden fruits, streams flowing through it over sands, and brooks bounding above glittering gems, and long dewy grasses, profusion of scented flowers, shade and sweetness. So he let himself down to the ground, which was an easy leap from the aperture, and walked through the garden, holding the lily behind him, for here it darkened all, and the glowing orchard was a desert by its light. Presently his eye fell on a couch swinging between two almond trees, and advancing to it he beheld the black-eyed queen gathered up, folded temptingly, like a swaying fruit. She with the gold circlet on her head, and she was fair as blossom of the almond in a breeze of the wafted rose-leaf. Sweetly was she gathered up, folded temptingly, and Shibli Bagarag refrained from using the lily, thinking, "'Tis like the great things foretold of me, this having of queens within the very grasp, swinging to and fro as if to taunt backwardness. Then he thought, "'Tis an enchantress. I will yet try her.' So he made a motion of flourishing the lily once or twice, but forbore fascinated, for she had on her fair face the softness of sleep, her lips closed in dimples, and the wicked fire shut from beneath her lids. Mastering his mind, the youth at last held the lily to her, and saw a sight to blacken the world, and all bright things with its hideousness. Scarce had he time to thrust the lily in his robes, when the queen started up and clapped her hands, crying hurriedly, "'Abarak! Abarak!' and the little man appeared in a moment at the door by which Shebli Bagarag had entered the orchard. So she cried still, Abarak! and he moved toward her. Then she said, How came this youth here, prying in my private walks, my bowers? Speak! He answered, By the aid of Garavine only, O queen, and there is no force resisteth the bar so wielded. Rapscrat looked under her brows at Shibli Bagarag, and saw the horror on his face, and she cried out to Abarak in an agony, "'Fetch me the mirror!' Then Abarak ran and returned ere the queen had drawn seven impatient breaths, and in one hand he bore a sack, and the other a tray. So he emptied the contents of the sack on the surface of the tray. Surely they were human eyes, and the queen flung aside her tresses and stood over them. The youth saw her smile at them, and assume tender and taunting manners before them, and imperious manners, killing glances, till in each of the eyes there was a sparkle. Then she flung back her head, as one that feedeth on a mighty triumph, exclaiming, Yet I am Rabsgarat, wide is my sovereignty. Sidewise, when she regarded Shibli Bagrag, and it seemed she was urging Abarak to do a deed beyond his powers, he frowning and pointing to the right wrist of the youth, so she clenched her hands an instant with that feeling which knocketh a nail in the coffin of a desire not dead, and controlled herself, and went to the youth, breaking into beams of beauty. And an enchanting sumptuousness breathed round her, so that in spite of himself he suffered her to take him by the hand, 
and lead him from that orchard through the shivered door and into the palace and the hall of the jasper pillars. Strange thrills went up his arm from the touch of that queen, and they were as little snakes twisting and darting up, biting poison bites of irritating blissfulness. Now the hall was spread for a feast, and it was hung with lamps of silver, strewn with great golden goblets and viands, colored meats, and ordered fruits on shining platters. Then said she to Shibli Bagrag, O youth, there shall be no deceit, no guile between us. Thou art but my guest, I no bride to thee, so take the place of the guest beside me. He took his seat beside her, Abarak standing by, and she helped the youth to this dish and that dish, from the serving of slaves, caressing him with flattering looks to starve aversion and nourish tender fellowship. And he was like one that slideth down a hill, and can arrest his descent with a foot, yet faileth that free will. When he had eaten and drunk with her, the queen said, O youth, no other than my guest, art thou not a prince in the country thou comest from? In a moment the pride of the barber forsook him, and he equivocated, saying, O queen, there is among the stars somewhere, as was divined by the readers of planets, a crown hanging for me, and I search a point of earth to intercept its fall. She marked him beguiled by vanity, and put sweetmeats to his mouth, exclaiming, Thy manners be those of a prince. Then she sang to him of the loneliness of her life, and of one with whom she wished to share her state, such as he, and at her signal came troops of damsels that stood in rings, and looted swiftly on the same theme the queen's loneliness, her love, and he said to the queen, Is this so? She answered, Too truly so. Now he thought, She shall at least speak the thing that is, if she look it not. So he took the goblet, and contrived to drop a drop from the phial of Paravid, therein without her observing him, and he handed her the goblet, she him, and they drank. Surely the change that came over the queen was an enchantment, and her eyes shot luster, her tongue was loosed, and she laughed like one intoxicated, lolling in her seat, lost to majesty and the sway of her magic, crying, O oh, Abarak, Abarak, little man, long my slave and my tool, ugly little man, and O oh, Shibli Bagarag, nephew of the barber, weak youth, small prince of the tackle, have I not nigh fascinated thee? And thou wilt forfeit these two silly eyes of thine to the sack, and O oh, Abarak, Abarak, little man, have I flattered thee? So fetter I the strong with my allurements, and I stay the arrow in its flight, and I blunt the barb of high intents. Wah! I have drunk a potent stuff. I talk, walla high. I know there is a danger menacing Shagpat, and the eyes of all genii are fixed on him. And if he be shaved, what changes will follow? But tis in me to delude the barber, walla high, and I will avert the calamity. I will shave Shagpat. While the queen Rabscrap prated in this wise, with flushed face, Shibli Bagarag was smitten with the greatness of his task, and reproached his soul with neglect of it, and he thought, I am powerful by spells as none before me have been, and twas by my weakness the queen sought to tangle me. I will clasp the seventh pillar, and make an end of it, by Allah and his prophet, praised be the name, and I will reach Aklis by a short path, and shave Shagpat with the sword." So he looked up, and Abarak was before him, the lifted nostrils of the little man wide with the flame of anger. And Abarak said, O oh, youth, regard me with the eyes of judgment. Now is it not frightful to rate me little, an instigation of the evil one to repute me ugly? The promptings of wisdom counseled Shibli Bagarak to say, Frightful beyond contemplation, O oh, Abarak, one to shame our species. Surely there is a moon between thy legs, a pear upon thy shoulders, and the cock that croweth is no match for thee in measure. Abarak cried, We be aggrieved, we two. O youth, son of my uncle, I will give thee means of vengeance. Give thou me means. Shibli Bagrag felt scorn at the queen in her hollowness, and he said, Tis well, take this lily and hold it to her. Now the queen jeered Abarak, and as he approached her she shouted, What, thou small of build, might of creation, sour mixture, Thou puppet of mine, thou, comest thou to seek a second kiss against the compact, knowing that I give not the well-favoured of mortals beyond one a second? Little delayed Abarak at this point to put her to the test of the lily, and he held the flower to her, and saw the sight, and staggered back like one stricken with a shaft. When he could get a breath he uttered such a howl, 
that Rabsgerat, in her drunkenness, was fain to save her ears, and the hall echoed as with the bellows of a thousand beasts of the forest. Then, to glut his revenge, he ran for the sack, and emptied the contents of it, the queen's mirror before her, and the sack full of eyes. They saw the sight and sickened, rolling their whites. That done, Abarak gave Shibli Bagarag the bar of iron, and bade him smite the pillars, all save the seventh, and he smote them strengthily, crumbling them at a blow, and bringing down the great hall in its groves in glasses and gems, lamps, traceries, devices, a heap of ruin, the seventh pillar alone standing. Then, while he pumped back breath into his body, Abarak said, There's no delaying in this place now, O youth. Say, halt thou spells for the entering of Achilles? He answered, Three. Then said Abarak, Tis well. Surely now, if thou takest me in thy service, I'll help thee to master the event, and serve thee faithfully, requiring naught from thee save a sight of the event, and tis I that myself missed one, wild by Rabsgrat. Quoth Shibli Bagarag, Thou? He answered, No word of it now. Is to greed? So Shibli Bagarag cried, Even so. Thereupon the twain entered the pillar, leaving Rabsgrat prone, and the waves of the sea bounding toward her where she lay. Now they descended and ascended flights of slippering steps, and sped together along murky passages, in which light never was, and under arches of caves with hanging crystals, groping and tumbling on hurriedly, till they came to an obstruction, and felt an iron door, frosty to the touch. Then Abarak said to Shibli Bagarag, Smite! And the youth lifted the bar to his right shoulder and smote, and the door obeyed the blow, and discovered an opening into a strange dusky land, as it seemed a valley, on one side of which was a ragged copper sun setting low, large as a warrior's battered shield, giving deep red lights to a brook that fell, and over a flat stream a red reflection, and to the sides of the hills a dark red glow. The sky was a brown color, the earth a deeper brown, like the skins of tawny lions. Trees with reddened stems stood about the valley, scattered and in groups, showing between their leaves the cheeks of melancholy fruits, swarthily tinged, and toward the center of the valley a shining palace was visible, supported by massive columns of marble, reddened by that copper sun. Shibli Bagrag was awed at the stillness that hung everywhere, and said to Abarak, Where am I, O Abarak? The look of this place is fearful. And the little man answered, Where but beneath the mountains in Aklis? Well, the high, I should know it, I that keep the passage of the seventh pillar. Then the thought of his betrothed, Norna, and her beauty, and the words, Remember the seventh pillar, struck the heart of Shibli Bagrag, and he exclaimed passionately, Is she in safety, Norna, my companion, my betrothed, netted by thee, O Abarak? Abarak answered sharply, Speak not of betrothals in this place, or the sword of Achilles will move without a hand. But Shibli Bagrag waxed the color of the sun that was over them, and cried, by Allah, I will spite thee with the bar, if thou swear not to her safety, and point not out to me where she is now. Then said Abarak, Thou wilt make a better use of the bar by lifting it to my shoulder and poising it, and peering through it. Shibli Bagarag lifted the bar to the shoulder of Abarak, and poised it, and peered through the length of it, and lo, there was a sea tossing in tumult, and one pillar standing erect in the midst of the sea, and on the pillar, above the washing waves, with hair blown back and flapping raiment, pale but smiling still, Norna his betrothed. Now when he saw her, he made a rush to the door of the passage, but Abarak blocked the way, crying, Fool, a step backward in Achilles is death. And when he had wrestled with him and reined him, Abarak said, Haste to reach the sword from the sons of Achilles, if thou wouldst save her. He drew him to the brink of the stream, and whistled a parrot's whistle and Shibli Bagrag beheld a boat draped with drooping white lotuses that floated slowly toward them, and when it was near, he and Abarak entered it, and saw one, a veiled figure, sitting in the stern, who neither moved to them nor spake, but steered the boat to a certain point of land across the stream, where stood an elephant, ready girt for travellers to mount him, and the elephant kneeled among the reeds as they approached, that they might mount him, and when they had each taken a seat, moved off, waving his trunk." Presently the elephant came to a halt, and went upon his knees again, and the two slid off his back, and were among black slaves that bowed to the ground before them, and led them to the shining gates of the palace in silence. 
Now on the first marble step of the palace there sat an old white-headed man dressed like a dervish, who held out at arm's length a branch of gold with golden singing birds between its leaves, saying, This for the strongest of ye. Abrak exclaimed, I am that one, and he held forth his hand for the branch. But Shibli Bagarag cried, Nay, tis mine, wallah high. What has not the strength of this hand overthrown? Then the brows of Abarak twisted, his limbs twitched, and he bawled, To the proof! Waking all the echoes of Aklis, Shibli Bagarag was tempted in his desire for the golden branch to lift the iron bar upon Abarak, when, lo, the file of Paravid fell from his vest, and he took it, and sprinkled a portion of the waters over the singing birds, and in a moment they burst into a sweet union of voices, singing in the words of the poet, When for one serpent were two asses match, how shall one foe but with wiles master double? So let the strong keep for ever good watch, lest their strength prove a snare and themselves a mere bubble. For vanity maketh the strongest most weak, as lions and men totter after the struggle. Ye heroes be modest, while combat ye seek. The cunning one trippeth, ye both with a juggle. Now at this verse of the birds, Shibli Bagarag fixed his eyes on the old man, and the beard of the old man shriveled. He waxed in size, and flew up in a blaze, and with a baffled shout, bearing the branch. Surely his features were those of Karaz, and Shibli Bagarag knew him by the length of his limbs, his stiff ears and copper skin. Then he laughed a loud laugh, but Abarak sobbed, saying, By this know I that I never should have seized the sword even though I had vanquished the illusions of Rapscrat, which held me fast halfway. So Shibli Bagrag stared at him and said, Wert thou also a searcher, O Abarak? But Abarak cried, Rouse not the talkative tongue of the past, O youth, Wallahai, relinquish the bar that is my bar, won by me, for the sword is within thy grip, and they await thee up yonder steps. Go, go, and look for me here on thy return. End of part two of chapter twelve. Section nineteen of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter thirteen. The Palace of Aklis. Now, Shibli Bagarag assured himself of his three spells, and made his heart resolute, and hastened up the red and marble steps of the palace, and when he was on the topmost step, lo, one with a man's body and the head of a buffalo, that prostrated himself, and prayed the youth obsequiously to enter the palace with the title of king. So Shibli Bagarag held his head erect, and followed him with the footing of a sultan, and passed into a great hall, with fountains in it that were fountains of gems, pearls, chrysolites, thousand-hued jewels, and by the margin of the fountains there were shapes of men with the heads of beasts, wolves, foxes, lions, bears, oxen, sheep, serpents, asses, that stretched their hands to the falls, and loaded their vestments with brilliance, loading them without cessation, so that from the vestments of each there was another pouring of the liquid lights. Then he, with the buffalo's head, bade Shibli Bagarag help himself from the falls, but Shibli Bagarag refused, for his soul was with Noorna, his betrothed, and he saw her pale on that solitary pillar in the tumult of the sea, and knew her safety depended on his faithfulness. He cried, The sword of Aklis, not save the sword. Now, at these words the fox heads and the sheep heads and the ass heads and the other heads of beasts were lifted up, and lo, they put their hands to their ears, and tapped their foreheads with the finger of reflection, as creatures seeking to bring to mind a serious matter. Then the fountains rose higher, and flung jets of radiant jewels, and a drenching spray of gems upon them, and new thirst aroused them to renew their gulping of the falls, and a look of eagerness was even in the eyes of the ass-heads and the silly sheep-heads. Surely Shibli Bagarag laughed to see them. Now, when he had pressed his lips to recover his sight from the dazzling of those wondrous fountains, he heard himself again addressed by the title of king, and there was before him a lofty cock with a man's head. So he resumed the majesty of his march, and followed the fine-stepping cock into another hall, spacious, and clouded with heavy scents and perfumes burning in censers and urns, musk, myrrh, ambergris, and livelier odors, gladdening the nostril like wine, 
making the soul reel with a draught of the forbidden drink. Here, before a feast that would prick the dead with appetite, were shapes of beasts with heads of men, asses, elephants, bulls, horses, swine, foxes, river horses, dromedaries, and they ate and drank as do the famished with munch and gurgle, clacking their lips joyfully. Shibli Bagarag remembered the condition of his frame when first he looked upon the city of Shagpat, and was incited to eat and accede to the invitation of the cock with the man's head, and sit among these merry feeders and pickers of mouth-watering morsels, when, with the city of Shagpat, lo, he had a vision of Shagpat, hairier than at their interview, arrogant in his hairiness, his head remote in contemptuous waves and curls and frizzes, and bushy protuberances of hair, lost in it, like an idolatrous temple in impenetrable thickets. Then the yearning of the barber seized Shibli Bagarag, and desire to shear Shagpat was as a mighty overwhelming wave in his bosom, and he shouted, The sword of Aklis, naught save the sword. Now, at these words the beast with men's heads wagged their tails, all of them, from right to left, and kept their jaws from motion, staring stupidly at the dishes. But the dishes began to send forth stealthy steams, insidious whispers to the nose, silver intimations of savouriness, so that they on a sudden set up a howl, and Shibli Bagarag puckered his garments from them, as from devouring dogs, and hastened from that hall to a third, where at the entrance a damsel stood that smiled to him, and led him into a vast marbled chamber, forty cubits high, hung with draperies, and in it a hundred doors, and he was in the midst of a very rose garden of young beauties, such as the blessed behold in paradise, robed in the colors of the rising and setting sun, plump, with long, black, languishing, almond-shaped eyes, and undulating figures. So they cried to him, What greeting, O our king? Now, he counted twenty and seven of them, and fitting his gallantry to verse, answered, Poor are the heavens that have not ye, to swell their glowing plenty. Up there but one bright moon I see, here I mark seven and twenty. The damsels laughed, and flung back their locks at his flattery, sporting with him, and he thought, These be sweet maidens, I will know if they be illusions like Orbescorat. So, as they were romping, he slung his right arm round one, and held the lily to her, but there was no change in her save that she winked somewhat, and her eyes watered, and it was so with the others, for when they saw him hold the lily to one, they made him do so to them likewise. Then he took the phial, and touched their lips with the waters, and lo, they commenced luting and laughing, and singing verses, and prattling, laughing between whiles at each other, and one, a noisy one, with long, black, unquiet tresses, and a curved foot and roguish ankle, sang as she twirled, My heart is another's, I cannot be tender, yet if thou storm it, I fain must surrender. And another, fresh-cheeked, fair-haired, full-eyed damsel, strong upon her instep and stately in the bearing of her shoulders, sang shrilly, I'm of the mountains, and he that comes to me, like eagle must win, and like hurricane woo me. And another, reclining on a couch buried in dusky silks, like a butterfly under the leaves, a soft ball of beauty, sang moaningly, Here, like a fruit on the branch, I am swaying. Snatch ere I fall, love, there's death in delaying. And another, light as an antelope on the hills, with antelope eyes edged with coal, and timid, graceful movements, and small, white, rounded ears, sang clearly, Swiftness is mine, and I fly from the sordid. Follow me, follow, and you'll be rewarded. And another, with large limbs and massive mould, that stepped like a cow leisurely cropping the pasture, and shook with jewels amid her black hair and above her brown eyes, and round her white neck and her wrists, and on her waist, even to her ankle, sang as with a kiss upon every word, Sweet tis in stillness and bliss to be basking, he who would have me may have for the asking. And another, with eyebrows like a bow, and arrows of fire in her eyes, and two rosebuds her full, moist, parted, pouting lips, sang, clasping her hands, and voiced like the tremulous, passionate bulbul in the shadows of the moon. Love is my life, and with love I live only. Give me life, lover and leave me not lonely. And a seventh, a very beam of beauty, and the perfection of all that is imagined in fairness, and ample grace of expression and proportion, lo, she came straight to Shibli Bagarag, 
and took him by the hand and pierced him with lightning glances, singing, Were we not destined to meet by one planet? Can a fate sever us? Can it? Ah, can it? And she sang tender songs to him, mazing him with blandishments, so that the aim of existence and the summit of ambition now seemed to him the life of a king in that palace among the damsels, and he thought, Wah, these be no illusions, and they speak the thing that is in them. Wallahi, loveliness is their portion, they call me king. Then she that had sung to him said, Surely we have been waiting thee long to crown thee our king. Thou hast been in some way delayed, O glorious one. And he answered, O fair ones, transcending in affability, I have stumbled upon obstructions in my journey hither, and I have met with adventures, but of this crowning that was to follow them I knew not. Wallahi, thrice have I been saluted king, I whom fate selecteth for the shaving of Shagpat, and till now it was a beguilement, all emptiness. They marked his bewildered state, and some knelt before him, some held their arms out adoringly, some leaned to him with glistening looks and he was fast falling a slave to their flatteries, succumbing to them. Imagination fired him with the splendors due to one that was a king, and the thought of wearing a crown again took possession of his soul, and he cried, Crown me, O my handmaidens, and delay not to crown me, for, as the poet says, the king without his crown hath a forehead like the clown, and the circle of my head itcheth for the symbols of majesty. At these words of Shibli Bagarag, they arose quickly, and clapped their hands, and danced with the nimble step of gladness, exclaiming, O oh, our king, pleasant will be the time with him. And one smoothed his head, and poured oil upon it, one brought him garments of gold and silk inwoven, one fetched him slippers like the sun's beam in brightness, others stood together in clusters, and with lutes and wood instruments, low-toned, singing odes to him, and lo, one took a needle and threaded it, and gave the thread into the hands of Shibli Bagarag, and with the point of the needle she pricked certain letters on his right wrist, and afterwards pricked the same letters on a door in the wall. Then she said to him, Is it in thy power to make those letters speak? He answered, We will prove how that may be. So he flung some drops from the phial over the letters, and they glowed the color of blood and flashed with a report, and it was as if a fiery forked tongue had darted before them, and spake the words written, and they were, this is the crown of him who hath achieved his aim and resteth here. Thereupon she stuck the needle in the door, and he pulled the thread, and the door drew apart, and lo, a small chamber, and on a raised cushion of blue satin, a glittering crown, thick with jewels as a frost, such as ambition pineth to wear. And the knees of men weaken and bend beholding, and it lanced lights about it like a living sun. Beside the cushion was a vacant throne, radiant as morning in the east, ablaze with devices in gold and gems, a seat to fill the meanest soul with sensations of majesty, and tempt dervishes to the sitting posture. Shibli Bagarag was intoxicated at the sight, and he thought, Wah! But if I sit on this throne, and am a king, with that crown I can command men and things. And I have but to say, Fetch Noorna, my betrothed, from yonder pillar in the midst of the uproarious sea. Let the hairy shagpat be shaved, and behold, slaves, thousands of them, do my bidding. Wallahi, this is greatness. Now he made a rush to the throne, but the damsels held him back, crying, Not for thy life till we have crowned thee, our master and lord. Then they took the crown and crowned him with it, and he sat upon the throne calmly, serenely, like a sultan of the great race accustomed to sovereignty, tempering the awfulness of his brows with benignant glances. So while he sat, the damsels hid their faces, and started some paces from him, as unable to bear the splendor of his presence, and, in a moment, lo, the door closed between him and them, and he was in darkness. Then he heard a voice of the damsels cry in the hall, The ninety and ninth, peace now for us, and blissfulness with our lords, for now all are filled save the door of the sword, which maketh the hundredth. After that he heard the same voice say, Leave them, O my sisters. So he listened to the noise of their departing, and knew he had been duped. Surely his soul cursed him as he sat crowned and throned in that darkness. He seized the crown to dash it to the earth, but the crown was fixed on his forehead and would not come off. Neither had he forced to rise from the throne. Now the thought of Noorna his betrothed, where she rested waiting for him to deliver her, filled Shibli Bagarag with the extremes of anguish. 
and he lifted his right arm and dashed it above his head in the violence of his grief, striking in the motion a hidden gong that gave forth a burst of thunder and a roll of bellowings. And lo, the door opened before him, and the throne, as he sat on it, moved out of the chamber into the hall, where he had seen the damsels that duped him. And on every side of the hall doors opened, and he marveled to see men, old and young, beardless and venerable, sitting upon thrones and crowned with crowns, motionless, with eyes like stones in the recesses. He thought, These be other dupes. Wallahi, a drop of the waters of Paravid upon their lips might reveal mysteries, and guide me to the sword of my seeking. So, as he considered how to get at them from the seat of his throne, his gaze fell on a mirror, and he beheld the crown on his forehead, what it was, bejeweled asses' ears stiffened upright, and skulls of monkeys grinning with gems. The sight of that, crowning his head, convulsed Shibli Bagarag with laughter, and, as he laughed, his seat upon the throne was loosened, and he pitched from it, but the crown stuck to him, and was tenacious of its hold as the lion that pounceth upon a victim. He bowed to the burden of necessity, and took the phial, and touched the lips of one that sat crowned on a throne, with the waters in the phial. And it was a man of exceeding age, whitened with time, and in the long sweep of his beard, like a mountain clad with snow from the peak that is in the sky, to the base that slopeth to the valley. Then he addressed the old man on his throne, saying, Tell me, O king, how camest thou here, and in search of what? The old man's lips moved, and he muttered in deep tones, when cometh he of the ninety and ninth door? So Shibli Bagarag cried, Surely he is before thee, in Aklis. And the old man said, Let him ask no secrets, but when he hath reached the sword, forget not to flash it in this hall, for the sake of brotherhood in adventure. After that he would answer no word to any questioning. End of chapter 13 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 20 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 14. The Sons of Aklis. Now, Shibli Bagarag thought, The poet is right in Aklis as elsewhere in his words, The cunning of our oft-neglected wit doth best the keyhole of occasion fit. And whoso looketh for help from others, looketh the wrong way in an undertaking. Wah! I will be bold and batter at the hundredth door, which is the door of the sword. So he advanced straight away to the door, which was one of solid silver, charactered with silver letters, and knocked against it three knocks, and a voice within said, What spells? He answered, Paravid, Garavine and the lily of the sea. Upon that the voice said, Enter by virtue of the spells, and the silver door swung open, discovering a deep pit, lightened by a torch, and across it, bridging it, a string of enormous eggs, rocks' eggs, hollowed, and so large that a man might walk through them without stooping. At the side of each egg three lamps were suspended from a claw, and the shell passage was illumined with them from end to end. Shibli Bagrag thought, These eggs are of a surety the eggs of the rock, mastered by Aklis with his sword. Now, as the sight of Shibli Bagarag grew familiar to the place, he beheld at the bottom of the pit a fluttering mass of blackness, and two sickly eyes that glittered below. Then thought he, Wah! If that be the rock, and it not dead, will the bird suffer one to defile its eggs with other than the sole of the foot, naked? He undid his sandals and kicked off the slippers given him by the damsels that had duped him, and went into the first egg over the abyss, and into the second, and into the third, and into the fourth, and into the fifth. Surely the eggs swung with him, and bent, and the fear of their breaking and he falling into the maw of the terrible bird made him walk unevenly. When he had come to the seventh egg, which was the last, it shook and swung violently and he heard underneath the flapping of the wings of the rock, as with eagerness expecting a victim to prey upon. He sustained his soul with the firmness of resolve, and darted himself lengthwise to the landing, clutching a hold with his right hand. As he did so, the bridge of eggs broke, and he heard the feathers of the bird in agitation, and the bird screaming a scream of disappointment as he scrambled up the sides of the pit. 
Now, Shibli Bagarag failed not to perform two prostrations to Allah and raise the song of gratitude for his preservation when he found himself in safety. Then he looked up, and lo, behind a curtain steps leading to an anteroom, and beyond that a chamber like the chamber of kings, where they sit in state, dispensing judgments, like the sun at noon in splendor. And in the chamber seven youths, tall and comely young men, calm as princes in their port, each one dressed in flowing robes, and with a large glowing pearl in the front of their turbans. They advanced to meet him, saying, Welcome to Aklis, thou that art proved worthy. Tis holiday now with us. And they took him by the hand, and led him with them in silence past fountain jets and porphyry pillars, to where a service with refreshments was spread, meats, fowls with rice, sweetmeats, preserves, palatable mixtures, and monuments of the cook's art, goblets of wine, like liquid rubies. Then one of the youths said to Shibli Bagarag, Thou hast come to us crowned, O our guest. Now it is not our custom to pay homage, but thou shalt presently behold them that will. So let not thy kingliness droop with us, but feast royally. And Shibli Bagarag said, O my princes, surely it is a silly matter to crown a mouse. Humility hath depressed my stature. Wallahi, I have had warning in the sticking of this crown to my brows, and it sticketh like an abomination. They laughed at him, saying, It was the heaviness of that crown which overweighted thee in the bridge of the abyss, and few be they that bear it and go not to feed the rock. Now they feasted together, interchanging civilities, offering to each other choice morsels, dainties. And the anecdotes of Shibli Bagarag, his simplicity and his honesty, and his vanity and his airiness, and the betraying tongue of the barber, diverted the youths, and they plied him with old wine till his stores of merriment broke forth, and were as a river swollen by torrents of the mountain. And the seven youths laughed at him, spluttering with laughter, lurching with it. Surely he described to them the loquacity of Baba Mustafa, his uncle, and they laughed so that their chins were uppermost. But at his mention of Shagpat, greater gravity was theirs, and they smoothed their faces solemnly, and the sun of their merriment was darkened for a while. Then they took to flinging about pellets of a sugared preparation, and reciting verses in praise of jovial living, challenging to drink this one and that one, passing the cup with a stanza. Shibli Bagarag thought, What a life is this led by these youths, a fair one! Tis they that be the sons of Aklis, who sharpen the sword of events. Yet they live in jollity, skimming from the profusion of abundance that which floateth. Now, marking him contemplative, one of the youths shouted, The king lacketh homage! And another called, Admittance for his people! Then the seven arose and placed Shibli Bagarag on an elevation in the midst of them. And lo! a troop of black slaves leading by the collar asses, and by a string monkeys. Now for the asses they brayed to the evil one, and the monkeys were prankish, pulling against the string, till they caught sight of Shibli Bagarag. Then was it as if they had been awe-stricken, and they came forward to him with docile steps, eyeing the crown on his head, and prostrated themselves, the asses and the monkeys, like creatures in whom glowed the lamp of reason and the gift of intelligence. So Shibli Bagarag drooped his jaw and was ashamed, and he cried, my princes, am I a king of these? They answered, A king in mightiness, sultan of a race. So he said, It is certain I shall need physic to support such a sovereignty, and I must be excused liberal allowances of old wine to sit in state among them. Wallahi, they were best gone for a while. Send them from me, O my princes. I sicken. And he called to the animals, Away, be gone, frowning. Then said the youths, well commanded, and like a king. See, they troop from thy presence obediently. Now the animals fled from before the brows of Shibli Bagarag, and when the chamber was empty of them, the seven young men said, Of a surety thou wert flattered to observe the aspect of these animals at beholding thee. But he cried, Not so, O my princes, there is not flattering in the homage of asses and monkeys. Then they said, O sultan of asses, ruler of monkeys, better that than thyself an ass and an ape. As was said by Shah Kasarwan, I prefer being king of beasts worshipped by beasts, rather than a crowned beast worshipped by men, and it was well said. Wallahi, the kings of Rome quote it. Now Shibli Bagarag was not rendered oblivious of the sword of his quest by the humour of these youths, or the wine-bibbings, and he exclaimed while they were turning up the heels of their cups, O ye sons of Aklis! Know that I have come hither for the sword sharpened by your hands, for the releasing of my betrothed, Norna bin Nurka, daughter of the vizier Feshnavat, and for the shaving of Shagpat. 
while he was proceeding to recount the story of his search for the sword they said enough o potentate of the braying class and of the scratching tribe we have seen thee through the eye of Aklis since the time of thy first thwacking what says the poet a day for toil and a day for rest gives labor zeal and pleasure zest so of thy seeking let us hear to-morrow but now drink with us and make merry and touch the springs of memory spout forth verses quaint ones suitable to the hour and the entertainment wallahi drink with us taste life let the humours flow then they made a motion to some slaves and presently a clattering of anklets struck the ear of shibli bagarag and he beheld dancing girls moons of beauty and elegance and they danced wild dances and dances graceful and leopard-like and serpent-like in movement and the youths flung flowers at them applauding them then came other sets of dancers even lovelier more languishing and again others with tambourines and musical instruments that sang ravishingly so the senses of shibli bagarag were all taken with what he saw and heard and ate and drank and by degrees a mist came before his eyes and the sweet sounds and voices of the girls grew distant and it was with difficulty he kept his back from the length of the cushions that were about him then he thought of noorna and that she sang to him and danced and when she rose to embrace her she was rabeskarat by the light of the lily and he thought of shagpat and that in shaving him the blade was checked in its rapid sweep and blunted by a stumpy twine of hair that waxed in size and became the head of karaz that gulped at him a wide devouring gulp and took him in and flew up with him leaving shagpat half sheared then he thought himself struggling halfway down the throat of the monstrous rock and that when he was wholly inside the rock he was in a wide arched passage crowded with lamps and at the end of the passage noorna in the clutch of karaz shouting the sword the sword now while he felt for the sword wherewith to release her from the genie his eyes opened and he saw day through a casement and that he had reposed on an embroidered couch in the corner of a stately room ornamented with carvings of blue and gold so while he wondered and yawned gaping slaves started up from the floor and led him to a bath of colored marble and bathed him in perfumed waters and dressed him in a dress of yellow silk rich and ample then they paraded before him through lesser apartments and across terraces till they came to a great hall loftier and more spacious than any he had yet beheld with fountains at the two ends and in the centre a tree with golden spreading branches and leaves of gold among the leaves gold-feathered birds and fruits of all seasons and every description the drooping grape and the pleasant-smelling quince and the blood-red pomegranate and the apricot and the green and rosy apple and the gummy date and the oily pistachio nut and peaches and citrons and oranges and the plum and the fig surely they were countless in number melting with ripeness soft full to bursting and the birds darted among them like sun flashes now shibli bagarag thought this is a wondrous tree wallahi there was not like it save the tree in the hall of the prophet in paradise feeding the faithful as he regarded it he heard his name spoken in the hall and turning he beheld seven youths in royal garments that were like the youths he had feasted with and yet unlike them pale and stern in their manners their courtesy as the courtesy of kings they said sit with us and eat the morning's meal o our guest so he sat with them under the low branches of the tree and they whistled the tune of one bird and of another bird and of another and lo those different birds flew down with golden baskets hanging from their bills and in the baskets fruits and viands and sweetmeats and cool drinks and shibli bagarag ate from the baskets of the birds watching the action of the seven youths and the difference that was in them he sought to make them recognize him and acknowledge their carouse of the evening that was past but they stared at him strangely and seemed offended at the illusion neither would they hear mention of the sword of his seeking presently one of the youths stood upon his feet and cried the time for kings to sit in judgment and the youths arose and led shibli bagarag to a hall of ebony and seated him on the upper seat themselves standing about him and lo asses and monkeys came before him complaining of the injustice of men and their fellows in brays and bellows and hoots now at the sight of them again shibli bagarag was enraged and he said to the youths how do you not mock me o masters of aklis but they said only the burden of his crown is for the king he cooled thinking i will use a spell so he touched the lips of an animal with the waters of paravid and the animal prated volubly in our language of the kick this ass had given him and the gibe of that monkey and of his desire of litigation with such and such a beast for pasture and the others when they spake had the same complaints to make 
Shibli Bagarag listened to them gravely, and it was revealed to him that he who ruleth over men hath a labor and duties of hearing and judging and dispensing judgment, similar to those of him who ruleth over apes and asses. Then he said, O youths, my princes, methinks the sitting in this seat giveth a key to secret sources of wisdom, and I see what it is, the glory and the exaltation coveted by men. Now he took from the asses and the monkeys one, and said to it, Be my chief vizier, and to another, Be my chamberlain and to another, be my treasurer, and so on, till a dispute arose between the animals, and jealousy of each other was visible in their glances. And they appealed to him clamorously. So he said, What am I to ye? They answered, Our king. And he said, How so? They answered, By the crowning of the brides of Aklis. Then he said, What be ye, O my subjects? They answered, men that were searchers of the sword and plunged into the tank of temptation. And he said, How that? They answered, By the lures of vanity, the blinding of ambition, and tasting the gall of the rock. So Shibli Bagarag leaned to the seven youths, saying, O my princes, but for not tasting the gall of the rock, I might be as one of these. Wallahi, I the king am warned by base creatures. Then he said to the animals, Have ye still a longing for the crown? And they cried, all of them, O light of the astonished earth, we care for naught other than it. And so he said, And is it known to ye how to dispossess the wearer of his burden? They answered, By a touch of the gall of the rock on his forehead. Then he lifted his arms, crying, High out of my presence, and whoso of ye fetcheth the drop of the gall, with that one I will exchange the crown. At these words some moved hastily, but the most faltered, as doubting and incredulous that he would propose such an exchange, and one, an old monkey, sat down and crossed his legs, and made a study of Shibli Bagarag, as of a sovereign that held forth a deceiving bargain. But he cried again, Hi, and haste, as my head is now cased, I think it not the honoured part. Then the old monkey arose with a puzzled look, half scornful, and made for the door slowly, turning his head toward Shibli Bagarag between whiles as he went and scratching his lower limbs with a mute reflectiveness of age and extreme caution. Now, when they were gone, Chibli Bagarag looked in the eyes of the seven youths, and saw they were content with him, and his countenance was brightened with approval. So he descended from his seat, and went with them from the hall of ebony to a court where horses were waiting saddled, and slaves with hawks on their wrists stood in readiness, and they mounted each a horse, but he loitered. The seven youths divined his feeling, and cried impatiently, Come! no lingering in Aklis. So he mounted likewise, and they emerged from the palace and entered the hills that glowed under the copper sun, and started a milk-white antelope with ruby spots, and chased it from its cover over the sand hills, a hawk being let loose to worry it, and distress its timid beaming eyes. When the creature was quite overcome, one of the youths struck his heel into his horse's side and flung a noose over the head of the quarry, and drew it with them, gently petting it the way home to the palace. At the gates of the palace it was released, and, lo, it went up the steps and passed through the halls as one familiar with them. Now, when they were all assembled in the anteroom of the hall where Shibli Bagarag had first seen the seven youths, sons of Aklis, in their jollity, one of them said to the antelope, We have need of thee to speak a word with Aklis, O our sister. So the same youth requested the use of the file of Paravid, and Shibli Bagarag applied it carefully, tenderly, to the mouth of the antelope. Then the antelope spake in a silver-ringing voice, saying, What is it, O my brothers? They answered, Thou knowest we dare not attempt interchange of speech with Aklis, seeing that we disobeyed him in visiting the kingdoms of the earth. So it is for thee to question him as to the object of this youth, and it is the shaving of Shagpat. So she said, Tis well, I wot of it. Then she advanced to the curtain, concealing the abyss of the rock and the bridge of its eggs, and went behind it. There was a pause, and they heard her say presently in a grave voice, toned with reverence, How is it, O our father? Is it a good thing that thy sword be in use at this season? And they heard the voice answer from a depth, Twere well, it rust not. They heard her say, O our father Aklis, and we wish to know if be held in favour by thee, and thou sanction it with thy sword. And they heard the voice answer, The shaving of Shagpat is my sword alone equal to, and he that shaveth him performeth a service to mankind ranking next to my vanquishing of the rock. Then they heard her say, And it is thy will we teach him the mysteries of the sword, and that which may be done with it? And they heard the voice answer, Even so. 
After that the voice was still, and soon the antelope returned from behind the curtain, and the youths caressed her with brotherly caresses, and took a circle of hands about her, and so moved to the great hall of the gorgeous tree, and fed her from the branches. Now, while they were there, Shibli Bagarag advanced to the antelope, and knelt at her feet, and said, O Princess of Aklis, surely I am betrothed to one constant as a fixed star, and brighter, a mistress of magic, and innocent as the bleating lamb, and she is now on a pillar, chained there, in the midst of the white wrathful sea, wailing for me to deliver her with this sword of my seeking. So, now, I pray thee, help me to the sword swiftly, that I may deliver her. The youths, her brothers, clamoured and interposed, saying, Take thy shape ere that, O Gulrevaz, our sister. But she cried, He is betrothed, not till he graspeth the sword. Tell him, the youth, our conditions, and for what exchange the sword is yielded. And they said, The conditions are, thou part with thy spells, all of them, O youth. And he said, there is no condition harsh that exchangeth the sword. O ye seven, I agree. Then she said, Tis well. Nobility is in the soul of this youth. Go before us now to the cave of chrysolites, O my brothers. So these departed before, and she in her antelope form followed footing gracefully, and made Shibli Bagarag repeat the story of his betrothal as they went. End of chapter 14 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 21 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 15. The Sword of Aklis. Now, when they had made the passage of many halls built of different woods, filled with diverse wonders, they descended a sloping vault, and came to a narrow way in the earth, hung with black, at the end of it a steadfast blaze like a sun, that grew larger as they advanced, and they heard the sea above them. The noise of it, and its plunging and weltering and its pitilessness, struck on the heart of Shibli Bagarag as with a blow, and he cried, Haste, haste, O princess, perchance she is even now calling to me with her tongue, and I not aiding her, delayed by the temptation of this crown and the guile of the brides. She checked him, and said, In Aklis, no haste. Then she said, Look. And lo, fronting them the single blaze became two fires, and drawing nigh, Shibli Bagarag beheld them what they were, angry eyes in the head of a great lion, a model of majesty. And passion was in his mane, and power was in his forepaws. So while he lashed his tail as a tempest whippeth the tawny billows at night, and was lifting himself for a roar, she said, a hair of Garavine, and touch him with it. Shibli Bagarag pushed up his sleeve, and broke one of the three sapphire hairs, and stepped forward to the lion, holding in his right hand the hair of vivid light. The lion crouched, and was in the vigor of the spring when that hair touched him, and he trembled, tumbling on his knees and letting the twain pass. So they advanced beyond him, and lo, the cave of chrysolites, irradiate with beams, breaks of brilliance, confluences of lively hues, restless rays, meeting, vanishing, flooding splendors, now scattered in dazzling joints and spars, now uniting in momentary disks of radiance. In the center of the cave glowed a furnace, and round it he distinguished the seven youths, swarthier and sterner than before, dark sweat standing on the brows of each. Their words were brief, and they wore each a terrible frown, saying to him, without further salutation, Thrust in the flame of this furnace thy right wrist. At the same moment the antelope said in his ear, Do thou their bidding, and be not backward. In Aklis fear is ruin, and hesitation a destroyer. He fixed his mind on the devotedness of Nurna, and held his nether lip tightly between his teeth, and thrust his right wrist in the flame of the furnace. The wrist reddened, and became transparent with heat, but he felt no pain, only that his whole arm was thrice its natural weight. Then the flame of the furnace fell, and the seven youths made him kneel by a brook of golden waters, and dip his forehead up to his eyes in the waters. Then they took him to the other side of the cave, and his sight was strengthened to mark the glory of the sword, where it hung in slings, a little way from the wall, outshining the lights of the cave, and throwing them back with its superior force and steadfastness of luster. Lo, 
The length of it was the length of crimson across the sea when the sun is sideways on the wave and it seemed a full mile long, the whole blade sheening like an arrested lightning from the end to the hilt. The hilt two large live serpents twined together with eyes like sombre jewels, and sparkling spotted skins, points of fire in their folds, and reflections of the emerald and topaz and ruby stones, studded in the blood-stained haft. Then the seven young men, sons of Aklis, said to Shibli Bagarag, Surrender the lily! And when he had given into their hands the lily, they said, grasp the handle of the sword. Now he beheld the sword and the ripples of violet heat that were breathing down it, and those two venomous serpents twined together, and the size of it, its ponderousness, and to assay lifting it, appeared to him a madness. But he concealed his thought, and, setting his soul on the safety of Nurna, went forward to it boldly, and piercing his right arm between the twists of the serpents, grasped the jeweled haft. Surely, the sword moved from the slings, as if a giant had swayed it. But what amazed him was the marvel of the blade, for its sharpness was such that nothing stood in its way, and it slipped through everything as we passed through still water, the stone columns, blocks of granite by the walls, the walls of earth, and the thick solidity of the ground beneath his feet. They bade him say to the sword, Sleep, and it was no longer than a knife in the girdle. Likewise they bade him hiss on the heads of the serpents, and say, Wake, and while he held it lengthwise, it shot lengthening out. Then they bade him hold in one hand the sapphire hair that conquered the lion, and with the edge of the sword touch one point of it. So he did that, and it split in half, and the two halves he also split, and he split those four and those eight, till the hairs were as thin as light and not distinguishable from it. When Shibli Bagarag saw the power of the sword, he exulted and cried, Praise be to the science of them that forecast events and the haps of life. Now in the meantime he marked the youths take those hairs of Garavine that he had split, and tie them round the neck of the antelope, and empty the contents of the phial down her throat, and they put the bulb of the lily that was a heart in her mouth, and she swallowed it till the flower covered her face. Then they took each a handful of the golden waters of the brook flowing through the cave, and flung the waters over her, exclaiming, By the three spells that have power in Aklis, and by which these waters are a blessing. In the passing of a flash she took her shape, and was a damsel taller than the tallest of them that descend from the mountains, a vision of loveliness with queenly brows, closed red lips, and large full black eyes, her hair black, and on it a net of amber strung with pearls. To look upon her was to feel the tyranny of love, love's pangs of alarm and hope and anguish, and she was dressed in a dress of white silk, threaded with gold and sapphire, showing in shadowy beams her rounded figure, and the stateliness that was hers. So she ran to her brothers and embraced them, calling them by their names, catching their hands, caressing them, as one that had been long parted from them. Then, seeing Shibli Bagarag as he stood transfixed with the javelins of loveliness that flew from her on all sides, she cried, What, O master of the event, halt thou not for the sword but to gaze before thee in silliness? Then he said, O rare in beauty, marvel of Aklis and the world, surely the paradise of eyes is thy figure and the glory of thy face. But she shouted, To work with the sword, shame on thee! Is there not one, a bright one, a miracle in faithfulness that awaiteth thy rescue on the pillar? And she repeated the praises he had spoken of Nurna bin Nurka, his betrothed. Then he grasped the sword firmly, remembering the love of Nurna, and crying, Lead me from this, O ye sons of Aklis, and thou, Princess Gulravaz, Lead me, that I may come to her. So they said, Follow us. And he sheathed the sword in his girdle with the word sleep, and followed them, his heart beating violently. End of chapter 15 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 22 of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 16. Karuk. Now they sped from the cave of Chrysolites by another passage than that by which they entered it, and nothing but the light of the sword to guide them. By that light Shibli Bagarag could distinguish glimmering shapes, silent and statue-like to the right and the left of them, their visages hidden in a veil of heavy webs. 
and he saw what seemed in the dusk broad halls, halls of council, and again black pools and black groves, and columns of crowded porticos, all signs of an underground kingdom. They came to some steps and mounted these severally, coming to a platform in the middle of which leapt a fountain, the top spray of it touched with a beam of earth, and the air breathed by men. Here he heard the youths dabble with the dark waters, and he discerned Gulveraz, tossing it in her two hands, calling, Karuk, Karuk. Then they said to him, Stir this fountain with the sword, O master of the event. So he stirred the fountain, and the whole body of it took a leap toward the light, that was like the shoot of a long lance of silver in the moon's rays, and lo, in its place the ruffled feathers of a bird. Then the seven youths, and the princess, and Shibli Bagarag, got up under its feathers like a brood of waterfowl, and the bird winged straight up as doth a blinded bee, ascending and passing in the ascent, a widening succession of winding terraces, till he observed the copper sun of Aklis and the red lands below it. Thrice in the exuberance of his gladness he waved the sword, and the sun lost that dullness on its disk and took a bright flame, and threw golden arrows everywhere, and the pastures were green, the streams clear, the sands sparkling. The bird flew and circled and hung poised a moment, presently descending on the roof of the palace. Now there was here a piece of solid glass, propped on two crossed bars of gold, and it was shaped like an eye, and might have been taken for one of the eyes inhabiting the head of some monstrous genie. Shibli Bagarag ran to it when he was afoot, and peered through it. Surely it was the first object of his heart that he beheld. Norna, his betrothed, pale on the pillar, she with her head between her hands and her hair scattered by the storm as one despairing. Still he looked, and he saved swimming round the pillar that monstrous fish, with its sole baleful eye, which had gulped them both in the closed shell of magic pearl, and he knew the fish for Karaz, the genie, their enemy. Then he turned to the princess with an imploring voice of counsel, how to reach her and bring her rescue. But she said, The sword is in thy hands, none of us dare wield it. And the seven youths answered likewise. So left to himself he drew the sword from his girdle and hissed on the heads of the serpents, at the same time holding it so that it might lengthen out inimitably. Then he leaned it over the eye of glass in the direction of the pillar besieged by the billows, and lo, with one cut, even at that distance, he divided the fishy monster, and with another severed the chains that had fettered Norna. And she arose and smiled blissfully to the sky, and stood upright, and signaled him to lay the point of the blade on the pillar. When he had done this, knowing her wisdom, she put a foot boldly upon the blade, and ran up it toward him and she was half-way up the blade, when suddenly a kite darted down upon her, pecking at her eyes to confuse her. She waxed unsteady and swayed this way and that, balancing with one arm and defending herself from the attacks of the kite with another. It seemed to Shibli Bagarag she must fall and be lost, and the sweat started on his forehead in great drops big as nuts. Seeing that in the agitation of his limbs, Gulravaz cried, O oh, master of the event, let us hear it. But he shrieked, The kite, the kite, she is running up the blade, and the kite is at her eyes, and she's swaying, swaying, falling, falling. So the princess exclaimed, A kite, Karuk, is match for a kite. Then she smoothed the throat of Karuk, and clasped round it a collar of bright steel, roughened with secret characters, and she took a hoop of gold, and passed the bird through it, urging it all the while with one strange syllable. And the bird went up with a strong whirr of the wing, till he was over the sea, and caught sight of Norna tottering beneath him on the blade, and the kite pecking fiercely at her. Thereat he fluttered eagerly a twinkle of time, and the next was down with his beak in the neck of the kite, crimsoned in it. Now by the shouts and exclamations of Shibli Bagarag, the princess and the seven youths, her brothers, knew that the bird had performed well his task, and that the fight was between Karuk and the kite. Then he cried gladly to them, Joy for us, and Allah be praised! 
the kite is dropping, and she leaneth on one wing of Karuk. And he cried in anguish, What see I? The kite is become a white ball, rolling down the blade toward her, and it will of a surety destroy her. And he called to her, thinking vainly his voice might reach her. So the princess said, A white ball? Tis I that am match for a white ball. Now she seized from the corner of the palace roof a bow and an arrow, and her brothers lifted her to a level with the hilt of the sword, leaning on the eye of glass. Then she planted one foot on the shoulder of Shibli Bagrag, as he bent peering through the eye, and fitted the arrow to a level of the sword, slanting it slant, and let it fly, doubling the bow. Shibli Bagarag saw the ball roll to within a foot of Norna, when it was as if stricken by a gleam of light, and burst, and was a black cloud veined with fire, swathing her in folds. He lost all sight of Norna, and where she had been were vivid flashes, and then a great flame, and in the mist a red serpent and a green serpent, twisted as in the death struggle. So he cried, A red serpent and a green serpent! And the sons of Akhlis exclaimed, A red serpent? Tis we that are match for a red serpent. Thereupon they descended steps through the palace roof, and while the fight between those two serpents was raging, Shibli Bagarag beheld seven small bright birds, bee-catchers, that entered the flame, bearing in their bills slips of an herb, and hovering about the heel of the red serpent, distracting it. Then he saw the red serpent hiss and snap at one, darting out its tongue, and lo, on the fork of its tongue the little bird let fall the slip of herb in its bill, and in an instant the serpent changed from red to yellow, and from yellow to pale spotted blue, and from that to a speckled indigo color, writhing at every change and hissing fire from its open jaws. Meantime the green serpent was released and was making circles round the flame, seeking to complete some enchantment, when suddenly the whole scene vanished, and Shibli Bagarag again beheld Norna steadying her steps on the blade and leaning on one wing of Karuk. She advanced up the blade, coming nearer and nearer, and he thought her close, and breathed quick, and ceased looking through the glass. When he gazed abroad, lo, she was with Karuk, on a far hill beyond the stream in outer Aklis. So he said to the princess, Galravaz, O princess, comes she not to me here in the palace? But the princess shook her head, and said, She hath not a spell. She waiteth for thee yonder, with Karuk. Now look through the glass once more. He looked through the glass, and there on a plain, as he had first seen it when Norna appeared to him, was the city of Shagpat, and in the streets of the city a vast assembly, and a procession passing on, its front banner surmounted by the crescent, and bands with curled and curved instruments playing, and slaves scattering gold and clashing cymbals, every demonstration and evidence of a great day and a high occasion in the city of Shagpat. So he peered yet keenlier through the glass, and behold, the vizier Feshnavat, father of Norna, walking in fetters, subject to the jibes and evil speaking of the crowds of people, his turban off, and he in a robe of drab-colored stuff, in the scorned condition of an unbeliever. Shibli Bagarag peered yet more earnestly through the glass eye, and in the center of the procession, clad gorgeously in silks and stuffs, woven with gold and gems, a crown upon his head, and the appanages of supremacy and majesty about him, was Shagpat. He paced upon a yellow flooring that was unrolled before him from a mighty roll, and there were slaves that swarmed on all sides of him, supporting upon gold pans and platters, the masses of hair that spread bushily before and behind, and to the right and left of him. Truly the gravity of his demeanour exceeded that which is attained by sheiks and dervishes, after much drinking of the waters of wisdom, and fasting, and abnegation of the pleasures that betray us to the folly in this world. Now when he saw Shagpat, the soul of Shibli Bagarag was quickened to do his appointed work upon him, shear him, and release the vizier Feshnavat, Desire to shave Shagpat was as a salt thirst raging in him, as the dream of munching to one that starveth, even as the impelling of violent tempests to skiffs on the sea. And he hungered to be at him, crying as he peered, "'Tis he, even he, Shagpat!' 
Then he turned to the Princess Gulravaz and said, "'Tis Shagpat exalted, clothed with majesty, O thou morning star of Aklis. She said, Karuk is given thee, and waiteth to carry ye both, and for me I will watch that this glass send forth a beam to light ye to that city. So farewell, O thou that are loved, and delay in nothing to finish the work in hand. Now when he had set his face from the princess, he descended through the roof of the palace, and met the seven youths returning, and they accompanied him through the halls of the palace, to that hall where the damsels had duped him. He was mindful of his promise to the old man crowned, and flashed the sword a strong flash, so that he who looked on it would be seared in the eyelashes. Then the doors of the recesses flew apart, eighty and ninety in number, and he beheld diverse sitters on thrones, with the diadem of asses' ears stiffened upright, and monkey skulls grinning with gems, they having on each countenance the look of sovereigns and the serenity of high estate. Shibli Bagarag laughed at them, and he thought, Wallahi, was I one of these? I, the beloved of Norna, destined master of the event? And he thought, Of a surety, if these sitters could but laugh at themselves, there would be a release for them, and the crown would topple off which getteth the homage of asses and monkeys. He would have spoken to them, but the son of Aklis said, They have seen the flashing of the sword, and twore well they wake not. As they went from the hall, the seven youths said, Reflect upon the age of these sitters, that have been sitting in the chairs from three to eleven generations back, and they were searchers of the sword like thee, but were duped. In like manner the hen sitteth in complacency, but she bringeth forth and may cackle. "'Tis owing to the aids of Norner that thou art not one of these sitters, O master of the event. Now they paced through the hall of dainty provender, and through the hall of jewel fountains, coming to the palace steps, where stood Abarak leaning on his bar. As they advanced to Abarak, there was a clamor in the halls behind, that gathered in noise like a torrent, and approached, and presently the master was ware of a sharp stroke on his forehead, with a hairy finger, and then a burn, and the crown that had clung to him toppled off. Surely it fell upon the head of the old monkey, the cautious and wise one, he that had made a study of Shibli Bagarag. Thereupon that monkey stalked scornfully from them, and Abarak cried, O master of the event, it was better for me to keep the passage of the seventh pillar than be an ape of this order. Wah! The flashing of the sword scorcheth them, and they scamper. End of chapter 16《Section 23 of The Shaving of Shakpat》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn. The Shaving of Shakpat by George Meredith. Chapter 17 The Veiled Figure. Verily there was lightning in a cliss as Shibli Bagarag flashed the sword over the clamoring beasts. The shape of the great palace stood forth vividly, and a wide illumination struck up the streams, and gilded the large hanging leaves, and drew the hills glimmeringly together, and scattered fires on the flat faces of the rocks. Then the seven youths said quickly, Away, out of Aklis, O master of the event! From city to city of earth this light is visible, and men will know that fate is in travail, and an event preparing for them, and Shakpat will be warned by the portent. Wherefore, lose not the happy point of time on which thy star is manifest. And they cried again, Away, out of a cliss, with gestures of impatience urging his departure. Then he said, O youths, sons of a cliss, it is written that gratitude is the poor man's mine of wealth and the rich man's flower of beauty. And I have but that to give ye for all this aid and friendliness of yours. But they exclaimed, no aid or friendliness in Aklis. By the gall of the rock, it is well for thee thou camest armed with potent spells, and hadst one to advise and inspirit thee, or thou wouldst have stayed here to people Aklis, and grazed in a strange shape. Now the seven waxed in impatience, and he laid their hands upon his head, and moved from them with Abarak, to where in the dusk the elephant that had brought them stood. 
Then the elephant kneeled and took the twain upon his back, and bore them across the dark land to that reach of the river where the boat was moored in readiness. They entered the boat silently among its drapery of lotuses, and the veiled figure ferried them over the stream that rippled not with their motion. As they were crossing, desire to know that veiled figure counselled Shibli Bagarag evilly to draw the sword again and flash it so that the veil became transparent. Then, when Abarak turned to him for the reason of the flashing of the sword, he beheld the eyes of the youth fixed in horror, gazing as at sights beyond the tomb. He said not, but as the boat's head whispered among the reeds and long flowers of the opposite marge, he took Shibli Bagarak by the shoulders and pushed him out of the boat, and leaped out likewise, leading him from the marge forcibly, hurrying him forward from it, he at the heels of the youth propelling him, and crying in out-of-breath voice at intervals, What sight? What sight? But the youth was powerless of speech, and when at last he opened his lips, the little man shrank from him, for he laughed as do the insane. A peal of laughter ended by gasps, then a loud appeal, presently softer, then a peal that started all the echoes in Aklis. After a while, as Barak still cried in his ear, What sight? He looked at him with a large eye, saying querulously, Is it written I shall be pushed by the shoulder through life? And is it in the pursuit of further thwackings? Abarak heeded him not, crying still, What sight? And Shibli Bagarag lowered his tone and jerked his body, pronouncing the name, Rabes Kwarath. Then Abarak exclaimed, Tis as I weaned, O fool, to flash the sword and peer through the veil. Truly, there be few wits will bear that sight. On a sudden he cried, No cure but one, and that asleep in the bosom of the betrothed. Thereupon he hurried the youth yet faster across the dark lawns of Aklis towards the passage of the seventh pillar by which the twain had entered that kingdom. And Shibli Bagarag saw as in a dream the shattered door, shattered by the bar, remembering dimly as a thing distant in years the netting of the queen, and Noorna chained upon the pillar. He remembered Shakpat even vacantly in his mind as one sheaf of barley amid other sheaves of the bearded field. So was he overcome by the awfulness of that sight behind the veil of the veiled figure. As they advanced to the passage, he was aware of an impediment to its entrance, as it had been a wall of stone there, and seeing Abarak enter the passage without let, he kicked hard in front at the invisible obstruction, but there was no coming by. Abarak returned to him and took his right arm and raised the sleeve from his wrist, and lo, the two remaining hairs of Garavin twisted around it in sapphire winds. Cried he, O oh, the generosity of Gulrivaz, she has left these two hairs that he may accomplish swiftly the destiny marked for him. But now, since his gazing through the veil, he must part with them to get out of a cliss. And he muttered, His star is a strange one, one that leadeth him to fortune by the path of frowns, to greatness by the aid of thwackings. Truly the ways of Allah are wonderful. Shibli Bagarag resisted him in nothing, and Abarak loosed the two bright hairs from his wrist, and these two hairs swelled and took glittering scales, and were sapphire snakes with wings of intense emerald. And they rose in the air spirally together, each over each, so that to see them one would fancy in the darkness a fountain of sapphire waters flashed with the sheen of emerald. When they had reached a height loftier than the topmost palace towers of Aklis, they descended like javelins into the earth, and in a moment reappeared in the shape of genie, when they are charitably disposed to them they visit. Not much above the mortal size, nor over bright, save for a certain fire in their eyes when they turned them. And they were clothed each from head to foot in an armour of sapphire plates shot with steely emerald. Surely the dragonfly that darteth all day in the blaze over pools is like what they were. Abarak bit his forefinger and said, who be ye, O sons of brilliance? They answered, Karavijis and Vijravush, slaves of the sword. Then he said, Come with us now, O slaves of the sword, and help us to the mountain of outer Aklis. They answered, O thou, there be but two means for us of quitting Aklis, on the wrist of the master or down the blade of the sword. And from the wrist of the master we have been loosened, and no one of thy race can tie us to it again. Abarak said, how then shall the master leave Aklis? 
they answered. By Allah and Eccles, he can carve a way whither he will with the sword. But Abarak cried, O Karavejis and Vitravush, he hath peered through the veil of the faring figure. Now when they heard his words, the visages of the genie darkened, and they exclaimed sorrowfully, Serve we such a one? And they looked at Shibli Bagarag, a look of anger, so that he, whose wits were in past occurrences, imagined them his enemy and the foe of Noonna split in two, crying, How? Is Karaz a couple, and do I multiply him with strokes of the sword? Thereupon he drew the sword from his girdle in wrath, flourishing it, and Karavijis and Vijravush felt the might of the sword, and prostrated themselves to the ground at his feet. And Abarak said, Arise, and bring us swiftly to the mountain of outer Eclis. Then they said, Seek a passage down yonder brook in the moonbeams, and it is the sole passage for him now. Abarak went with them to the brook that was making watery music to itself, between banks of splintered rock and over broad slabs of marble, bubbling here and there about the roots of large-leaved water-flowers, and catching the mirrored moon of Eclis in whirls, breaking it in lances. Then they waded into the water knee-deep, and the two genie seized hold of a great slab of marble in the middle of the water, and under was a hollow brimmed with the brook, that the brook partly filled and flowed over. Then the genie said to Abarak, Plunge! And they said the same to Shibli Bagarag. The swayer of the sword replied, as it had been a simple occasion, a common matter, and a thing for the exercise of civility, with pleasure and all willingness. Thereupon he tightened his girth, and arrowing his two hands, flung up his heels and disappeared into the depths, the barak following. Surely those two went diving downward, till it seemed to each there was no bottom in the depth, and they would not cease to feel the rushing of the water in their ears, till the time anticipated by mortals. End of chapter 17 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 24 of The Shaving of Shakpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn The Shaving of Shakpat by George Meredith Chapter 18 The Bosom of Noorna Now while a thousand sparks of fire were bursting on the sight of the two divers, and they speeded, heels uppermost to the destiny marked out for them by the premeditations of the all-wise. Lo, Noorna was on the mountain in outer Eclis with Kuruk, waiting for the appearance of a betrothed sword in hand. She saw beams from the blazing eye of Eclis, and knew by the redness of it that one, a mortal, was peering on the earth and certain of created things. So she waited a while in patience for the return of a betrothed, with the head of Kuruk in her lap, caressing the bird and teaching it words of our language, and the bird fashioned its bill to the pronouncing of names such as Noorna, and Feshnavat, and Gurelka, and it said Karaz, and stuck not at the name Shakpat. And it learned to say even, Shakpat shall be shaved, Shakpat shall be shaved, but no effort of Noorna could teach it to say Shibli Bakarad, the bird calling instead Shiparak, Shiplabarak, Shiblishabarak, and Noorna chid it with her forefinger, crying, O Kuruk, wilt thou speak all names but that one of my betrothed? So she said again, Shibli Bagarag, and the bird answered, imitating its best, Shiberakavarak. Noorna was wrought with it, crying, O naughty bird, is the name of my beloved hateful to thee? And she chid Kuruk angrily, he with a heavy eye sulking, and keeping the sullen feathers close upon its pole. Now she thought, there is in this a meaning, and I will fathom it. So she counted the letters in the name of a betrothed, that were thirteen, and spelt them backwards, afterwards multiplying them by an equal number, and fashioning words from the selection of every third and seventh letter. Then took she the leaf from a tree, and bade Kuruk fly with her to the base of the mountain, sloping from a cliff to the sea, and there wrote with a pin's point on the leaf the words fashioned, dipping the leaf in the salt ripple by the beach till they were distinctly traced, and it was revealed to her that Shibli Bagarag bore now a name that might be uttered by none, 
for that the bearer of it had peered through the veil of the faring figure in Eclis. When she knew that, her grief was heavy, and she sat on the cold stones of the beach and among the bright shells, weeping in anguish, losing her hair, scattering it wildly, exclaiming, Awahi, woe on me! Was ever man more tired than he before entering Eclis, he that was in turns abased and beloved and exalted, yet his weakness clingeth to him even in Eclis, and with the wondrous sword in his grasp. Then she thought, Still he had strength to wield the sword, for I marked the flashing of it, and twas he that leaned forward the blade to me, and he possesses the qualities that bring one gloriously to the fruits of enterprise. And she thought, Of a surety, if a bark be with him, and a single of the three slaves of the sword that I released from the tail of Garavin, Ravijura, Karavijis, and Vijravush, he will yet come through, and I may revive him in my bosom for the task. So thinking upon that, the sweet crimson surprised her cheeks, and she arose and drew Kuruk with her along the beach till they came to some rocks piled ruggedly and the waves breaking over them. She mounted these and stepped across them to the entrance of a cavern where flowed a full water swiftly to the sea, rolling smooth bulks over and over and with a translucent light in each, showing precious pebbles in the bed of the water below, a gates of size, limpid cornelians, plates of polished jet, rubies, diamonds, innumerable that were smitten into sheen by slant rays of the level sun, the sun just losing its circle behind lustrous billows of that enchanted sea. She turned to Kuruk a moment, saying with a coax of smiles, Will my bird wait here for me even at this point? Kuruk clapped both his wings and she said again, patting him, he will keep watch to pluck me from the force of water as I roll past, that I be not carried to sea and lost. Kuruk still clapped his wings, and she entered under the arch of the cavern. It was roofed with crystals, a sight of glory, with golden lamps at intervals, still centers of a thousand beams. Taking the sandal from her left foot, and tucking up the folds of her trousers to the bend of her clear white knee, she advanced, half wading up the winds of the cavern, and holding by the juts of granite here and there, till she came to a long straight lane in the cavern, and at the end of it, far down, a solid pillar of many-coloured water that fell into the current, as it had been one block of gleaming marble from the roof without ceasing. Now she made toward it, and fixed her eye verily wide on it, and it was bright, flawless in brilliancy, but while she gazed, a sudden blot was visible, and she observed in the body of the fall two dark objects plumping downward one after the other like bolts, and they splashed in the current and were carried off by the violence of its full sweep, shooting by her where she stood rapidly. But she, knotting her garments round the waist to give her limbs freedom and swiftness, ran a space and then bent and plunged, catching as she rose the foremost to her bosom and whirled away under the flashing crystals, like a fish scaled with splendours that hath darted and seized upon a prey, and is bearing it greedily to some secure corner of the deeps to swallow the quivering repast at leisure. Surely the heart of Noorna was wise of what she bore against her bosom, and it beat exulting strokes in the midst of the rush and roar and gurgle of the torrent, and the gulping sounds and multitudinous outcries of the headlong water. That verse of the poet would apply to her where he says, Lead me to the precipice, and bid me leap the dark abyss. I care not what the danger be, so, my beloved, my beauteous vision, be but the prize I bear with me, for she to paradise can turn perdition. Praise be to him that planted love, the worker of this marvel within us. Now she sped in the manner narrated through the mazes of the cavern, coming suddenly to the point at the entrance where perched Kuruk gravely upon one leg, like a bird with an angling beak. He caught at her as she was hurtling toward the sea, and drew her to the bank of rock, that burden on her bosom, and it was Shibli Bagarag her betrothed. His eyes closed, his whole countenance colourless. Behind him, like a shadow, streamed a bark, and Noorna kneeled by the waterside and fetched the little man from it likewise. He was without a change, as if drawn from a familiar element, 
and when he had prostrated himself thrice and called on the prophet's name in the form of thanksgiving he wrung his beard of the wet and had wit to bless the action of noorna that saved him then the two raised shibli bagarak from the rock and reclined him lengthwise under the wings of kuruk and noorna stretched herself there beside him with one arm about his neck the fair head of the youth on her bosom and she said to abarak he hath dreamed many dreams my betrothed but never one so sweet as that i give him already see the hue returneth to his cheek and the dimples of pleasure so was it and she said mount o thou of the net and the bar and stride kuruk across the neck for it is nigh the setting of the moon and by dawn we must be in our middle flight seen of men a cloud over them said abarak to hear is to obey he bestrode the neck of kuruk and sat with dangling feet till she cried rise and the bird spread its wings and flapped them wide rising high in the silver rays and flying rapidly forward with the tree on him from the mountain in front of a cliff and the white sea with its enchanted isles and wonders flying and soaring till the earth was as what might be held in the hollow of the hand and the kingdoms of the earth a mingled heap of shining dust in the midst end of chapter 18 recording by gabriel glen section 25 of the shaving of shakpat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gabriel glen The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith, Chapter Nineteen. The Revival. Now, the feathers of Kuruk in his flight were ruffled by a chill breeze, and they were speeding through a light glow of cold rose color. Then said Noorna, "Tis the messenger of morning, the blush. Oh, what changes will date from this day!" The glow of rose became golden, and they beheld underneath them, on one side, the rim of the rising red sun, and rays streaming over the earth and its waters. And Noorna said, "I must warn Feshnavat, my father, and prepare him for our coming." So she plucked a feather from Kuruk and laid the quill downward, letting it drop. Then said she, "Now for the awakening of my betrothed." Thereupon she hugged his head a moment and kissed him on the eyelids, the cheeks, and the lips, crying, "By this means only!" Crying that she pushed him sliding from the back of the bird, and he parted from them, falling head foremost in the air like a stricken eagle. Then she called to Kuruk, "Seize him!" And the bird slanted his beak and closed his wings. The two, Abarak and Noorna, clinging to him tightly. and he was down like an arrow between shibli bagarag and the ground spreading beneath him like a tent and noorna caught the youth gently to her lap then she pushed him off again intercepting his descent once more till they were on a level with one of the mountains of the earth from which the city of shakpat is visible among the yellow sands like a white spot in the yolk of an egg so by this time the eyes of the youth gave symptoms of a desire to look upon the things that be peeping faintly beneath the lashes and she exclaimed joyfully raising her white hands above her head one plunge in the lake and life will be his again below them was a green lake tinted by the dawn with crimson and yellow deep and with high banks as they crossed it to the middle she slipped off the youth from kuruk and he with a great plunge was received into the stillness of the lake meanwhile kuruk quivered his wings and seized him when he arose bearing him to an end of the lake where stood one dressed like a devrish and it was the wazir feshnavat the father of noorna so when he saw them he shouted the shout of congratulation catching noorna to his breast and shibli bagarag stretched as doth a heavy sleeper in his last doze saying in a yawning voice what trouble i wot there is not more for us now that shakpat is shaved Oh I have had a dream a dream he that is among huris in paradise dreameth not a dream like that and i dreamed tis gone then said he staring at them who be ye what is this noorna took him again to her bosom and held him there and she plucked a herb 
and squeezed it till a drop from it fell on either of his lids, applying to them likewise a dew from the serpents of the sword, and he awoke to the reality of things. Surely then he prostrated himself and repeated the articles of his faith, taking one hand of his betrothed and kissing her, and he embraced Abarak and Feshnavat, saying to the father of Noorna, I know, O Feshnavat, that by my folly and through my weakness I have lost time in this undertaking. But it shall be short work now with Shagpat. This thy daughter, the eclipser of reason, was ever a prize as she? I will deserve her. Vullahi, I am now a new man, sprung like fire from ashes. Lo, I am revived by her for the great work. Said Abarak, O master of the event, secure now without delay the two slaves of the sword and lean the blade toward Eclis. Upon that, he ran up rapidly to the summit of the mountain, and drew the sword from his girdle, and leaned it towards Eclis, and it lengthened out over lands, the blade of it a beam of solid brilliance. Presently, from forth the invisible remoteness, they saw the two genii, Karavejis and Vijravush, and they were footing the blade swiftly like stars, speeding up till they were within reach of the serpents of the hilt, when they dropped to the earth, bowing their heads. So he commanded them to rise, crying, Search ye the earth and its confines, and bring hither tidings of the genie Karaz. They said, To hear is to obey. Then they began to circle round each other, circling more and more sharply, till beyond the stretch of sight, and Shibli Bagarak said to Feshnavat, Am I not awake, O Feshnavat? I will know where is Karaz, ere I seek to operate on Shatpat, for it is well spoken of the poet, Obstructions first remove, ere thou thy cunning prove. And I will encounter this caress that was our ass, ere I try the great shave. Then he said, turning quickly, Yonder is a light from a cliss, striking on the city, and I mark Shagpat, even he, illumined by it, singled out where he sitteth on the roof of the palace by the marketplace. So they looked, and it was as he had spoken that Shagpat was singled out in the midst of the city by the wondrous beams of the eye of Aklis, and made prominent in effulgence. Said Abarak, climbing to the level of observation, He hath a redness like the inside of a halved pomegranate. Feshnavad stroked his chin, exclaiming, He may be likened to a mountain goat in the midst of a forest, roaring with conflagration. Said Shibli Bagarag, now is he the red-maned lion, the bristling boar, the uncombed buffalo, the plumaged cock, but soon will he be like nothing else save the wrinkled kernel of a shaggy fruit. Lo, now the sword, it leapeth to be at him, and twill be as the keen icicle of winter to that perishing foliage, that doomed crop. So doth the destined minute destroy with a flash the hoarded arrogance of ages, and the destined hand doeth what creation failed to perform, and tis by order, destiny, and preordainment that the works of this world come to pass. This know I, and I witness thereto that am of a surety ordained to the shaving of Shagpat. Then he stood apart and gazed from Shagpat to the city that now began to move with the morning. Elephants and coursers, saddled by the gates of the king's palace, were visible, and camels blocking the narrow streets and the markets bustling. Surely, though, the sun illumined that city. It was as a darkness behind Shakpat, singled by the beams of a cliss. End of chapter 19 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 26 of The Shaving of Shakpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 20. The Plot. Now, while Shibli Bagarag gazed on Shagpat, kindled by the beams of Aklis, lo, the genie, Karavijis and Vijravush, circling each other in swift circles like two sapphire rings toward him, and they whirled to a point above his head and fell and prostrated themselves at his feet. So he cried, O ye slaves of the sword, my servitors, how of the whereabout of Karaz? They answered, O master of the event, we found him after many circlings far off, 
and twas by the borders of the putrid sea. We came not close on him, for he is stronger than we without the sword. But it seemed he was distilling drops of an oil from certain substances, large, thickened drops that dropped into a phial. Then Shibli Bagarag said, The season of weakness with me is over, and they that confide in my strength, my cunning, my watchfulness, my wielding of the sword, have naught to fear for themselves. Now this is my plot, O Feshnavat, that part of it in which thou art to have a share. Tis that thou depart forthwith to the city yonder, and enter thy palace by a back entrance, and I will see that thou art joined within an hour of thy arrival there by Baba Mustafa, my uncle the gabbler. He is there, as I guess by signs. I have had warnings of him. Discover him speedily. Thy task is then to induce him to make an attempt on the head of Shagpat in all wiliness, as he and thou think well to devise. He will fail, as I know. But what is that saying of the poet? Persist, if thou wouldst truly reach thine ends, for failures oft are but advising friends. And he says, Every failure is a step advanced, to him who will consider how it chanced. Wherefore will I that this attempt be made, keeping the counsel that is mine, thou must tell Baba Mustafa, I wait without the city, to reward him by my powers of reward, with all that he best loveth. So, when he has failed in his attempt on Shagpat, and blows fall plenteously upon him, and he is regaled with the accustomed thwacking, as I have tasted it in this undertaking, do thou waste no further word on him, for his part is over. And as is said, waste not a word in enterprise, against or for the minute flies. Tis then for thee, O Feshnavat, to speed to the presence of the king in his majesty, and thou wilt find means of coming to him by a disguise. Once in the hall of council, challenge the tongue of contradiction to affirm Shagpat other than a bald pate bewigged. This is for thee to do. Quote Feshnavat plaintively after thought, And what becometh of me, O thou master of the event? Shibli Bagarat said, The clutch of the executioner will be upon thee, O Feshnavat, and a clamouring multitude around. Short breathing time given thee, O father of Noorna, ere the time of breathing is commanded to cease. Now, in that respite, the thing that will occur, tis for thee to see and mark. Sure, never will the reverse of things be more complete, and the other side of the picture more rapidly exhibited. If all go as I conceive and plot, and the trap be not premature nor too perfect for the trappers, as the poet has declared, ye that intrigue, to thy slave's proper portions adapt. Perfectest plot burst too often, for all are not apt. And I witness likewise to the excellence of his saying, to master an event, study men. The minutes are well spent only then. Also, tis he that says, The man of men who knoweth men, the man of men is he. His army is the human race, and every foe must flee. So have I appointed to thee thy work, to Baba Mustafa his, reserving to myself the work that is mine. Thereat, Feshnavat exclaimed, O master of the event, may I be thy sacrifice, on my head be it, and for thee to command is for me to obey. But surely this sword of thine that is in thy girdle, the marvellous blade, tis alone equal to the project and the shave, and the matter might be consummated, the great thing done even from this point whence we behold Shagpat visible, as twere brought forth toward us by the beams. And this sword swayed by thee, and with thy skill and strength, and the hardihood of hand that is thine, Wullahi, twould share him now this moment, taking the light of a cliss for a lather. Shibli Bagarag knotted the brows of impatience, crying, Hast thou forgotten Karaz in thy calculations? I know of a surety what this sword will do, and I wot the oil he distilleth strengthened Shagpat, but against common blades. Yet shall it not be spoken of me, Shibli Bagarag, that I was tripped by my own conceit, the poet counselleth, when for any mighty end thou hast the aid of heaven. Mount until thy strength shall match those great means which are given." nor that I was overthrown in despising mine enemy, forgetful of the saying of the sage, Read the features of thy foe, wherever he may find thee. Small he is, seen face to face, but thrice his size behind thee. Wullahi, this Karaz is a genie of craft and resources, one of a mighty stock. 
and I must close with Shatpat to be sure of him, and that I am not deceived by semblances, opposing guile with guile, and guile deeper than his, for that he awaited it not, thinking I have leapt in fancy beyond the event, and am puffed by the after-breaths of adulation. I, thinking I pluck the blossoms in my hunger for the fruit, that I eat the chick of the yet unlaid egg, O Feshnavat, as is said, and the warrior beareth witness to the wisdom of it, his weapon I'll study, my own conceal. So with two arms to his one I shall deal. The same also testifieth, tis folly of the hero, though resistless in the field, to stake the victory on his steel, and fling away the shield. And likewise, examine thine armour in every joint, for slain was the giant, and by a pin's point. Wah! Tis certain there will need subtlety in this undertaking, and a plot plotted, so do thou my bidding, and fail not in the part assigned to thee. Now Feshnavat was persuaded by his words, and cried, In diligence, discretion, and the virtues which characterize subordinates I go, and I delay not. I will perform the thing required of me, O master of the event. And he repeated in verse, With danger beset, be the path crooked or narrow, Thou art the bow, and I the arrow. Then embraced he his daughter, kissing her on the forehead and the eyes, and tightening the girdle of his robe, departed with the name of Allah on his lips in the direction of the city. So Shibli Bagarag called to him the two genie, and his command was, Soar, ye slaves of the sword, till the range of earth and its mountains and seas and deserts are a cluster in the orb of the eye. Shiraz, conspicuous as a rose among garlands, and the ruby consorted with other gems in a setting. In Shiraz, or the country adjoining, ye will come upon one Baba Mustafa by name, and if he be alone, ye may recognize him by his forlorn look and the hang of his cheeks, his vacancy as of utter abandonment. If in company, twill be the only talker that's he. Seize on him, give him a taste of thin air, and deposit him without speech on the roof of a palace, where ye will see Feshnavat in yonder city. This do ere the shadows of the palm tree by the well in the plain move up the mounds that enclose the fortified parts. Cried Karaveji Sanvitravush, To hear is to obey. Up into the sky like two bright balls tossed by jugglers, the two genie shot, and watching them, Noorna bin Noorka said, My life, there is a third wanting, Ravijura, and with aid of the three, Earth could have planted no obstruction to thy stroke. But thou wert tempted by the third temptation in Aklis, and left not the hall in triumph, the hall of the duping brides. He answered, That is so, my soul, and the penalty is mine, by which I am made to employ deceits ere I strike. And she said, Tis to the generosity of Gulrevas thou ownst Karavejis and Vijravush, and I think she was generous seeing thee true to me in love, she that hath sorrows. So he said, What of the sorrows of Gulrivas? Tell me of them. But she said, Nay, O my betrothed, wouldst thou have this tongue blistered and a consuming spark shot against this bosom? Then he said, Make it clear to me. She put her mouth to his ears, saying, There is a curse on whoso telleth of things in a cliss, and to tattle of the seven and their sister forerunneth wretchedness. Surely he stooped to that fair creature and folded her to his heart, his whole soul heaving to her. And he cried again and again, Shall harm hap to thee through me? By Allah, no. And he closed the privileged arm of the bridegroom around her waist that had the yieldingness of the willow branchlet, the flowingness of the summer sea wave, and seemed as to a melting honey like at the first gentle pressure. She leaned her head shyly on his shoulder, yet confiding in his faithfulness. It was that she was shy of the great bliss in her bosom, and was made timid by the fervour of her affection, as is sung. Deeper than the source of blushes is the power that makes them start. Up in floods the red stream rushes at one whisper of the heart. And it is sung in words presented to the youth as he surveyed her. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride, her bashful joys like serpents sting her tenderness to tears. Her hopes are sleeping eagles in the shining of the spheres. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride. And she is a lapping antelope 
that from her image flees, and she's a dove caught in two hands to pant as she shall please. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride, like torrents over paradise her lengthy tresses roll. She moves as though the swaying rose and chids her hasty soul. The thing she will, that will she not, yet can no will control. O beauty, beauty, beauty of the bride. They were thus together, Abarak leaning under one wing of Kuruk for shade up on the slope of the hill. And Shibli Bagarak called to him, Ho, Abarak, look if there be aught impending over the city. So he arose and looked, crying, One with plunging legs high up in air over the city between two bright bodies. Shibli Bagarag exclaimed, "'Tis well. The second chapter of the event is opened, so call it thou that tellest of the shaving of Shagpat. It will be the shortest. Then said he, The shadow of yonder palm is now a slanted spear up the looped wall of the city. Now the time of Shagpat's triumph and his greatest majesty will be when yonder walls chase the shadow of the palm up this hill. And then will Baba Mustafa be joining the chorus of creatures that shriek toward even ere they snooze. There's not an ape in the woods, nor hyena in the forest, nor birds on the branches, nor frogs in the marsh that will outnoise Baba Mustafa under the thong. Wullahi, twill grieve his soul in after time when he sitteth secure in honours, coated with a thousand years at his bidding, that so much breath scaped him without toll of the tongue. But as the poet says truly, the chariot of events lifteth many dusty heels, and many, high and of renown, it crusheth with its wheels. Wah, I have had my share of the thong, and am I, master of the event, to be squeamish in attaining an end by its means? Nay, by the sword. Thereat he strode once again to the summit of the hill, and in a moment the genie fronted him like two short arrows quivering from the flight. So he cried, It is done? They answered, In faithfulness. So he beckoned to Noorna, and she came forward swiftly to him, exclaiming, I read the plot and the thing required of me, so say not, but embrace me ere I leave thee, my betrothed, my master. He embraced her and led her to where the genie stood. Then said he to the genie, Convey her to the city, O ye slaves of the sword, and watch over her there. If ye let but an evil wind ruffle the hair of her head, lo, I sever ye with a stroke that shaketh the underworlds. Remain by her till the shrieks of Baba Mustafa greet ye, and then will follow commotion among the crowd and cries for Shakpat to show himself to the people. Cries also of death to Feshnavat, and there will be an assembly in the king's hall of justice, Thither lead ye my betrothed and watch over her. And he said to Noorna, Thou knowest my design. So she said, When condemnation is passed on Feshnavat, that I appear in the hall as bride of Shagpat, and so rescue him, that is my father. And she cried, O oh, fair delightful time that is coming, my happiness and thy honour on earth dateth from it. Farewell, O oh my betrothed, beloved youth. Eyes of mine, these genie will be by, and there's no cause for fear or sorrow, and tis for thee to look like morning that speeds the march of light. Thou, my betrothed, art thou not all that enslaveth the heart of a woman? cried Shibli Bagarag. And thou, O Noorna, all that enraptured the soul of man, Allah keep thee my life. Lo, while they were wasting the rich love in their hearts, the genie rose up with Noorna, and she, waving her hand to him, was soon distant and as the white breast of a bird turned to the sun. Then went he to where Barak was leaning and summoned Kuruk, and the twain mounted him and rose up high over the city of Shagpat to watch the ripening of the event as a vulture watcheth over the desert. End of chapter 20 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 27 of The Shaving of Shag Pat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shag Pat by George Meredith. Chapter 21, Part 1. The Dish of Pomegranate Grain. 
Now, in the city of Shagpat, Kadza, spouse of Shagpat, she that had belabored Shibli Bagarag, had a dream while these things were doing, and it was a dream of danger and portent to the glory of her eyes, Shagpat. So, at the hour when he was revealed to Shibli Bagarag, made luminous by the beams of Aklis, Kadza went to an inner chamber, and greased her hands and her eyelids, and drank of a phial, and commenced tugging at a brass ring fixed in the floor, and it yielded and displayed an opening, over which she stooped the upper half of her leanness, and pitching her note high, called, Keras! After that, she rose and retreated from the hole hastily, and in the winking of an eye it was filled, as twere a pillar of black smoke, by the body of the genie, he breathing hard with mighty travel. So he cried to her between his pantings and puffings, Speak! Where am I wanted, and for what? Now Kadza was affrighted at the terribleness of his manner, and the great smell of the genie was an intoxication in her nostril, so that she reeled and could just falter out, Danger to the identical! Then he, in a voice like claps of thunder, Out with it! She answered beseechingly, "'Tis a dream I had, O genie, a dream of danger to him. While she spake, the genie clenched his fists, and stamped so that the palace shook and the earth under it, exclaiming, "'O abominable Kadza, a dream is it, another dream? Wilt thou cease dreaming a while, thou silly woman? Know I not he that's powerful against us is an Aklis, crowned ape, and that his spells are gone?' and I was distilling drops to defy the sword and strengthen Shagpat from assault, yet bringest thou me from my labour by the putrid sea with thy accursed dream. Thereat he frowned and shot fire at her from his eyes, so that she singed, and the room thickened with a horrible smell of burning. She feared greatly and trembled, but he cooled himself against the air, crying presently in a diminished voice, Let's hear this dream, thou foolish Kadza, tis as well to hear it. Probably Rabesquarat hath sent thee some sign from Aklis, where she ferrieth a term. What's that saying? A woman's at the core of every plot man plotteth, and like an ill-reared fruit, first at the core it rotteth. So out with it, thou Kadza. Now the urgency of that she had dreamed overcame fear in Kadza, and she said, O oh, great genie and terrible, my dream was this. Lo, I saw an assemblage of the beasts of the forests, and them that inhabit wild places. And there was the elephant, and the rhinoceros, and the hippopotamus, and the camel, and the camelopard, and the serpent, and the striped tiger, also the antelope, the hyena, the jackal, and above them, eminent in majesty, the lion. Surely he sat as twere on a high seat, and they like suppliants thronging the presence. This I saw, the heart on my ribs beating for Shagpat. And there appeared among the beasts a monkey all adjoint with tricks, jerking with malice, he looking as twere hungry for the doing of things detestable. And the lion scorned him, and I marked him ridicule the lion. T'was so. And the lion began to scowl, and the other beasts marked the displeasure of the lion. Then chased they that monkey from the presence, and for a while he was absent, and the lion sat in his place gravely, with calm, receiving homage of the other beasts. And down to his feet came the eagle that's lord of air, and before him kneeled the great elephant, and the subtle serpent eyed him with awe. But soon did that monkey, the wretched animal, reappear, and there was no peace for the lion, he worrying till close within stretch of the lion's paw. Wah! The lion might have crushed him, but that he's magnanimous. And so it was that as the monkey advanced, the lion roared to him, Be gone! And the monkey cried, Who commandeth? So the lion roared, The king of beasts and thy king. Then that monkey cried, Homage to the king of beasts and my king, Allah keep him in his seat, and I would he were visible. So the lion roared, He sitteth here acknowledged, thou graceless animal, and he's before thee apparent. 
Then the monkey affected eagerness, and gazed about him, and peered on this beast and on that, exclaiming like one that's injured and under slight, What's this I've done, and wherein have I offended, that he should be hidden from me when pointed out? So the lion roared, Tis where I sit, thou offensive monkey. Then that monkey in the upper pitch of amazement, Thou, is it for created thing to acknowledge a king without a tail? And, O beasts of the forest and the wilderness, how say ye, am I to blame that I bow not to one that hath it not? Upon that the lion rose and roared in the extreme of his wrath, but the word he was about to utter was checked in him, for twas manifest that where he would have lashed a tail he shook a stump, wagging it as the dog doth. Lo, when the lion saw that, his majesty melted from him, and in a moment the plumpness of content and prosperity forsook him, so that his tawny skin hung flabbily, and his jaw drooped, and shame deprived him of stateliness. Abashed was he. Now, seeing the lion ashamed in this manner, my heart beat violently for Shagpat, so that I awoke with the strength of its beating, and twas hidden from me whether the monkey was punished by the lion, or exalted by the other beasts in his place, or how came it that the lion's tail was lost, witched from him by that villain of mischief, the monkey? But, O oh great genie, I knew there was a lion among men reverenced and with enemies. That lion, he that espoused me and my glory shagpat. Twas enough to know that and tremble at the omen of my dream, O oh genie, Wherefore I thought it well to summon thee here, that thou mightest set a guard over Shagpat, and shield him from the treacheries that beset him. When Kadza had ceased speaking, the genie glowered at her a while in silence. Then said he, What creature is that, Kadza, which tormenteth like the tongue of a woman, is small as her pretensions to virtue, and which showeth how the chapters of her history should be read by the holy ones, even in its manner of movement. Cried Kadza, The flea that hoppeth. So he said, Tis well. Hast thou strength to carry one of my weight, O Kadza? She answered in squeamishness, Ay, Wallahi, I'm but a woman, genie, though the wife of Shagpat, and to carry thee is for the camel and the elephant and the horse. Then he, Tighten thy girdle, and when tightened, let a loose hoop hang from it. She did that, and he gave her a dark powder in her hand, saying, Swallow the half of this, and what remaineth mix with water, and sprinkle over thee. That did she, and thereupon he exclaimed, Now go, and thy part is to move round Shagpat, and a wind will strike thee from one quarter, and from which quarter it striketh is the one of menace and danger to Shagpat. So Kadza was diligent in doing what the genie commanded, and sought for Shagpat, and moved round him many times. But no wind struck her. She went back to the genie and told him of this, and the genie cried, What? No wind? Not one from Aklis? Then will Shagpat of a surety triumph, and we with him. Now there was joy on the features of Kadza and Karaz, till suddenly he said, Halt in thy song, how if there be danger and menace above, and tis the thing that may be. Then he seized Kadza and slung her by him, and went into the air, and up it till the roofs of the city of Shagpat were beneath their feet, all on them visible. And under an awning, on the roof of the palace, there was the vizier Feshnavat and Baba Mustafa, they ear to lip in consultation, and Baba Mustafa brightening with the matter revealed to him, and bobbing his head, and breaking on the speech of the vizier. Now when he saw them, the genie blew from his nostrils a double stream of darkness, which curled in a thick body round and round him, and Kadza slung at his side was enveloped in it, as with folds of a huge serpent. Then the genie hung still, and lo, two radiant figures swept toward the roof he watched, and between them Nurna bin Nurka, her long hair borne far backward, and her robe of silken stuff fluttering and straining on the pearl buttons as she flew. There was that in her beauty, and the silver clearness of her temples and her eyes, and her cheeks, and her neck, and chin and ankles, that made the genie shudder with love of her, 
and he was nigh dropping Kadza to the ground, forgetful of all save Noorna. When he recovered, and it was by tightening his muscles till he was all over hard knots, Noorna was seated on a cushion, and descending he heard her speak his name. Then sniffed he the air, and said to Kadza, O spouse of Shagpat, a plot breweth, and the odour of it is in my nostril. Fearest thou a scorching for his sake thou adorest, the miracle of men? She answered, On my head be it, and my eyes. He said, I shall alight thee behind the pole of awning on yonder roof, where are the two bright figures and the dingy one, and the vizier Shevnavat and Nurna bin Nurka. A flame will spring up severing thee from them, but thou art secure from it by reason of the powder I gave thee, all save the hair that's on thee. Thou wilt have another shape than that which is thine, even that of a slave of Nurna bin Nurka, and say to her when she asketh thy business with her, O oh, my mistress, let the storm gather in the storm-bird when it would surprise men. Do this, and thy part's done, O Kadza. Thereupon he swung a circle, and alighted her behind the pole of awning on the roof, and vanished, and the circle of flame rose up, and Kadza passed through it slightly scorched, and answered to the question of Noorna, O oh, my mistress, let the storm gather in the storm-bird when it would surprise men. Now when Noorna beheld her and heard her voice, she pierced the disguise, and was ware of the wife of Shagpat, and glanced her large eyes over Kadza from head to sole, till they rested on the loose loop in her girdle. Seeing that, she rose up and stretched her arms, and spread open the palm of her hand, and slapped Kadza on the cheek and ear a hard slap, so that she heard bells. And ere she ceased to hear them, another, so that Kadza staggered back and screamed, and Feshnevet was moved to exclaim, what has the girl thy favourite offended in, O my daughter? So Nurna continued slapping Kadza, and cried, Is she not sluttish, and where's the point of decency established in her, this Lulo? Shall her like appear before thee and me with loose girdle? Then she pointed to the girdle, and Kadza tightened the loose loop, and fell upon the ground to avoid the slaps, and Noorna knelt by her, and clutched at a portion of her dress, and examined it, peering intently. And she caught up another part, and knotted it as if to crush a living creature, hunting over her and grasping at her. And so it was, that while she tore strips from the garment of Kadza, Feshnevet jumped suddenly in wrath, and pinched over his garments, crying, "'Tis unbearable! Tis I know not what other than a flea that persecuteth me!' Upon that, Noorna ran to him, and while they searched together for the flea, Baba Mustafa fidgeted and worried in his seat, lurching to the right and to the left, muttering curses, and it was evident he too was persecuted, and there was no peace on the roof of that palace, but pinching and howling and stretching of limbs, and curses snarled in the throat, and imprecations on the head of the tormenting flea. Surely the soul of Kadza rejoiced, for she knew the flea was Keraz, whom she had brought with her in the loose loop of her girdle, through the circle of flame which was a barrier against him. She glistened at the triumph of the flea, but Noorna strode to her, and took her to the side of the roof, and pitched her down it, and closed the passage to her. Then ran she to Keravegis and Vidravush, whispering in the ear of each, No word of the sword? And afterward aloud, what think ye will be the term of the staying of my betrothed in Aklis, crowned ape? They answered, O pearl of the morn, crowned ape till such a time as Shagpat be shaved. So she beat her breast, crying, O utter stagnation, till Shagpat be shaved, and O oh, stoppage on the tide of business, dense cloud upon the face of beauty, and frost on the river of events, till Shagpat be shaved and, oh, my betrothed, crowned ape in Aklis, till Shagpat be shaved. Then she lifted her hands and arms, and said, To him where he is, ye genii, and away, for he needeth comfort. Thereat the glittering spirits dissolved and thinned, and were as taper gleams of curved light across the water in their ascent of the heavens. When they were gone, Noorna exclaimed, 
now for the dish of pomegranate grain o baba mustapha and let nothing delay us further quoth baba mustapha tis ordered o my princess and fair mistress from the confectioners and with it the sleepy drug from the seller of medicaments a cursed flea now she laughed and said what am i o baba mustapha so he said not thou o bright shooter of beams but i will lahi i'm but a bundle of points through the pertinacity of this flea a house of irritabilities a mere mass of fretfulness and i've no thought but for the chasing of this unlucky flea was never flea like it in the world before this flea and tis a flea to anger the holy ones and make the saintly dervish swear at such a flea he wriggled and curled where he sat and noorna cried what shall we be defeated by a flea we that would shave shagpat and release this city and the world from bondage and she looked up to the sky that was then without a cloud blazing with the sun on his mid-seat and exclaimed o star of shagpat wilt thou constantly be in the ascendant and defeat us the liberators of men with a flea now whenever one of the twain baba mustapha and the vizier shefnavat commenced speaking of the dish of pomegranate grain the torment of the flea took all tongue from him and was destruction to the gravity of counsel and deliberation the dish of pomegranate grain was brought to them by slaves and the drug to induce sleep yet neither could say aught concerning it they were as jointy grasshoppers through the action of the flea and the torment of the flea became a madness they shrieking tis now with thee tis now with me fires of the damned on this flea in their extremity they called to allah for help but no help came save when they abandoned all speech concerning the dish of pomegranate grain then were they for a moment eased of the flea so noorna recognized the presence of her enemy Keraz and his malicious working and she went and fetched a jar brimmed with water for the bath and stirred it with her forefinger and drew on it a flame from the rays of the sun till there rose up from the jar a white thick smoke she rustled her raiment making the wind of it collect round baba mustapha and feshnavat and did this till the sweat streamed from their brows and bodies and they were sensible of peace and the absence of the flea then she whisked away the smoke and they were attended by slaves with fresh robes and were as new men and sat together over the dish of pomegranate grain praising the wisdom of noorna and her power then baba mustapha revived in briskness and cried here's the dish and tis in my hands an instrument an instrument of vengeance and one to endow the skilful wielder of it with glory and tis as i designed it sweet seasoned savoury a flattery to the eye and no deceiver to the palate wah and such an instrument in the hands of the discerning and the dexterous and the discreet and the judicious and them gifted with determination is it not such as sufficeth for the overturning of empires and systems o my mistress fair one sapphire of the city and is it not written that i shall beguile shagpat by its means and master the event and shame the king of ulb and his court and i shall then sit in state among men and surround myself with adornments and with slaves mute that talk not save at the signal and are as statues round the cushions of their lord that's myself and i shall surround myself with the flatteries of wealth and walk bewildered in silks and stuff and perfumeries and sweet young beauties shall i have about me antelopes of grace as i like them and select them long-eyed lazy fond of listening and with bashful looks that timidly admire the dignity that's in man while he was prating noorna took the dish in her lap and folded her silvery feet beneath her and commenced whipping into it the drug and she whipped it dexterously and with equal division among the grain whipping it and the flea with it but she feigned not to mark the flea and whipped harder then took she colour and coloured it saffron and laid over it gold leaf so that it glittered and was an enticing sight and the dish was of gold crusted over with devices and patterns and heads of golden monsters a ravishment of skill in him that executed it cumbrous with ornate golden workmanship 
Likewise there were places round the dish for sticks of perfume, and cups carved for the storing of perfumed pellets, and into these Nurna put myrrh and ambergris, and rich incenses, aloes, sandalwood, prepared essences, divers keen and sweet scents. Then when all was in readiness, she put the dish upon the knee of Babu Mustafa, and awoke him from his babbling reverie with a shout, and said, An instrument verily, O Baba Mustafa, and art thou a cat to shave Shagpat with that tongue of thine? Now he arose and made a sign of obedience, and said, Tis well, O lady of grace and bright wit, and now for the cap of Shiraz and the Persian robe, and my twenty slaves and seven to follow me to the mansion of Shagpat. I'll do, I'll act." So she motioned to a slave to bring the cap of Shiraz and the Persian robe, and in these Baba Mustafa arrayed himself. Then called he for the twenty and seven slaves, and they were ranged, some to go before, some to follow him. And he was exalted, and made the cap of Shiraz nod in his conceit, crying, Am I not leader in this complot? Wallahi! All bow to me and acknowledge it. Then to check himself, he called out sternly to the slaves, Ho ye, forward to the mansion of Shagpat, and pass at a slow pace through the streets of the city, solemnly, gravely, as before a potentate. Then will the people inquire of ye, who it is ye marshal, and what mighty one? And ye will answer, He's from the court of Shiraz, nothing less than a vizier, bearing homage to Shagpat, even this dish of pomegranate grain. So they said, To hear is to obey. End of part one of chapter twenty one. Section twenty eight of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 21, Part 2. Upon that he waved his hand and stalked majestically, and they descended from the roof into the street, criers running in front to clear the way. When Baba Mustafa was hidden from view by a corner of the street, Nurna shrank in her white shoulders, and laughed, and was like a flashing pearl as she swayed and dimpled with laughter, and she cried, True are those words of the poet, and I testify to them in the instance of Baba Mustafa. With feathers of the cock I'll fashion a vain creature, with feathers of the owl I'll make a judge in feature. Is not the barber elate and lofty? He goeth forth to the mastery of this event, as go many, armed with naught other than their own conceit, and tis written, Fools from their fate seek not to urge, the coxcomb carrieth his scourge. So Feshnavet smoothed his face, and said, Is it not also written? Oft may the fall of fools make wise men moan, too often hangs the house on one loose stone. Tis so, O Nurna, my daughter, and I am as a reed shaken by the wind of apprehensiveness, and doubt in me is a deep root as to the issue of this undertaking, for the wrath of the king will be terrible, and the clamour of the people soundeth in my ears already. If Shibli Bagarag fail in one stroke, where be we? Tis certain I know not the might in Shagpat when I strove with him, and he's powerful beyond the measure of man's subtlety. And yonder flies a rook without fellow, an omen, and all's ominous, and ominous of ill. And I marked among the troop of slaves that preceded Baba Mustafa one that squinted, and that's an omen. And, O oh my daughter, I counsel that thou by thy magic speed us to some remote point in the Caucasus, where we may abide the unravelling of this web securely, one way or the other way. Tis my counsel, O Nurna. Then she, Abandon my betrothed, and betray him on the very stroke of the sword, and diminish him by a withdrawal of that faith in his right wrist which strengthen it more than Karavejus and Vidravush wound round it in coils? And she leaned her head and cried, Hark, hearest thou? There's shouting in the streets of Shiraz and of Shagpat. 
Shall we merit the punishment of Shapesh the Persian on Kepil the Builder, while the event is mastering? I'll mark this interview between Babu Mustafa and Shagpat, and do thou, O my father, rest here on this roof till the king's guard of horsemen and soldiers of the law come hither for thee, and go with them sedately, fearing not, for I shall be by thee in the garb of an old woman." and preserve thy composure in the presence of the king and shagpat exalted and allow not the thing that happeneth let fly from thee the shaft of speech but remain a slackened bow till the strength of my betrothed is testified fearing not for fear is that which defeateth men and tis declared in a distich the strongest weapon one can see in mortal hands is constancy and for thee to flee now would rank us with that king described by the poet. A king of Eind there was who fought a fight from the first gleam of morn till fall of night, but when the royal tent his generals sought, proclaiming victory, fled was he who fought. Despair possessed them till they chanced to spy a dervish that paced on with downward eye. They questioned of the king, he answered slow, Ye fought but one, the king a double foe. And, O oh, my father, they interpreted of this that the king had been vanquished, and that he was victor by the phantom army of his fears. Now the vizier cried, Be the will of Allah achieved and consummated. And he was silenced by her wisdom and urgency, and sat where he was, diverting not the arch on his brow from its settled furrow. He was as one that thirsteth, and whose eye hath marked a snake of swift poison by the water. So thirsted he for the event, yet hung with dread from advancing. But Nurna bin Nurka busied herself about the roof, drawing circles to witness the track of an enemy, and she clapped her hands and cried, Lalu! And lo, a fair slave girl that came to her and stood by with bent head, like a white lily by a milk-white antelope. So Nurna clouded her brow a moment, and when the moon darkeneth behind a scud, and cried, Speak, art thou in league with Keraz, girl? Lolu strained her hands to her temples, exclaiming, With the terrible genie, I, in league with him? My mistress, surely the charms I wear, and the amulets, I wear them as a protection from that genie, and a safeguard, he that carrieth off the maidens and the young sucklings, walking under the curse of mothers. Said Nurna, O oh, Lalu, have I boxed those little ears of thine this day? The fair slave girl smiled a smile of submissive tenderness, and answered, Not this day, nor once since Lalu was rescued from the wicked old merchant by thy overbidding, and was taken to the arms of a wise kind sister, wiser and kinder than any she had been stolen from, she that is thy slave for ever. She said this weeping, and Nurna mused, "'Twas as I divined that wretched Kadza, her griefs to come. Then spake she aloud as to herself, "'Knew I, or could one know, I should this day be a bride?' And hearing that, Lalu shrieked, "'Thou a bride, and torn from me, and we too parted?' and I, a poor drooping tendril, left to wither? For my life is round thee, and worthless away from thee, O cherisher of the fallen flower. And she sobbed out wailful verses and words, broken and without a meaning. But Nurna caught her by the arm, and swung her, and bade her fetch on the instant a robe of blue, and pile in her chamber robes of amber and saffron and grey, bridal robes of many lighted silks, plum-coloured, peach-coloured, of the colour of musk mixed with pale gold, together with bridal ornaments and veils of the bride, and a jewelled circlet for the brow. When this was done, Nurna went with Lalu to her chamber, attended by slave-girls, and arrayed herself in the first dress of blue, and swayed herself before the mirror, and rattled the gold pieces in her hair and on her neck with laughter and Lalu was bewildered, and forgot her tears to watch the gaiety of her mistress. And lo, Nurna made her woman take off one set of ornaments with every dress, and with every dress she put on another set. And after she had gone the round of the different dresses, she went to the bathroom with Lalu, and at her bidding, Lalu entered the bath beside Nurna, 
and the twain dipped and shouldered in the blue water, and were as when a single star is by the full moon on a bright midnight, pouring lustre about. And Noorna splashed Lalu and said, This night we shall not sleep together, O Lalu, nor lie close, thy bosom on mine. Thereat Lalu wept afresh and cried, Ah, cruel, and tis a sweet thought for thee, and thou'lt have no mind for me, tossing on my hateful lonely couch. Tenderly Nurna eyed Lalu, and the sprinkles of the bath fell with the tears of both, and they clung together, and were like the lily and its bud on one stalk in a shower. Then, when Nurna had spent her affection, she said, O thou of the long downward lashes, thy love is constant when I stood under a curse and was an old woman, a hag. Carest thou so little to learn the name of him that claimeth me? Lalu replied, I thought of no one save myself and my loss, O my lost pearl. Happy is he, a youth of favor. O oh, how I shall hate him that taketh thee from me. Tell me now his name, O sovereign of hearts. So Nurna smoothed the curves and corners of her mouth, and calmed her countenance, crying in a deep tone and a voice as of reverence, Shagpat. Now at that name Lalu drank in her breath and was awed, and sank in herself, and had just words to ask, Hath he demanded thee again in marriage, O my mistress? Said Noorna, Even so. Lalu muttered, Great is the dispenser of our fates. And she spake no further, but sighed and took napkins, and summoned the slave girls, and arrayed Noorna silently in the robe of blue and bridal ornaments. Then Noorna said to them that thronged about her, Put on, each of ye, a robe of white, ye that are maidens, and a fillet of blue, and a sash of saffron, and abide my coming. And she said to Lalu, Array thyself in a robe of blue, even as mine, and let trinkets lurk in thy tresses, and abide my coming. Then went she forth from them, and veiled her head, and swathed her figure in raiment of a coarse white stuff, and was as the moon going behind a hill of dusky snow and she left the house, and passed along the streets and by the palaces, till she came to the palace of her father, now filled by Shagpat. Before the palace grouped a great concourse and a multitude of all ages, of either sex, in that city, despite the blaze and the heat. Like roaring of a sea beyond the mountains was the noise that issued from them, and their eyes were a fire of beams against the portal of the palace. Now she saw in the crowd one Shafrak, a shoemaker, and addressed him, saying, O Shafrak, the shoemaker, what's this assembly, and how got together? For the poet says, Ye string not such assemblies in the street, save when some high event should be complete. He answered, Tis an event complete, Wallahi, the deputation from Shiraz to Shagpat, and the submission of that vain city to the might of Shagpat. And he asked her jestingly, Art thou a witch to guess that, O veiled and virtuous one? Quoth she, I read the thing that cometh ere tis come, and I read danger to Shagpat in this deputation from Shiraz, and this dish of pomegranate grain. So Shafrak cried, By the beard of my father's and that of Shagpat, Let's speak of this to zeal, the garlic seller. He broadened to one that was by him, and said, O zeal, what's thy mind? Here's a woman, a wise woman, a witch, and she sees danger to Shagpat in this deputation from Shiraz, and this dish of pomegranate grain. Now zeal screwed his visage, and gazed up to his forehead, and said, Twere best to consult with Boodleback the drum-beater. The two then called to Boodleback the drum-beater, and told him the matter, and Boodleback pondered, and tapped his brow, and beat on his stomach, and said, Cruz el Karazawik, the carrier, is good in such a case. Now from Cruz el Karazawik, the carrier, they went to Dob, the confectioner, and from Dob, the confectioner, to Azawul, the builder, and from Azawul, the builder, to Cheek, the collector of taxes and each referred to some other, till perplexity triumphed and was a cloud over them, and the words, danger to Shagpat, went about like bees, and were canvassing, 
when suddenly a shrill voice rose from the midst, dominating other voices, and it was that of Kadza, and she cried, Who talks here of danger to Shagpat, and what wretch is it? Now Cheek pointed out Azawul, and Azawul Dub, and Dub Kruzel Krazawik, and he Boodleback, and the drumbeater shrugged his shoulder at Zeal, and Zeal stood away from Shafrak, and Shafrak seized Nurna and shouted, "'Tis she, this woman, the witch!' Kadza fronted Nurna and called to her, "'O thing of infamy, what's this talk of thine concerning danger to our glory, Shagpat?' Then Nurna replied, "'I say it, O Kadza, and I say it. There's danger threateneth him, and from that deputation and that dish of pomegranate grain.' Now Kadza laughed a loose laugh, and jeered at Nurna, crying, "'Danger to Shagpat! He that's attended by genii, and watched over by the greatest of them, day and night incessantly?' And Nurna said, "'I ask pardon of the power that seeth, and of thee, if I be wrong. Wah, am I not also of them that watch over Shagpat? So then let thou and I go into the palace, and examine the doings of this deputation, and this dish of pomegranate grain. Now Kadza remembered the scene on the roofs of the vizier Shefnavet, and relaxed in her look of suspicion, and said, "'Tis well, let's in to them.' Whereupon the twain threaded through the crowd, and locked at the portals of the palace, and it was open to them, and they entered." and lo, the hand that opened the portals was the hand of a slave of the sword, and against corners of the court leaned slaves silly with slumber. So Kadza went up to them and beat them and shook them, and they yawned and mumbled, Excellent grain, good grain, the grain of Shiraz. And she beat them with what might was hers, till some fell sideways and some forward, still mumbling, Excellent pomegranate grain. Kadza was beside herself with anger and vexation at them, tearing them and cuffing them. But Nurna cried, O oh, Kadza, what said I? There's danger to Shagpat in this dish of pomegranate grain. And what's that saying? Tis much against the master's wish that slaves too greatly praise his dish. Wallahi, I like not this talk of the grain of Shiraz. Now while Nurna spake, the eyes of Kadza became like those of the starved wild cat, and she sprang off and along the marble of the court, and clawed a passage through the air, and past the marble pillars of the palace toward the first room of reception, Nurna following her. And in the first room were slaves leaning and lolling like them about the court, and in the second room and in the third room, silent all of them and senseless. So at this sight the spark of suspicion became a mighty flame in the bosom of Kadza, and horror burst out at all ends of her, and she shuddered and cried, What for us, and where's our hope if Shagpat be shorn, and he lopped of the identical, shamed like the lion of my dream? And Nurna clasped her hands and said, Tis that I fear, seek for him, O Kadza. So Kadza ran to a window, and looked forth over the garden of the palace, and it was a fair garden, with the gleam of a fountain, and watered plants, and cool arches of shade, thick bowers, fragrant alleys, long-sheltered terraces, and beyond the garden a summer-house of marble fanned by the broad leaves of a palm. Now when Kadza had gazed a moment, she shrieked, "'He's there! Shake Pat! Giveth he not the light of a jewel to the house that holdeth him?' Awah he, and he's witched there for an ill purpose. Then tore she from that room like a mad wild thing after its stolen cubs, and sped along corridors of the palace, and down the great flight of steps into the garden, and across the garden, knocking over the ablution pots in her haste, and Norna had just strength to withhold her from dashing through the doors of the summer-house to come upon Shagpat, she straining and crying, He's there, I say, O oh, wise woman, Shagpat, let's into him. But Nurna clung to her and spake in her ear, Wilt thou blow the fire that menaces him, O Kadza? And what are two women against the assailants of such a mighty one as he? Then said she, Watch rather, and avail thyself of yonder window by the blue-painted pillar. So Kadza crept up to the blue-painted pillar, which was on the right side of the porch, and the twain peered through the window. 
Nurna beheld the dish of pomegranate grain, and it was on the floor, empty of the grain, and Babu Mustafa was by it alone making a lather, and he was twitching his mouth and his legs, and flinging about his arms, and Nurna heard him mutter wrathfully, O oh, accursed flea, art thou at me again? And she heard him mutter as in anguish, No peace for thee, O pertinacious flea, and my steadiness of hand will be gone, now when I have him safe as the hawk, his prey, mine enemy, this shagpat that abused me. Thou abominable flea! And, O thou flea, wilt thou, vile thing, hinder me from mastering the event, and releasing this people from the world of enchantment and bondage? And shall I fail to become famous to the ages and the times, because of such as thee, flea? So Kadza whispered to Noorna, What's that he's muttering? Is it of Shagpat? For I mark him not here, nor the light by which he's girt. She answered, Listen with the ear and the eye and all the senses. Now presently they heard Baba Mustafa say in a louder tone, like one that is secure from interruption, Two lathers, and this the third, a potent lather and I wot there's not a hair in this world resisteth the sweep of my blade over such a lather as, ah, flea of iniquity and abomination! What, am I doomed to thy torments? So, let's spread. Lo, this lather, is it not the pride of Shiraz? And the polish and smoothness it sheddeth, is it not roseate? My invention, as the poet says, O oh, accursed flea, now the knee-joint, now the knee-cap, and tis but a hop for thee to the armpit. Fires of the pit without bottom seize thee. Is no place sacred from thee, and art thou a restless soul, infernal flea? So then peace awhile, and here's for the third lather. While he was speaking, Baba Mustafa advanced to a large white object that sat motionless, upright like a snow-mound on a throne of cushions, and commenced lathering. When she saw that, Kadza tossed up her head and her throat, and a shriek was coming from her, for she was ware of Shagpat. But Noorna stifled the shriek and clutched her fast, whispering, He's safe if thou have but patience, thou silly Kadza, and the flea will defeat this fellow if thou spoil it not. So Kadza said, looking up, is it seen of Allah, and be the genii still in their depths? But she constrained herself, peering and perking out her chin, and lifting one foot and the other foot, as on furnaces of fire, in the excess of the fury she smothered. And lo, Baba Mustafa worked diligently, and Shagpat was behind an exulting lather, even as one pelted with wheat and flower balls, or balls of powdery perfume, and his hairiness was as branches of the forest foliage bent under a sudden fall of overwhelming snow that filleth the pits and sharpeneth the wolves with hunger, and teacheth new cunning to the fox. A fox was Baba Mustafa in his stratagems, and a wolf in the fierceness of his setting upon Shagpat. Surely he drew forth the blade that was to shear Shagpat, and made with it in the air a preparatory sweep and flourish, and the blade frolicked and sent forth a light, and seemed eager for Shagpat. So Baba Mustafa addressed his arm to the shearing, and inclined gently the edge of the blade, and they marked him let it slide twice to a level with the head of Shagpat, and at the third time it touched, and Kadza howled, but from Baba Mustafa there burst a howl to madden the beasts, and he flung up his blade, and wrenched open his robe, crying, a flea was it to bite in that fashion? Now I swear by the merciful, a fang like that's come into tigers and hyenas and ferocious animals. Then looked he for the mark of the bite, plaining of its pang, and he could find the mark nowhere. So as he caressed himself, eyeing Shagpat sheepishly and with gathering awe, Nurna said hurriedly to Kadza, Away now, and call them in, the crowd about the palace, that they may behold the triumph of Shagpat, for tis ripe, O Kadza. And Kadza replied, Thou art a wise woman, and I'll have thee richly rewarded. Lo, I'm as a camel lightened of fifty loads, and the glory of Shagpat see I as a new sun rising in the desert. Wallahi, thou art wise, and I'll do thy bidding. 
Now she went flying back to the palace, and called shrill calls to the crowd, and collected them in the palace, and headed them through the garden, and it was when Baba Mustafa had summoned the courage for a second essay, and was in the act of standing over Shagpat to operate on him, that the crowd burst the doors, and he was quickly seized by them, and tugged at, and hauled at, and pummeled, and torn and vituperated, and as a wrecked vessel on stormy waters, plunging up and down with tattered sails, when the crew fling overboard freight and ballast and provision. Surely his time would have been short with that mob, but Nurna made Kadza see the use of examining him before the king, and there were in that mob sheiks and fakirs, holy men who listened to the words of Kadza, and exerted themselves to rescue Baba Mustafa, and quieted the rage that was prevailing, and bore Baba Mustafa with them to the great palace of the king, which was in the centre of that city. Now, when the king heard of the attempt on Shagpat, and the affair of the pomegranate grain, he gave orders for the admission of the people, as many of them as could be contained in the hall of justice. And he set a guard over Baba Mustafa, and commanded that Shagpat should be brought to the palace, even as he then was, and with the lather on him. So the regal mandate went forth, and Shagpat was brought in state on cushions, and the potency of the drug preserved his sedateness through all this, and he remained motionless in sleep, folded in the centre of calm and satisfaction, while this tumult was raging, and the city shook with uproar. But the people, when they saw him whitened behind a lather, wrath at Baba Mustafa's polluting touch and the audacity of barbercraft wrestled in them with the outpouring of reverence for Shagpat, and a clamour arose for the instant sacrifice of Baba Mustafa at the foot of their idol Shagpat. And the whole of the city of Shagpat, men, women, and children, and the sheiks and the dervishes and crafts of the city, besieged the king's palace in that middle hour of the noon, clamouring for the sacrifice of Baba Mustafa at the feet of their idol Shagpat. End of chapter 21「Section 29 of the Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Cornwall. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 22 Now the great hall for the dispensing of justice in the palace of the king was one on which the architect and the artificers had lavished all their arts and subtleties of design and taste and their conceptions of uniformity and grandeur so that none entered it without a sense of abasement and the soul acknowledged awfulness and power in him that ruled and sat eminent on the throne of that hall for lo the throne was of solid weighty gold overhung with rich silks and purples and the hall was lofty with massive pillars fifty on either side ranging in stateliness down toward the blaze of the throne, and the pillars were pillars of porphyry and of jasper and precious marble, carven over all of them with sentences of the cunningest wisdom, distexts of excellence, odes of the poet, stanzas sharp with the incisiveness of wit, and that solve knotty points with but one stroke, and these pillars were each the gift of a mighty potentate of earth or of a genie. In the center of the hall a fountain set up a glittering jet, and spread it abroad the breath of freshness, leaping a height of sixty feet, and shimmering there in a wide, bright canopy with dropping silver sides. It was rumored of the waters of this fountain that they were fed underground from the waters of the sacred river, brought there in the reign of El Rasun, a former sovereign in the city of Shagpat, by their laborers of Zak, a genie subject to the magic words of Azruka, the queen of El Rasun, but of a surety, None of earth were like to them in silverness and sweet coolness, and they were as wine to the weary. Now the king sat on his throne in the hall, and around him his ministers, and emirs, and chamberlains, and officers of state, and black slaves, and the soldiers of his guard, armed with naked scimitars. And the king was as a sun in splendor, severely grave, and a frown on his forehead to darken kingdoms, for the attempt on Shagpat had stirred his kingly wrath and awakened zeal for the punishment of all conspirators and offenders. So when Shagpat was borne in to the king upon his throne of cushions, where he sat upright, smiling and inanimate, 
king commanded that he should be placed at his side, the place of honor, and Shagpat was as a moon behind the whiteness of the lathers. Even as we behold moon and sun together in the heavens, was Shagpat by the king. There was a great hubbub in the hall at the entrance of Shagpat, and a hum of rage and muttered venomance passed among the assembled people that filled the hall like a cavern of the sea, the sea roaring outside. But presently the king spake, and all hushed. Then said he, O people, thought I to see a day that would shame Shagpat, he that has brought honor and renown upon me in all of this city, so that we shine a consolation and place of pilgrimage to men in remote islands and corners of the earth? Yea, and to the Aphrites and genii? Have I not castigated barbers and brought barbercraft to degradation, so that no youth is taught to exercise it? And through me the tackle of the barber is not a rusty and abominated weapon, and as a sword thrown by and broken, for that it dishonored us? Surely, too, I have esteemed Shagpat precious. While he spoke, the king gazed upon Shagpat, and was checked by passion at beholding him under the lather, so that the people praised Shagpat and the king. Then said he, O people, who shall forecast disasters and triumphs? Lo, I had this day at dawn intelligence from recurrent Ulb and its king and court, and of their return to do honor to Shagpat. And I had this day at dawn tidings, O people from Shiraz, and of the adhesion of that vain city and its provinces to the might of Shagpat. So commenced the day, yet is he the object of the world's homage, within a few hours defiled by a lather in the hand of an impious one. At these words of the king there arose a shout of vindictiveness and fury, but he cried, Punishment on the offenders in season, O people! Probably we have not abased ourselves for the honor that has befallen us in Shagpat, and the distinction among nations and tribes and races and creeds and sects that we enjoy because of Shagpat. Behold, in abasement voluntarily undertaken, there is exceeding brightness and exaltation. For how is the sun a sun, save that daily he dippeth in darkness, to rise again freshly majestic? So then be mine the example, O people of the city of Shagpat. Thereupon, lo, the king descended from his throne, and stripped to the loins, flinging away his glittering crown and his robes, and abased himself to the dust with loud cries and importunities and howls, and penitential ejaculations and sobbings. And it was in that hall as when the sun goeth down in the storm. Likewise the ministers of the king, and the visors, and the emirs, and officers of state, and slaves, and soldiers of the guard, bared their limbs, and fell beside the king with violent outcries and wailings, and the whole of the people in the hall prostrated their bodies with wailings and lamentations. And Baba Mustafa feigned to bewail himself, and Nurna bin Nurka knelt beside Kadza, and shrieked loudest, striking her breast and scattering her hair, and that hall was as a pit full of serpents wreathing, and of tigers and lions and wild beasts howling, each pitching his howl a note above his neighbors, so that the tone rose and sank, and there was no one soul erect in that hall save Shagpat, he on his throne of cushions, smiling behind the lathers, inanimate, serene as they that sin not. After an hour's lapse there came a pause, and the people hearkened for the voice of the king, but in the intervals a louder moan would strike their ears and they whispered among themselves, "'Tis that of the faker, El Zoop, and the moaning and howling prevailed again, and again they heard another moan, a deep one, as of the earth in its throes, and said among themselves, "'Tis that of Butbak, the drum-beater.' And this led off to the howl of Arip, the devrish, and this was followed by the shriek of Zeal, the garlic-seller, and the wail of Cruz, El Karazwik, the carrier, and the complainings of Dob, the confectioner, and the groan of Salop, the broker, and the yell of Azawul, the builder. There would have been no end to it known, but the king rose, and commenced plucking his beard and his hair, they likewise in silence. When he had performed this ceremony a space, the king called, and a basin of water was brought to him, and handed round by slaves, and all dipped in it their hands, and renewed their countenances, and rearranged their limbs. And the hall brightened with the eye of the king, and he cried, O people, lo, the plot is revealed to me, and tis a deep one. But by this beard we'll strike at the root of it, with a blow of deadliness. Surely we have humiliated ourselves, and vengeance is ours. How say ye? A noise like the first sullen growl of a vexed wild beast, which telleth that fury is fast travelling, and the teeth will flash, 
follow these words. And the king called to his soldiers of the guard, Ho, forth with this wretch that dared defile Shagpat the Holy One, and on your heads be it to fetch hither Vishnavat the son of Phil, that was my vizor, that he was envious of Shagpat, and whom we spared in our clemency. Some of the guard went from the hall to fulfill the king's injunction on Fishnevat. Others thrust forth Baba Mustufa in the eyes of the king. Baba Mustufa was quaking as a frog quaketh for water, and he trembled and was a tongueless creature, deserted of his lower limbs, and with his eyeballs goggling, through exceeding terror. Now when the king saw him, he contracted his brows as one that peereth on a small and minute object, crying, How, isn't such as he this monster of audaciousness and horrible presumption? Truly tis said, For ruin and the deeds preluding change, Fear not great beasts nor eagles when they range, But dread the crawling worm or pismere mean, Satan selects them, for they are unseen. And this wretch is even of that sort, the select of Satan off with the top of the reptile and away with him now at the issue of the mandate baba mustafa choked and horror blocked the throat of confession in him so that he did not save stagger imploringly but the prompting of noorna sent kazda to the foot of the throne and kazda bent her body and exclaimed o king of the age tis kazda the espoused of shagpat thy servant that speaketh and lo a wise woman has said in my ear how if this emissary and an instrument of the evil one, this barber, this filthy fellow, be made to essay on Shagpat before the people his science and his malice? For tis certain that Shagpat is surrounded where he sitteth by genie invisible, defended by them, and no harm can hap to him, but an illumination of glory and triumph manifest. And for this barber his punishment can afterwards be looked to, O great king. The king mused a while and sank in his beard, then said he to them that had hold of Baba Mustafa, watching for the signal, I have thought over it, and the means of bringing double honor on the head of Shagpat. So release this fellow, and put in his hands the tackle taken from him. This was done, and the people applauded the wisdom of the king, and crowded forward with sharpness of expectation. But Baba Mustafa, when he felt in his hands the tackle, the familiar instruments, strength and wit returned to him in petty measures, and he thought, Perchance there will yet be time for my nephew to strike, if he fail me not. Fool that I was to look for glory, and not leave the work to him, for this shagpat is a mighty one, powerful in fleas, and it needeth something other than tackle to combat such as he. A mighty one, said I, by Allah, he's awful in his mightiness. So Baba Mustafa kept delaying, and feigned to sharpen the blade, and the king called to him, Haste to the work! Is it for thee, vile wretch, to make preparation for the accursed thing in our presence? And the people murmured, and waxed impatient, and the king called again, Thou to say this, thou wretch, without a head, but let another minute pass. So when Baba Mustafa could delay no longer, he sighed heavily, and his trembling returned, and the power of Shagpat smote him with an invisible hand, so that he could scarce move. But dread pricked him against dread, and he advanced upon Shagpat to shear him and assumed the briskness of the barber, and was in the act of bending over him to bring the blade into play, when, behold, one of the chamberlains of the king stood up in the presence and spoke a word that troubled him. And the king rose and hurried to a balcony, looking forth on the desert, and on three sides of the desert three separate clouds of dust were visible, and from these clouds presently emerged horsemen with spears and pennons and plumes and he could discern the flashing of their helms, and the glistening of steel plates, and armor of gold and silver. Seeing this, the color went from the cheeks of the king, and his face became as a pinched pomegranate. And he cried aloud, What visitation's this? Away, we are beset, and here is abasement brought on us without self-abasing. Meantime these horsemen detached themselves from the main bodies, and advanced at a gallop, wheeling and circling around each other toward the walls of the city and when they were close they lowered their arms and made signs of amity, and proclaimed their mission in the name of him they served. So tidings were brought to the king that the lords of the three cities, with vast retinues, were come, by reason of a warning, to pay homage to Shagpat, the son of Shimpur. And these three cities were the cities of Ub, and of Gath, and of Shiraz, even these. Now when the king heard of it, he rejoiced with an exceeding joy, and arrayed himself in glory, 
and mounted a charger, the pride of his stables, and rode out to meet the lords of the three cities, surrounded by the horsemen of his guard. And it was within a half a mile of the city walls that the four sovereigns met, and dismounted and saluted and embraced, and bestowed on one another kingly flatteries, and the titles of cousin and brother. So when the unctions of royalty were over, these three kings rode back to the city with the king that was their host, and the horsemen of the three kingdoms pitched their tents and camped outside the walls, making cheer. Then the king of the city of Shagpat related to the three kings the story of Shagpat, and the attempt that had been made on him, and in the great hall of justice he ordained the erecting of thrones for them whereon to sit. And they, when they had paid homage to Shagpat, sat by him on either side, then the king cried, This likewise owe we to Shagpat our glory. See now how the might that's in him shall defeat the machinations of evil, O my cousins of Ulb and of Goth and of Shiraz. Thereupon he called, Bring forth the barber. So Baba Mustafa was thrust forth by the soldiers of the guard, and the king of Shiraz, who was no other than the great king Shapushan, exclaimed, when he held Baba Mustafa, He... Why, it is the prince of barbers and talkative ones. Hath he not operated on my head, the head of me in old time? Truly now, if it be in man to shave Shagpat, the hand of this barber will do it. And the king of old peered on Baba Mustafa, crying, Even this fellow I bastinode. And the king of Gaff, that was Kruznik, famous in the annals of the time, said aloud, I am amazed at the pertinacity of this barber. To my court he came, searching some silly nephew, and would have shaved us all in spite of our noses. Yea, talked my chief visor into a deep sleep, and so thinned him, and there was no safety from him save in thongs and stripes and lashes. Now upon that the king of the city cried, Be the will of Allah achieved, and the inviolacy of Shagpat made manifest. Thou, barber, thou, do thy worst to contaminate him, and take the punishment in store for thee. And if it is written thou succeed, then keep thy filthy life, small chance of that. Baba Mustafa, remember the poet's word. The abyss is worth a leap, however wide, when life, sweet life, is on the other side. And he controlled himself to the mastery of his members, and stepped forward to essay once more the shaving of Shagpat. Lo, the great hall was breathless, naught heard save the splashing of the fountain in its fall and the rustle of the robe of Baba Mustafa, as he aired his right arm, hovering round Shagpat like a bird about the nest. And he was buzzing as a bee ere it entereth the flower, and quivered like a butterfly when tis fluttering over a blossom. And Baba Mustafa sniffed at Shagpat within arm's reach, fearing him, so that the people began to hum with a great rapture. And the king Shapushan cried, Aha! Mark him! This monkey knoweth the fire! But the king of the city of Shagpat was wroth, and commanded his guards to flourish their scimitars, and the keen light cut the cords of indecision in Baba Mustafa, and drove him upon Shagpat with a dash of desperation. And lo, he stretched his hand, and brought down the blade upon the head of Shagpat. Then was the might of Shagpat made manifest, for suddenly in his head the identical rose up straight, even to a level within the roof of that hall, burning as it had been an angry flame of many fiery colors and Baba Mustafa was hurled from him a great space like a ball that reboundeth, and he was twisting after the fashion of envenomed serpents, sprawling and spurning and uttering cries of horror. Surely to see that sight the four kings and the people bit their forefingers and winked till the water stood in their eyes, and Kadza, turning about, exclaimed, This owe we to the wise women, where lurketh she? So she called about the hall, Wise woman, wise woman! Now, when she could find Noorna bin Nurka nowhere in that crowd, she shrieked exultantly, "'Twas a genie! Wulaha! All Afrites, male and female, are in the service of Shagpat! My light, my eyes, my sun, I his moon!" Meantime the king of the city called to Baba Mustafa, "'Hast thou had enough of barbering, O vile one? Ho, a second essay on the head of Shagpat! So shall the might that's in him be indisputable! rooted abroad, and a great load upon the four winds. Now Baba Mustafa was persuaded by the scimitars of the guard to a second essay on the head of Shagpat, and the second time he was shot away from Shagpat through the crowd and great assemblage to the extreme end of the hall where he lay wreathing about, abandoned in loathliness. 
and he in his despondency and despite of protestation and the slackness of his limbs was pricked again by the scimitars of the guard to a third essay on the head of shagpat people jeering at him for they were joyous light of heart and lo the third time he was shot off violently and whirled away like a stone from a sling even into the outer air and beyond the city walls into the distance of waste places and now a great cry arose from the people as if it were a song of triumph for the identical stood up wrathfully from the head of shagpat burning in brilliance blinding to look on he sitting inanimate beneath it and it waxed in size and pierced through the roof of the hall and was a sight to the streets of the city and the horsemen camped without the walls beheld it and marvelled and it was as a pillar of fire to the solitudes of the desert afar and the wild arab and wandering bedouins and caravans of pilgrimage distant cities asked the reason of that appearance and the cunning fakir interpreted it and the fervent divrish expounded from it and messengers flew from gate to gate and from land to land in exultation and barbers hid their heads and were friendly with the fox and his earth because of that light so the identical burned on the head of shagpat as in wrath and with exceeding splendor of attraction three nights and three days and the fishes of the sea shoaled to the sea's surface and stared at it and the fowls of the air congregated about the fury of the light with screams and mad flutters till the streets and mosques and minarets and bright domes and roofs and cupolos of the city of shagpat were blackened with scorched feathers of the vulture and the eagle and the rook and the raven and the hawk and other birds sacred and obscene so was the triumph of shagpat made manifest to men and the end of the world by the burning of the identical three days and three nights end of chapter twenty two recording by rick cornwall Section 30 of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Cornwall The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith Chapter 23 The Flashes of the Blade Now it was the morning of the fourth day, and lo, at the first leap of the sun of that day, the flame of the identical abated in its fierceness and it dwindled and darkened and tapered and flickered feebly descending from its altitude in the heavens and through the ceiling of the hall and lay down to sleep among the intricate links and frizzled convolutions and undulating weights flowing from shagpat an undistinguished hair even as the common hairs of his head so upon that the four fasting kings breathed and from the people of the city there went up a mighty shout of gladness and congratulation at the glory they had witnessed and they took the air deeply into their chests, and were as divers that have been long fathoms deep under water, and extend and puff hard and press the water from their eyes, that yet refuse to acknowledge with the recognition the things that be in the sights above, so amazed are they with unmentionable marvels and treasures and profusions of jewels and splendid lazy growths and lavish filmy illuminations and multitudinous pearls and shearing shells that lie heaped in the beds of the ocean. As the poet has said, After too strong a beam, too bright in glory, we ask, is this a dream or a magic story? And, he says, When I've had rapturous visions such as make the sun turn pale and suddenly awake, long must I pull at memory in this beard, ere I remember men and things revered. So was it with the people of the city, and they stood in the hall and winked staringly at one another, shouting and dancing at intervals capering with mad gravity, exclaiming on the greatness of that that they had witnessed. And Zeal, the garlic-seller, fell upon Mob, the confectioner, and cried, Was this so, O Dob? Wullaha! This glory, was it verily? And Dob peered dimly upon Zeal, whispering solemnly, Say now, art thou of a surety that Zeal, the garlic-seller, known to me, my boon-fellow? And the twain turned to Salop, the broker, and exchanged interjections with him and with Azawul the builder, and with Cruz el Krasawak the carrier, and they accosted Boodleback the drum-beater, where he stood apart, drumming the air as to a march of triumph, and no word would he utter, neither to Zeal nor to Salop, nor to Cruz el Krasawak, nor to Azawul his neighbor, nor to any present, but continued drumming on the air, rapidly as in answer, increasing in the swiftness of his drumming till it was a rage to mark him 
and the excitement about Boodleback became as a mad eddy in the midst of a mighty stream. He drumming the air with exceeding swiftness to various measures, beating before him as on the tightened skin, lost to all presences save the identical and shagpat. So they edged away from Boodleback in awe, saying, He's inspired, Boodleback. Tis the triumph of Shackpath that he drummeth. They feigned to listen to him till their eyes deceived them, and they rejoiced in the velocity of the soundless tune of Boodleback the drum-beater, and were stirred by it, excited to a forgetfulness of their fasting. Such was the force of the inspiration of Boodleback the drum-beater, caused by the burning of the identical. Now the four kings, when they had mastered their wits, gazed in silence on Shagpat, and were as they that have swallowed a potent draught, and ponder sagely over the gulp. Surely the visages of the king of Shiraz, and of Gath, and of Ub, betokened dread of Shagpat, and amazement at him. But the king of the city exalted, and the shining of content was on his countenance, and he cried, Wondrous! And again, Woolaha, wondrous! And O glory! And he laughed, and clucked, and chuckled, and the triumph of Shagpat was to him as a new jewel in his crown outshining all others and he was for a while as the cock smitten with the pride of his comb the peacock magnified by admiration of his tail then he cried for this praise we allah and the prophet woolaha twas wondrous and he went off again into a roll of cluckings and chucklings and exclamations of delight crying need they further proof of the power in shagpat now has he not manifested it so true is it that saying the friend that flattereth weakened that length. It is the foe that calleth forth our strength. Wondrous, and never knew earth a thing to equal it in the range of marvels. Now ere the last word was spoken by the king, there passed through the sky a mighty flash. Those in the hall saw it, and the horsemen of the three cities encamped without the walls were nigh blinded by the keenness of his blaze. So they looked into the height, and saw straight over the city a speck of cloud, but no thunder came from it. And the king cried, these be genie. The issue of this miracle is yet to come. Look for it, and exult. Then he turned to the other kings, but they were leaning to right and left in their seats, as to the intoxicated, without strength to answer his questioning. So he exclaimed, A curse on my head! Have I forgotten the laws of hospitality? My cousins are famished. He was giving orders for the spreading of a sumptuous banquet, when they passed through the sky another mighty flash. They awaited the thunder this time confidently, yet none came. Suddenly the king exclaimed, "'Tis the wrath of Shagpath that his assailants remain uncasticated." Then cried he to the eunuchs of the guard, "'Hither with Fishnevat, the son of Phil.' And the king said to Fishnevat, "'Thou plotter, envious of Shagpat.' Here the king Krishnak fell forward at the feet of Shagpat from sure inanition, and the king of the city ordered instantly wines and viands to be brought into the hall and commenced saying to Fishnavat, in the words of the wise in tabulature, Of reckless mercy thus the sage declared, more culpable the sparer than the spared. For he that breaks one law breaks one alone. But who thwarts justice flouts law's sovereign throne. And have I not been over-merciful in thy case? As the king was haranguing Fishnavat, his nostril took in the stream of the viands and the fresh odors of the wines, and he could delay no longer to satisfy his craving, but caught up the goblet and drank from it till his visage streamed the tears of contentment. Lo, while he put forth his hand tremblingly, as to continue the words of his condemnation of the vizier, the heavens were severed by a third flash, one exceeding in fierceness the other flashes. And now the great hall rocked, and the pillars and thrones trembled, and the eyes of Shagpat opened. He made no motion, but sat like a wonder of stone, looking before him. Surely Kadza shrieked, and rushed forward to him from the crowd, yet he said nothing, and was as one frozen. So the king cried, He waketh, the flashes precedeth his awakening. Now shall he see the vengeance of kings on his enemies. Thereupon he made a signal, and the scimitars of the guard were in air over the head of Fishnavat, when darkness as of the dropping of night fell upon all, and the darkness spake, saying, I am Abarak of the Bar, preceder of the event. Then it was light, but the ears of every soul present were pierced with the wailing of wild animals, and all sides from the desert hundreds of them were seen making toward the city, some swiftly, others at a heavy pace. And when they were coming near, they crouched and fawned, and dropped their dry tongues as in awe. There was the serpent, meek as before the days of sin. 
and the leopard slinking to get among the legs of men, and the lion came trumbling along in utter flabbiness, raising not his head. Soon the streets were thronged with elephants and lions and sullen tigers and wild cats and wolves, not a tail erect among them. Great was the marvel. So the king cried, We're in the thick of wonders. Banquet we lightly while they increase upon us. What's yonder little man? This was Abarak that stood before the king and exclaimed, I am the darkness that announces the mastery of the event, as a shadow before the sun's approach, and it is the shaving of Shagpat. The world darkened before the eyes of the king when he heard this, and in a moment Abarak was clutched by the soldiers of the guard, and dragged beside Fishnavat to await the final blow. And this would have parted two heads from two bodies at one stroke, but now Norna bin Norka entered the hall, veiled and in the bright garb of a bride, with veiled attendants about her, and the people opened to give her passage to the throne of the king. So she said, Delay the stroke yet a while, O head of the magnanimous. I am she claimed by Shagpat. Surely I am the bride of him that is master of the event, and the hour of bridals is the hour of clemency. The king looked at Shagpat, perplexed, but the eye of Shagpat gazed as unto the distance of another world. Then said he, We shall hear naught from the mouth of Shagpat till he is avenged, and till then he is as silent with exceeding wrath. Hearing this, Norna ran quickly to a window of the hall, and let loose a white dove from her bosom. Then came there that flash which is recorded in all traditions as the fourth of flashes of thunderless lightnings, after the passing of which hundreds of fakers that had been awaiting it saw nothing further on this earth. Down through the hall it swept, and lo, when the kings and the people recovered their sight to regard Shagpat, he was, one side of him, clean shorn, the shaven side shining as the very moon. Surely from that moment there was no longer aught mortal in the combat that ensued. For now, while amazement and horror palsied all present, the genie Karaz, uttering a howl of fury, shot down the length of the hall like a black storm-bolt, and caught up Shagpat, and whirled off with him into the air, and they beheld him dive and dodge the lightnings that beset him from the upper heaven, catching Shagpat from them, now by the heels, now by the hair remaining one side of his head. This lasted a full hour, when the genie paused a second, and made a sheer descent into the earth. Then saw they the wings of Kuruk, each a league in length, overshadowed the entire land, and on the neck of the bird sat Shibla Bagarag, cleaving through the earth with his blade, and he sat on Kurok as the moon sits on the midnight. There was no light save the light shed abroad by the flashes of the blade, and in these they beheld the air suffocated with Aphrites and genie in a red and brown and white heat, followers of Karaz. Strokes of the blade clove them, and their blood was fire that flowed over the feathers of Korak, lighting him in a conflagration. But the bird flew constantly to a fountain of earth below and extinguished it. Then the battle recommenced, and the solid earth yawned at the gashes made by the mighty blade and its depths revealed how Karaz was flying with Shagpat from circle to circle of the under-regions, hurrying with him downward to the lowest circle that was flaming to points, like the hair of vast heads. Presently they saw a wondrous quivering flash divide the genie, and his heels and head fell together in the abysses, leaving Shagpat prone on great braziers of penal flame. Then the blade made another hissing sweep over Shagpat, leaving little of the wondrous growths on him save a top-knot. But now was the hour struck when Rabbiskaret could be held no longer serving the fairy in Achilles, and the terrible queen streamed in the sky like a red disastrous comet and dived eagle-like into the depths, reascending with Shagpat in her arms, cherishing him, and lo, there were suddenly a thousand Shagpats multiplied about, and the hand of Shibili Bagrag became exhausted with hewing at them. The scornful laugh of the queen was heard throughout earth as she triumphed over Shibili Bagarag with hundreds of Shagpats, illusions, and he knew not where to strike at the Shagpat, and was losing all sleight of hand, dexterity, and cunning. Norna shrieked, thinking him lost, but Abarak seized his bar, and leaning it in the direction of Aklis, blew a pellet from it that struck on the eye of Aklis, and this sent out a stretching finger of beams and singled forth very Shagpat from the midrids of semblances, so that he glowed and was ruddy, the rest cowering pale, and dissolving like salt grains in water. 
then saw earth and its inhabitants how the genie caraz reascended in the shape of a vulture with a fire peak pecking at the eyes of him that wielded the sword so that he was bewildered and shook this way and that over the neck of kuruk striking wildly languidly cleaving towers and palaces and monuments of earth beneath him now Shibla Bagarag discerned his danger, and considered, The power of the sword is to sever brains and thoughts. Great is Allah, I'll seek my advantage in that. So he wheeled Kuruk thrice in the crimson smoke of the atmosphere, and put the blade between the first and second thought in the head of Rabiskarat, whereby the sense of the combat became immediately confused in her mind, and she used her powers as the fool does, equally against all, for the sake of mischief solely no longer mistress of her own illusions, and she began doubling and tripling the shield-bearer-rag on the neck of monstrous birds, speeding in draggled flightiness from one point of the sky to another. Even in the terror of the combat, Shibli Bagarag was fair to burst into a fit of violent laughter at the sight of the queen, wagging her neck loosely, perking it like a mad raven. And he took part, and swept the blades rapidly over Shagpat as she dandled him, leaving Shagpat but one hair remaining on him. Yet was that the identical, and it arose, and was a serpent in his head, and from its jaws issued a river of fiery serpents. These and a host of Aphorites besieged Shibli Bagarag. And now to defend himself he unloosed the twin genii, Kiravijus and Virajrush, from the wrist of that hand which wielded the sword of Aklis, and these alternately interwound before and about him, and were even as a glittering armor of emerald plates, warding from him the assaults of the host. And lo, he flew, and the battle followed him over blazing cities, and lands on fire with the slanting hail of sparkles. By this time every soul in the city of Shagpat, kings and people, all save Abarak and Nurna bin Nurka, were overcome and prostrate with their faces to the ground. But Noorna watched the conflict eagerly, and saw the head of Shagpat sprouting incessant fresh crops of hair, despite the pertinacious shearing of her betrothed. Then she smote her hands, and cried, Yea, though I lose my beauty and the love of my betrothed, I must join in this, or he'll be lost. So saying to Abarak, Watch over me, she went into the air, and as she passed, Rabiscarat was multiplied into twenty damsels of loveliness. Then Abarak beheld a scorpion following the twenty in mid-air, and darting stings among them. Noorna tossed a ring, and it fell in a circle of flame around the scorpion. So while the scorpion was shooting in squares to escape from the circle, the fire-beaked vulture flew to it, and fluttered a dense ring which swallowed the flame, and the scorpion and the vulture assailed Noorna, that was changed to a golden hawk in the midst of nineteen other golden hawks. Now as Rabiscarat came scudding by and saw the encounter, she made the twenty hawks a hundred. The genie Karaz howled at her and pinioned her to a pillar below in the desert, with Shagpat in her arms. But as he soared aloft to renew the fight with Noorna, Shibli Bagarag loosed to her aid the slaves of the sword, and Abarak marked him slope to a distant corner of earth, and reascend in a cloud, which drew swiftly over the land toward the great hall. Lo, Shibli Bagarag stepped from it through a casement of the hall, and with him Shagpat, a slack weight, made it out of all power of motion. Kuruk swooped low, and on his back Baba Mustufa and Shibla Bagarag flung Abarak beside him on the bird. Then Kurak whirred off with them, and while the heavens raged, Shibla Bagarag prepared a rapid lather, and dashed it over Shagpat, and commenced shearing him with lightning sweeps of the blade. "'Twas as a racing wheel of fire to see him. "'Suddenly he desisted and wiped the sweat from his face. "'Then calling on the name of Allah, "'he gave a last cunning sweep with the blade. "'And following that, the earth awfully quaked and groaned, "'as if speaking in the absolute tongue "'the mastery of the event to all men. "'Aklis was revealed in burning beams as of a sun, "'and the trouble of the air ceased, "'vapors slowly curling to the four quarters.' Shibla Bagarag had smitten clean through the identical. Terribly had Noorna and those that aided her been oppressed by the multitude of their enemies, but in a moment these melted away, and Karaz, together with the scorpion that was Guralka, vanished. Day was on the baldness of Shagpat. End of chapter 23 Recorded by Rick Cornwall
Section 31 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Conclusion So was shaved Shagpat, the son of Shimpur, the son of Shulpi, the son of Shulam, by Shibli Bagarag of Shiraz according to preordainment. The chronicles relate that no sooner had he mastered the event than men on the instant perceived what illusion had beguiled them, and, in the words of the poet, the blush with which their folly they confess is the first prize of his supreme success. Even Boodleback, the drum-beater, drummed in homage to him, and the four kings were they that were loudest in their revilings of the spouse of Kadza, and most obsequious in praises of the master. The king of the city was fain to propitiate his people by a voluntary resignation of his throne to Shibli Bagarag, and that king took well to heart the wisdom of the sage when he says, Power on illusion based or toppeth all, the more disastrous is its certain fall. Surely Shibli Bagarag returned the sword to the sons of Aklis, flashing it in midnight air, and they with the others did reverence to his achievement. They were now released from the toil of sharpening the sword a half-cycle of years, to wander in delight on the fair surface of the flowery earth, breathing its roses, wooing its brides. For the mastery of an event lasteth among men the space of one cycle of years, and after that a fresh illusion springeth to befool mankind, and the seven must expend the concluding half-cycle in preparing the edge of the sword for a new mastery." as the poet declareth in his scorn, Some doubt eternity, from life begun, has folly ceased within them, sire to son? So ever fresh illusions will arise, and lord creation, until men are wise. And he adds, That is a distant period, so prepare, to fight the false, O youths, and never spare. For who would live in chronicles renowned, must combat folly, or as fool be crowned. Now for the kings of Shiraz and of Gath, Shibli Bagarag entertained them in honour, but the king of Ulb he disgraced and stripped of his robes, to invest Baba Mustafa in those royal emblems, a punishment to the treachery of the king of Ulb, as is said by Abu Esnal, When nations with opposing forces rash shatter each other, thou that wouldst have stood apart to profit by the monstrous feud, thou art the surest victim of the crash. Take colours of whichever side thou wilt, and steadfastly thyself in battle range. Yet having taken, shouldst thou dare to change, suspicion hunts thee as a thing of guilt. Baba Mustafa was pronounced sovereign of Ulb, amid the acclamations of the guard encamped under the command of Ravalok without the walls. No less did Shibli Bagarag honour the benefactor of Nurna, making him chief of his armies and he, with his own hand, bestowed on the good old warrior the dress of honour presented to him by the seven sons, charactered with all the mysteries of Aklis, a marvel lost to men in the failure to master the illusion now dominating earth. So then, of all that had worshipped Shagpat, only Kadza clung to him, and she departed with him into the realms of Rabesquerat, who reigned there, divided against herself by the stroke of the sword. The queen is no longer mighty, for the widening of her power has weakened it, she being now the mistress of the single thoughted, and them that follow one idea to the exclusion of a second. The failure in the unveiling of her last cherished illusion was in the succumbing frailty of him that undertook the task, the world and its wise men having come to the belief that in thwackings there was ignominy to the soul of man, and a tarnish on the lustre of heroes. On that score, hear the words of the poet, a vain protest. Ye that nourish hopes of fame, ye who would be known in song, ponder old history and duly frame your souls to meek acceptance of the throng. Lo, of hundreds who aspire, eighties perish, nineties tire. They who bear up, in spite of wrecks and racks, were seasoned by celestial hail of thwacks. 
Fortune in this mortal race builds on thwackings for its base. Thus the all-wise doth make a flail a staff, and separates his heavenly corn from chaff. Think ye, had he never known, Nurna a belabouring crone, Shibli Bagarag would have shaved Shagpat, the unthwacked lives in chronicle a rat. Tis the thwacking in his den maketh lions of true men. So are we nerved to break the clinging mesh which tames the noblest efforts of poor flesh. Feshnavat became the master's vizier, and Abarak remained at the right hand of Shibli Bagarag, his slave in great adventure. No other condition than bondage gave peace to Abarak. He was of the class enumerated by the sage, who, with the strength of giants, are but tools, the weighty hands which serve selected fools. Now this is how it was in the case of Baba Mustafa, and the four kings, and Feshnavat, and Abarak, and Ravalok, and Kadza, together with Shagpat. But in the case of Nurna bin Nurka, surely she was withering from a sting of the scorpion shot against her bosom, but the seven sons of Aklis gave her a pass into Aklis on the wings of Kuruk, and Gulravaz, the daughter of Aklis, tended her, she that was alone capable of restoring her, and counteracting the malice of the scorpion by the hand of purity. So Nurna prospered, but Shibli Bagarag drooped in uncertainty of her state, and was as a reaper in a field of harvest, around whom lie the yellow sheaves, and the brown beam of autumn on his head, the blaze of plenty. Yet he is joyless, and stands musing, for one is away who should be there, and without them the goblet of success giveth an unsweetened draught, and there is nothing pleasant in life, and the flower on the summit of achievement is blighted. At last, as he was listlessly dispensing justice in the great hall, seven days after the mastery of the event, lo, Nurna, in air, borne by Gulravaz, she fair and fresh in the revival of health and beauty, and the light of constant love. Of her entry into the great hall, to the embrace of her betrothed, the poet exclaims, picturing her in a rapture. Her march is music, and my soul obeys each motion, as a lute to cunning fingers, I see the earth throb for her, as she sways, wave like in air, and like a great flower lingers, heavily over all, as loath to leave what loves her so, and for her loss would grieve. But, oh, what other hand than heavens can paint her eyes, and that black bow from which their lightning pierces afar, long lustrous eyes that faint in languor, or with stormy passion brightening? Within them world in world lights up from sleep, and gives a glimpse of the eternal deep. Sigh round her odorous winds, and envious rose, so vainly envious, with such blushes gifted, bow to her, die strangled with jealous throes, O Bulbul! When she sings with brow uplifted, gather her happy youth, and for thy gain, thank him who could such loveliness ordain. Surely the master of the event advanced to her in the glory of a sultan, and seated her beside him in majesty, and their contract of marriage was read aloud in the hall, and witnessed and sealed. Joyful was he! then commenced that festival which lasted forty days, and is termed the festival of the honours of hospitality to the sons of Aldis, wherein the head cook of the palace, Uruish, performed wonders in his science, and menaced the renown of Zermak, the head cook of the king Shamsherin. Even so the confectioner, Dab, excelled himself in devices and inventions, and his genius urged him to depict in sugars and pastes the entire adventures of Shibli Bagarag in search of the sword. Honour we Uruish and Dab, as the poet saith. Divide not this fraternal twain, one are they, and one should for ever remain. As to sweet clothes in fine music we look, so the confectioner follows the cook. And one of the sons of Aklis, Zaragal, beholding this masterpiece of Dab, which was served to the guests in the great hall on the fortieth evening, was fair to exclaim in extemporaneous verse, Have I been wafted to a rise of banquet spread in paradise, dowered with consuming powers divine? 
that I, who have not failed to dine, and greatly, fall thus upon the cater and wine sedately. So there was feasting in the hall, and in the city, and over earth, great pledging the sovereign of barbers, who had mastered an event, and became the benefactor of his craft and of his kind. Tis certain the race of the Bagarags endured for many centuries, and his seed were the rulers of men, and the seal of their empire stamped on mighty wax the tackle of barbers. Now, of the promise made by the sons of Aklis to visit Shibli Bagarag before their compulsory return to the labour of the sword, and to recount to him the marvel of their antecedent adventures, and of the love and grief nourished in the souls of men by the beauty and sorrowful eyes of Gulravaz, that was mined the bleeding lily, and of her engagement to tell her story, on occasion of receiving the firstborn of Nurna to nurse for a season in Aklis, and of Shibli Bagarag's restoration of towns and monuments destroyed by his battle with Karaz, and of the constancy of passion of Shibli Bagarag for Nurna, and his esteem of her sweetness, and his reverence for her wisdom, and of the glory of his reign, and of the songs and sentences of Nurna, and of his laws for the protection and upholding of women, in honour of Nurna, concerning which the sage has said, were men once clad in them, we should create a race not following, but commanding fate. Of all these records, and of the reign of Baba Mustafa in Ulb, surely the chronicles give them in fullness, and they that have searched say of them, there is matter therein for the amusement of generations. End of section 31. End of The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith.